Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, day two of the National Academy of Sciences Engineering Medicine workshop on practice and standards for plugging orphaned and abandoned hydrocarbon wells. Thank you so much, all of you, for such a lively discussion yesterday, and hopefully we will continue that for today. During day two of the workshop, we'll explore environmental risks and monitoring, reclamation and restoration, and lastly, advances in plugging practices and technology. I am going to take the uh, make an attempt. It's sort of putting together some highlights from yesterday. Um, it was a lot covered yesterday. It was very dense conversation with a wealth of information in it. But I will uh, attempt to uh, put this. Um, you know, one of the things that struck those of us who put this list together is there is a impressive set of state experiences. Um, the states have been doing this for a number of years, and that expertise and um, experience base is is It will be amazing in terms of how we move this forward. Um, and but I think one question we have, and, and we can talk about this later in the today, but how can this be gathered? To, to be to to bring together all the people and the practitioners here in the room and online and how can we bring them together to to pass along best practices there's a lot of similarity in practices across the states that that kind of thread ran through yesterday and there is definitely each state has an ability to adopt other practices it's just a matter of knowing what's going what other states are doing and how it might be applied to your particular state there are unique uh, in, unique environments and conditions depending on where you are and, and what the geology is doing for you. Um, orphan well programs benefit from the ability to plan and design to unique situations, to have that flexibility to modify depending on what you find. Um, benefit from the ability to address unforeseen um, issues during the plugging and remediation processes. I think that flexibility is really important and maintaining that depending on where you're working um, is, is really important as we go forward. Uh, it does, and I think the message came through loud and clear uh, yesterday afternoon, it does require contractors who are experienced and qualified to, uh, to address these issues. So it, it is a, um, requires some kind of ability to evaluate or vet the contractors who are doing the work. Under our prioritization, um, very similar among states, the proximity to people, methane, surface, and groundwater are all high on the priority list, and, and those are kind of common theme through all the states. We did ask, um, we put some flip charts out in the hallway, and we asked uh, folks online to um, gather for key uncertainties and future challenges. I think the message that came through the most was the need for long-term monitoring. How do we know about the integrity of these uh, completions, uh, these wells, and how do, we, how do we monitor it? And I think we're gonna address that today in several sessions. Um, the effects of microseismicity, that was a specific example that came up and, and how that's gonna affect the integrity of the wells and and you know how long will a cement seal, the cement last? That was a, a strong uh, question that came out. Future challenges. Um, we've had a lot, a bit of discussion on the reuse of these wells, and I think that's going to be as we go forward. Is how do we uh, regulate such that these can be reused or used for carbon credits, et cetera? Uh, groundwater monitoring was certainly a, a strong. Um, concern that came up, how do we monitor that for the long term, and really prioritizing long term monitoring as we go forward. So that was um, a pretty high level summary, we will have more this afternoon. I would encourage you if you haven't written on those boards outside, or if you're online, if you could add it to the Slido, we are trying to collect uncertainties and challenges. So please feel free you know, write it on the, the flip charts outside or send it through the, the Slido. I, uh, in terms of housekeeping, I want to remind everyone that this workshop is being recorded. The recording will be posted to the event page along with the presentations. Um, this workshop includes both virtual and in-person in uh, presentations and participation. I will say we had quite a bit of participation online. We averaged somewhere between 150 and 160 people throughout the day. 
it did tail off at the end because it, you know, it was dinner time for many people. So um, in-person and online participants uh, joining through the live stream can enter uh, questions and comments in the Slido. Can we put up that uh, QR code in the, yeah. So please uh, go ahead and um, um, use the application here to submit questions if you are online. Um, panelists will be making presentation and then like we set up yesterday, there'll be a set of presentations and then Q&A afterwards. So please, during the presentation, save your questions and we encourage um, participants to offer their perspectives. We had lively discussion yesterday. Let's continue that because that that was very um, interesting and I think thought provoking as we went forward. So I am going to, at this point, we're gonna start with our first session, session four on environmental risk and monitoring. The moderator for this is Mary Kang. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna get started. Uh, yeah, thank you to the academies and DOI for organizing and everybody here. Um, uh, I really enjoyed the conversations yesterday, so I'm looking forward to the presentation today. So um, to, to all the sessions today. So this uh, session is called Environmental Risks and Monitoring. So um, I'm thrilled to have uh, five panelists on this session. So we have Sarah Bush from EPA and um, uh, James Franz, uh, who's online uh, from EDF, uh, Sue Brantley, who's also online um, from Penn State, Greg Lackey from NECL, and Jim Sayers from Yale. Um, so these are the titles of the presentations, and then we'll have time for some panel discussions afterwards. Um, I, I did want to briefly mention this. There was a lot of discussion about numbers of documented orphan wells, uh, which is the most recent numbers are around 150,000. Um, we did briefly talk about the broader category of so-called abandoned using EPA def definitions, which, which include plugged and unplugged wells, temporarily abandoned, shut in, all of those kinds of wells. And uh, but I, you know, that terminology gets confused a lot. Another terminology that I'm trying to use is the term non-producing. Uh, and But unfortunately, just to confuse all of you a little bit more, I, I might be using them interchangeably. And that's also because that's how they show up in different pu publications. But I just wanted to bring your attention to the number of wells. Uh, this is for Canada and the US. There is approximately 4 million non-producing oil and gas wells in the United States, another 400,000 in Canada. I, you know, but having said those numbers, I really want to draw your attention to that little squiggly line in front of the numbers. There are uh, quite a few uncertainties. You can see the, their distribution. So, so the orphan wells that we're talking about today are a subset of these non-producing wells. And among those orphan wells, there are some that are documented and some that are undocumented. And we did talk a bit about what it meant, uh, what documented means. And of course, lots of room for um, discussion there. So I just wanted to... Uh, show something like this. So there are a lot of wells. <laughs> so uh, it's important to um, manage uh, the various environmental risks and monitor those. So there's a whole bunch of, this is a schematic, uh, thanks to NETL and Greg uh, for helping create this really cool graphic. Um, so there are a lot of different risks. So, you know, you can see wells and then you can see various pathways and through which fluids can migrate and impact groundwater and um, also air quality. And uh, we're gonna talk quite about methane emissions, so impact on climate. Um, so there's a lot of different risks. One of the things that are that's not mentioned here, that's kind of, uh, kind of oh, the pointer doesn't work, kind of captured in that health are um, explosion risks. So that's a safety, big safety consideration that we heard um, from yesterday that uh, is really important for the states. So some high level questions that we're trying to hit with the uh, presentations or at least touch upon and happy to explore more and happy to take on uh, more questions and comments from uh, during the discussion are how confident are we with national estimates of orphan and abandoned well methane emissions? Can methane emissions be used as a proxy for other environmental impacts? Uh, some of which I'm uh, most of which I mentioned here. 
how can or how should we identify and remediate groundwater contamination? We're going to more focus on the identify part here. And then uh, where are the data and data management gaps and how can new technologies be used to address them? Uh, so there are estimates for methane emissions from non-producing wells. EPA has them. I also show Canada. Those are the two countries that first made estimates. So they do exist. Uh, they do show a bit of underestimate and those are the bars. There are different scenarios that you could look at. So there is some kind of variability. But I do want to draw your attention to the longs, the lines that show uncertainty. And th I think that's one of the big points, um, biggest issues with methane emissions from non-producing wells is the uncertainty. They're, they are quite uncertain. Um, how does that translate to uh, orphan wells? There is an estimate for documented orphan wells. It's, it's hundred and, for the 123K, it's about 5 to 6% of the total methane emissions from all abandoned or non-producing wells that I just showed you in the previous slide. So it's a, it's a tiny sliver. But again, I, you know, the dash line here shows the uncertainty. You can see that the y-axis is there's a break in it because it's it's so much bigger, especially on the upper end. Um, so why are there such large uncertainties? Uh, there definitely are issues in terms of the number of wells. The other issue is the available measurement data set. <laughs> um, it's, it's, first of all, it's rather small, but another thing I wanna to point to is there's likely unmeasured, undetected, high emitting non-producing wells. So based on what evidence, evidence am I saying this? Well, in November, 2023, uh, I, I published with my student, uh, Lauren Bowman, uh, she led the paper. She, uh, we published a paper uh, based on data in Alberta and Saskatchewan in Canada. And we measured the highest uh, emission rate at a gas uh, well in Alberta. That was high, three times higher than previous measurements. That came out in November, 2023. And that was five kilograms per hour. And few, just in a few short months later, in February, 2024, there was another that study that came out with measurements in Colorado with a new highest methane emission rate of 76 kilograms per hour. So we're, we're still in that stage where we don't really know how high the emission rate could go. And it really matters when you're talk, thinking about overall emissions. So I, I, have a, I have another little box there. We don't know. I, you know, there, it, it is entirely possible and very likely that we're going to see another study that comes out in the coming months that say emission rate with a new higher emission rate. And, that, that, and you know, those single values actually do matter in the overall methane emissions. Uh, there's also another source of evidence. I won't go too much into it, but we, there's some aerial indi indications that also show potential for high emissions. Um, so this is another question. Can we use well attributes to identify potentially high emitting wells? Um, I know Greg's going to talk a lot about this. So I'm just going to touch upon this to say there are a lot of factors. And the biggest surprise here is that there are a lot of conflicting results. Some studies say, oh, depth matters. Some studies say depth doesn't matter. Some studies say age matters. Some studies say they don't. None of them are wrong. They're all right because they're all using different data sets and based on measurements in different locations. The only factor that's consistent is geographical area because it probably encapsulates all of those methods. And the key point here is that the methane emission rates that we're measuring are driven by multiple processes. So when you kind of lump them all together, that's why it's really hard to tease out those factors. And we try to do a little bit of that. So where we separately measure out methane emissions from the surface casing vent and the wellhead. And when we do that, we do see different trends. At a given well site, if you measure the different, you get different emission rates, and then you do some statistical analysis, you see different factors mattering. Um, one point I do want to make, and this is a, so there's a lot of well integrity uh, studies by different states and provinces or records. And so uh, this is this is from Alberta. Uh, the province of Alberta has a surface casing vent flow and gas migration data set that gives you an idea, uh, idea of well integrity. And so we went out and did, med and there's been estimates of, you know, surface casing event leakage uh, occurrence based on that, those provincial data sets. 
And I show some there for Alberta and also for BC. We went out and did measurements. And at first we were blind to it. <laughs> we, we didn't look at it. And then we went and um, did a bunch of measurements. And then we went back and tried to compare them. And I think the only thing is uh, that the key thing I want to mention was that actually 68% of what we found were actually not identified in the leakage data, uh, the Alberta databases. And not it's not because they're wrong. And I've had great discussions with AER. And I mean, there's lots of reasons, including temporal variability, because we didn't go at the same time, for sure. Um, but anyway, that, that that's a that's another just consideration here. Uh, just a few words on groundwater. Um, groundwater generally moves slowly. There are different kinds of contaminants. Some dissolve in the water. Some don't dissolve in the water, and um, and and they can migrate differently with the uh, with the groundwater or kind of separately. Um, but I think an important and, and these are quotes directly from the EPA website. But it's it's you can see it in a lot of textbooks. When groundwater becomes contaminated, it is difficult and expensive to clean up. And um, the other point here I wanted to quickly make is about groundwater. Uh, what is groundwater? Uh, the average groundwater depth in the United States is around 230 feet. Um, so you all are know very well how deep oil and gas wells are. They're, they are much deeper, right? Uh, a couple thousand feet um, or can be quite deep. Um, so there is a, there is a bit of a separation. There is data, all, uh, but there is data showing that groundwater wells are being drilled deeper. So that that is another concern that um, we may want to consider, especially because when we're thinking about plugging, we're trying to really protect the protected waters. So just a few comments on um, what should be protected and remediated. Um, Here's a compilation of what, you know, fresh brackish and saline water definitions. I just want to show you the, looking at the fresh part, there's a lot of different definitions for what constitutes fresh crown water. And this is just with respect to total dissolved solids. There's other contaminants that you may want to be worried about. And uh, so it could be 1000 milligrams per liter. There's actually something up to 3000 milligrams per liter. So th there's a lot of discussion here. And there's also questions of, you know, with increases or advances in treatment technology, can even moderately saline and other waters really be, you know, viable sources of drinking water in the future or other water uses? Can I get next slide, please? Because my pointer. Really? There should be, okay. Well, there was supposed to be another slide. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'll add that. Well, there's, there was another slide. Basically, there, you know, we were looking at USGS based of fresh water as if, uh, if we're in California. And, you know, below the base of the USGS defined base of fresh water, you actually see uh, water with quality um, that could be considered fresh. Uh, according to some of these definitions. So should we be, so how should we define what is protected waters? So that's, I'll end there and, uh, oh yeah, it's okay. We could, uh, I'll, I'll stop there and invite Sarah. Hey everyone, Sarah Bush here with EPA. I'm an engineer working in the climate change division. Um, I'll wait until my slides are up, but excited to be here, talk about EPA and the quantification of wells. Um, 
Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, really, really excited to be here. So what are we going to be talking about today? I think Mary did a great job of teeing me up, um, but we'll be covering a few different things. So first, the way that, you know, the relevant data we're collecting for abandoned wells. So talking a bit about the greenhouse gas inventory, as well as reporting requirements under subpart W, um, and also then a bit more background on the methane emissions reduction program. So talking about our partnership, the Department of Energy and the National Energy Technology Lab. Greg, a colleague, of course, is part of that relationship for financial and technical assistance. Um, the methane measurement guidelines that NETL created for marginal conventional wells, as well as a little bit about the proposed rule for the waste emissions charge. So the Greenhouse Gas Inventory and the GHG Reporting Program, both excellent programs that are very complementary that we have at EPA. So the inventory covers a holistic emissions estimate of emissions and sinks. Um, as Mary mentioned, that includes a category on abandoned oil and gas wells. Um, we submit the Greenhouse Gas Inventory to the UNFCCC for our commitment there. Um, whereas the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program is um, for large operators um, across various sectors, including oil and gas. There's a minimum um, threshold, the 25,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, and the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program is a key input into the inventory. They're not the same thing, however, as you can see here by the, the table. And, you know, there are benefits to both. Um, what I will say is the inventory covers some sectors that aren't in the GHGRP, like agriculture, for example. Um, so they're they're not the same thing, um, but they definitely both have value. So going to dive a bit more deeply first into the inventory. So the inventory. Um, a little snapshot first on, you know, defining what are abandoned oil and gas wells. I'm glad Mary teed me up. I know that there are, there's different terminology here, right? But the abandoned wells definition as according with the UNFCCC are wells with no recent protection and not plugged, but also includes wells that have been plugged. And there are a bunch of different terms, of course, that we're all familiar with what that means. Inactive, temporarily abandoned, orphaned, of course, is a part of this estimate. Um, and what I will say is, is, as Mary mentioned, there are about 3.9 million wells in our estimate. I think 3 million are um, oil, 0.9 gas. Um, orphan wells are, of course, a subset of that, but we don't have a specific estimate of orphan well count in the inventory. So you see the tables there. Um, estimates from our oil and gas latest inventory um, for 2022. Um, since 1990, though, we've seen a large increase in the count of both abandoned oil and gas wells. So you're seeing an increase in about 33% um, emissions um, and 83% population for gas, whereas you're seeing an increase about 3% of emissions. When I say emissions, I mean CO2 and methane, respectively, and 40% in population as well. So how are we getting this um, this estimate? Well, um, I keep mentioning Mary, maybe perhaps because we uh, referenced her paper in the inventory. I thought it was delighted that the synergies there um, on the panel together. Um, we also are looking at a paper from Dr. Townsend Small. Um, both of these papers um, are are excellent, and you know, I Mary's paper I think deals in, in the Appalachian Basin, and Dr. Townsend Small has estimates in Appalachia as well as the national. You might be wondering, why are we calling on Appalachia? It's exactly for that reason. Since there is data there specifically, we were able to create a mission factor for Appalachia, for the Appalachian Basin, as well as a national. In terms of well count, there we go. Um, unplugged, the unplugged well count is calculated using Inveris data here to determine the fraction of plugged to unplugged wells. Then developing our state level annual counts of these wells. We're also using Inveris data, but also historical records by state agency and our federal colleagues at USGS. So plan improvements to the abandoned oil and gas well data in the inventory. Um, the EPA, of course, we continue to assess in new data and stakeholder feedback on how to improve this well count. Um, we're aware and tracking uh, several different programs. Of course, the Department of Interior Orphan Well Database. Um, NETL is also developing a well database of marginal conventional wells. And subpart W, um, we had a regulation recently finalized that you'll hear about shortly um, with data improvements kind of feeding into that well count as well as different emissions estimates. Um, but of course, you know, please reach out if you're aware of any data sources you consider 
please contact me. Um, this fall, we'll be having a webinar where we're going to discuss our planned updates. Um, there will also be a public feedback period. So really, of course, value and encourage that feedback. So a bit about subpart W. Laying a little bit of the groundwork here. So as we discussed, the inventory is focused on abandoned oil and gas wells. Subpart so W is focused on large um, wells from large producing entities. Um, so those of course are wells that are from facilities that are over that 25K metric ton of CO2 equivalent threshold. This doesn't capture all of the wells, but it captures about 50% of the producing wells in the United States. Um, Looking at data from 2022, about 90% of the wells that we collected information on that year, 90% were producing, about 10% were non-producing. And then the number I have is about 6,500 um, wells in 2022 um, were uh, temporarily, I think they were, they were, um, apologies, I'm going to get this language correct, removed from production in 2022. That is what I was trying to say. Um, so what I'll say here is we're going to talk a bit more about the methodologies in our recently finalized rule that came out in May. Um, I don't have emissions data to show you today on subpart W, but starting in 2025, we will be collecting a lot more well-level estimates, um, which is exciting. So in the future, you'll start to see more emissions information in several different source categories. I also want to clarify here that we're talking about pre-plugging emissions. Um, so it sounds like, you know, long-term monitoring is something that folks talked a lot about yesterday. So these emissions that we're collecting are more on the pre-plugging side, but certainly something that EPA would want to learn more about as well. So um, I think that this is a great handy graphic. Um, this graphic shows three different EPA regulations that are in various stages of finalized or proposed. Um, so in the red, this shows the source categories under subpart two, subpart W that are subject to the waste emissions charge. Those blue categories as well report to subpart W, but um, are not subject to the WEC. And then those black stars show the overlap between the new source performance standards and emissions guidelines, that information that we can collect for subpart W as well. I do want to highlight one, two, and eight. Those are sectors where we will be collecting information on wells. So um, for onshore production well emissions, recognizing this is a bit of a wordy slide, we're collecting a lot of information. And there are a lot of different ways to collect that information. There are more, now more options in terms of you know, emissions quantification, using engineering calculations. Um, you know, I, My intent for this slide is that when the slides are shared later, we can read more, more into that as well. Highly encourage resources on the Subpart W website too. Um, for offshore production and underground storage wells, for offshore, we actually use um, data from, from BOEM um, as a part of our, our colleagues at DOI, um, their outer continental shelf emissions inventory. Um, so starting in 2024, we'll be collecting information. So this year, 2024, to be clear, on the, the quantity of natural gas and, and crude oil condensate sent to sale on the well level. Um, for underground storage, we're not seeing that well level information, but we will have facility level equipment leak emissions information categorized um, by storage well heads too. Um, so why did we update subpart W? Well, um, Clean Our Act Section 136, which is a part of the Inflation Reduction Act, established the Methane Emissions Reduction Program. So improvements to subpart W were part of a, a three-pronged um, plan for this. Um, we'll hear later about um, an incentive program for financial and technical assistance in collaboration with the Department of Energy and NETL. Um, also establishing a waste emissions charge uh, for applicable facilities, um, and there's a plugged well exemption there, so we'll cover what was in the proposed rule. So um, I know I've mentioned it a few times, but I'm really grateful for, um, you know, the methane measurement guidelines. I know, of course, there's one for the Department of Interior or for the well program. Um, so this was developed by NETL um, for use in the MERP. So the measurement guidelines, a bit of framing. I will say that this is for marginal conventional wells, which of course are different than orphaned wells. Um, we're defining MCWs here as those that produce less than or equal to 15 barrels of oil equivalent per day over the past 12 month period. The minimum detection limit um, that we have here is less than 100 grams per hour. Recognizing of course that this is a different MDL than what's in the DOI guidelines of one gram per hour. And if 
one of the grantees happens to be plugging a well that reports the subpart W, we of course encourage using that to avoid duplication. So a little bit of information on pre-measuring requirements. Um, we, of course, you know, want to quantify those emissions pre-plugging. A um, few different ways you could do that. Sampling, of course, directly from the well using high flow sampling, flux chambers or bag sampling, meter field measurements, um, EPA OTM 33A, which is ground-based vehicles um, or drone-based survey. You know, I will mention that Remote sensing could be used if it meets the MDL. I'm going to say if it meets the MDL very strongly here. At this time, we don't believe that it uh, um, that exists to meet the MDL, but the door is open if it does. Um, for post-measurement requirements, um, we uh, require detection only, so you could use you know, EPA method 21 or OGI. Um, and under data reporting, this is the minimum data reporting requirements. We, of course, encourage other data reporting so we can learn a bit more about how the plugging went. And then finally, um, a little bit of information on the plugged well exemption under the waste emissions charge. So what I'll say here is we proposed the WEC in January of this year went under a public comment period that closed at the end of March. Um, so this is what we propose. I'm not able to speak about, of course, what is in the final, um, but under the unified agenda that um, you can expect that in uh, December. So what was proposed under the plugged well exemption? Um, well, we exempt emissions from wells that are permanently shut in and plugged in accordance with applicable closure requirements. The proposed rule exempted emissions limited to with a wellhead, so equipment leaks, liquids unloading, and workovers with and without hydraulic fracturing. You need to meet two criteria. Um, meeting exceeding the waste emissions threshold, which was established by the statute, not by us, um, and that, of course, it was plugged with um, appropriate closure requirements. Um, so a few different resources and all the different things that I discussed. Um, I'm counting down with nine seconds left, so I guess I will leave it there. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, so now we have James France, who's joining us online. Hi, everybody. Mary, is that okay for screen sharing? Um, yes, go ahead. You can start. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for letting me speak from uh, from over the pond and uh, chatting chatting away about uh, methane uh, measurement quantification techniques that we can potentially use for uh, looking at abandoned oil and gas infrastructure. Um, I'm from uh, Environmental Defence Fund, and uh, I also hold a post at Royal Holloway University of London, uh, and that's why I'm speaking to from you from London here today. Um, excellent. So there's a few things that I think we we have to consider straight away, really, in terms of what we're looking at from a methane measurement perspective. And the big question is, what environment are we working in? You know, are we looking at single wells? Are we looking at multiple wells? Are we looking at enormous clusters of wells? Um, can we get close to the infrastructure? Um, I mean, it's very easy to sort of think that we could go and test a lot of, it, um, of our methodologies at places like Metech, uh, where we can get direct access to, to, a, to a sort of like a proxy for an abandoned well. But what's the reality look like in the field? Uh, do we have line of sight to the location? Is it covered by trees? Is it covered by vegetation? Um, is it under incredibly changeable weather conditions as well? You know, is it going to look the same if we go and measure there in winter or if uh, if we go and measure there in summer? And something that I've been uh, getting involved with, uh, with my Environmental Defence Fund hat on and with Mary as well, is that we're looking into a, a project in Pennsylvania, uh, looking at uh, discovery of uh, abandoned wells. So the, the last question really is, do we even know where we're looking? It's one question going and measuring the uh, the abandoned infrastructure that we know about, uh, but there's that whole other subsection that we don't even necessarily uh, know where we are to start with. So what does the reality look like? Well, this is uh, some pictures pinched from from Mary's fieldwork over the years, and, uh, and this is uh, essentially what, I'll be talking about uh, today in terms of what we can use uh, as methodologies. We're looking at remote, isolated infrastructure in difficult terrain uh, and very variable terrain. So you can see here we've got a nice picture of, uh, of using uh, bespoke chamber methods. Um, but the reality doesn't necessarily translate across the world. So uh, in the absolute 
um, difference of Azerbaijan, uh, we might be dealing with uh, places like this where we have an enormous amount of um, semi-active infrastructure with um, with redundant infrastructure at the, in, at the same time. If we're dealing with places like this, we have to accept that uh, we need an entirely different type of survey, which I'll I'll briefly mention, but I, I don't think that this is the sort of environment that we're really considering in this in this talk. So what are our options? Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to match our, our methodology to the scale. So really we're we're going to talk about component level um with sort of here we've got examples of uh, of of high flow sampler bagging we've got uh, we've got a, a, an optical gas imaging camera um there looking at looking across some facility and what's important to note really with these methods is that you only measure what you're targeting you can only get a quantification if you know that leak is there and that you're able to essentially visualize it or measure it directly in in some way. If we, we move up a scale, we're then at uh, sort of facility level, we might have a, a cluster of infrastructure, and, and then it might be more appropriate to think of, uh, of, of methodologies that uh, are, are downwind, open path measurements, that are able to capture an entire plume or a, or a subsection of the plume. Um, and that gives us this integrated source, which is great for a total quantification measurement, but it might not give us really any information that's useful in terms of mitigation. But it's certainly useful in terms of uh, of monitoring and long term emissions um, trends. And finally, we can look at this sort of like a basin level. Think of this as a sort of a whole whole oil and oil and gas basin. And there we might be looking at methodologies that uh, are then into the sort of like the satellite realms, potentially something like methanesat. We might be bringing someone in like scientific aviation to do a, to do a, a, a mass balance calculation using aircraft where we fly upwind and downwind and effectively measure the, the integrated difference between the uh, upwind and downwind. But what that doesn't tell us about is anything about the sources, really, unless we start adding in extra chemical analyses uh, such as traces like ethane or or methane isotopes and we we're not going to go into that sort of level of detail today but just to give you an idea of you know you have to match your your measurement and your quantification methods to the scale and they tell you very different things about the uh, the infrastructure that you're you're looking at so what i'm going to talk about is we're going to effectively look at component level, but I'm going to try and convince you all that there's quite a lot of potential to bring in um, the sort of work that, that a lot of my research looks at, which is more facility level uh, measurements and quantification, and that we can bring some of the ideas in from there. And uh, and hopefully I'll not upset Sarah too much with what I'm about to say from, from her talk as well. So keep in mind that this is what we're, we're looking at. We've got our isolated infrastructure. And here's a little model of uh, sort of back of the envelope using a, 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 um, a Lagrangian dispersion model uh, quickly run just to show you what we think our emissions would look like from, from an abandoned well infrastructure. So here we have our infrastructure in, with its little green uh, star. Uh, this is done with a, a one gram per hour emission rate. Uh, we've got a leak height of one meter above the ground. We've got a, a wind speed of three meters per second uh, in in an open area, so essentially just grass field. And what you can see here, I hope, is that with a with a one gram per hour emission, we're still able to see something in the sort of one or two ppb, perhaps even ten ppb, if we're really at the heart of the plume, a good several to ten meters downwind. So even for those lowest um, DOE rest, uh, recommendations of what we're potentially looking at, we want we want to quantify. We can still even think about using open path methods rather than absolute direct uh, measurements as viable solutions if we have the technology to do so. So here are the five things that I'm going to race through and look at in terms of. Uh, in terms of methodologies. So we're going to start with 
what I would describe as the uh, the most precise and the gold standard, which is uh, the, the bespoke custom chamber options. And then we're going to move all the way down to uh, to remote sensing with drones and an open path laser system and everything in between. And what you'll see here is that uh, most of these images are not taken from um, people measuring uh, abandoned oil and gas infrastructure. And that's primarily because a lot of these technologies haven't been applied to that yet and certainly don't exist in the literature being applied to oil and gas infrastructure. But I believe that, that there is opportunity for them to be to do so. So I'll what I will say, I will caveat this by saying if you want to know more about uh, uh, chambers and chamber-like systems and uh, and high-flow sampling systems, then talk to Mary. She is the expert in the room uh, with this rather than myself. Uh, but this is what I think is the gold standard. You can completely isolate your emission source. You're not influenced by any other local sources. And providing that you can truly isolate the system and that you don't have um diffuse source uh, emissions coming out from around the well or several sources then it's very reliable the, the problems really come in that it's time consuming if you've got some unusual um shaped infrastructure you might have to uh, have some custom fabrication if all your um emission points are below ground then then that becomes a real problem and it's expensive uh, mainly because you might have to make something bespoke and you probably will spend the whole day uh, with one or two people on site uh, having to staff this. Um, the alternative in terms of chamber type systems is something like a high flow sampler, but your precision and your limit of detection on this is, is much less. Um, so you may end up with an awful lot of zeros where in fact you have small emission sources. So depending on what you're trying to achieve, it might not be so effective. And also you may not be able to entirely uh, encapsulate your emission source. The next thing that I'd like us to sort of vaguely consider is something like an eddy-covariance system. Now, eddy-covariance is an incredibly challenging um, tool to use. It effectively relies on the idea that uh, you have a footprint that your measurement system is capable of seeing and that the winds will naturally um, change and different eddies will be captured um, by your by your system uh, and that will relate to the uh, to the height of your system that it's been deployed at and the wind speeds um, these types of systems have been really reliably deployed in uh, footprint calculations, so you're really normally looking at places like wetlands, uh, rice paddies, uh, water bodies, and the like, where you've got a nice uniform uh, emission source. Um, but if you mount your um, your tower at a very low low height and you're able to define your footprint very well, it does have potential for being applied to uh, something like an abandoned oil and gas well if you can isolate it well enough. And it's the sort of thing that potentially could do long-term monitoring as well. Um, I think this is quite a way off being, being developed in terms of being um, not just something out of a scientific toolkit and an academics toolkit, um, but with the technology increasing and all the time uh, miniaturization of the uh, sensors, it might be something that we're looking at in a, in a few years as, as something viable for deployment. Now, as mentioned by Sarah, OTM 33A is something that's being used already. Um, I'd like to expand that as an idea to, to describe this as OTM 33A like. Um, I This is what I would describe as my bread and butter of my, my research portfolio, really. Um, and doing mobile surveys with vehicles. Um, I see no reason why you can't deploy this for abandoned oil and gas well infrastructure uh, using walkover surveys, uh, operating a few meters downwind from an oil and gas well. Um, the alternative is what you can see uh, set up on the, on the bottom left here. I, I'm pointing at my screen, but I think that might be futile. Um, but... Um, if, if you can see my cursor, you essentially can set up downwind from infrastructure 
and allow the natural variation of the wind to uh, to to create a, a nice Gaussian um, distribution of your emissions that you see at an observation point. And from that, you can calculate uh, flux as long as you know the wind field uh, nice and accurately as well. Um, the recommendation in OTM 33A is that you need at least 12 minutes of data at one hertz. Um, there are new instruments coming onto the market that can measure it well over true one hertz. Uh, and there are wind measurements now that are designed for drones that can happily measure on a drone at similar similar speeds as well. So you, you have potential here for small instrumentation. The commitment to the instrumentation is still rather expensive. Um, but I think that in terms of open path methodology, this type of thing might be what we're looking at in the in the future is something that could be deployed um, without a huge amount of experience and just following a, a very set procedure. It's the sort of work that uh, I'd be happy to send a, a first or second year undergraduate out doing uh, with minimal with minimal expert experience. The rate will still have a, a medium to large uncertainty. Um, some of the uncertainties that we we get regularly are in the order of sort of 50, plus or minus 50, 60 percent. But I think depending on what we're trying to do, that, that could be easily good enough for creating uh, emission distributions. Um, if we want to go one step further, there is the potential for doing this in a really nice deluxe way. Um, if the uh, if the measurement technology is available, where we release a tracer at the same point as the emission source, and that allows us to get rid of all the questions about what the wind is doing at the same time. Um, so commonly, this is used on landfills uh, in Europe, uh, and I believe so in the US as well, where you release uh, a tracer of another gas, and then essentially the ratio of that gas to the unknown gas, in this case methane, uh, is used to calculate your, your emission flux, and it's incredibly reliable. Um, as we move down the, the systems in terms of um, ability to quantify, we have the, the QOGI systems, which are getting better. Um, it has to be said, uh, a lot of them are now optically cooled, uh, and that's really helping. Um, and obviously, you can do screening and localization and quantification in a single visit. They're relatively straightforward to use, um, but they do suffer from, from robust quantification issues. You get a lot of problems with interferences, uh, water vapor in the atmosphere is a particular problem, uh, and the background to images is, is often a problem. Ideally, you would have a nice uh, plain background, which is fine if you're looking up and doing a stack emission with a nice blue sky, uh, but if you've got grass and trees moving about in the background and you're in a in the sort of places we're looking at abandoned oil and gas, uh, that can become quite a problem. Um, and a lot of them have what I would describe as image processing black boxes, which makes them quite difficult to assess from a from an academic perspective. Uh, finally, I, I'll mention Open Path uh, TDLAS. Um, Open Path TDLAS, I think, is probably our only remote sensing option at the moment. Uh, as Sarah alluded to, our uh, true aerial in terms of sort of hyperspectral imaging from aircraft uh, will only capture the absolute top end of emissions. So the ones that uh, um, people like Stuart Riddick have found uh, and the maybe a push the top end that Mary found at five kilograms an hour um, are things that hyperspectral cameras from aircraft will see. Uh, GHG sat, you're still really looking at 100 kilograms an hour before you're able to pick up uh, and that's the, the most accurate uh, satellite that we have available to us at the moment. Um, but drone mounting of TDLAS uh, and then doing uh, what I believe is termed a lawnmower pattern with a drone, um, couple that with something like a magnetometry survey, and you're, you're potentially then able to pick up infrastructure and match it to, uh, match it to abandoned oil and gas wells. Um, it's not especially precise. Um, there's a frightening lack of um, literature studies in the academic uh, in the academic literature for, for open path TDLES, which scares me a little bit. Uh, but I'm hoping that that is something that we'll begin to see um, change in the near future. Um, but it does have good potential for um, 
large scale uh, emission detection in terms of covering uh, large areas relatively quickly if you couple couple this with a drone for finding your absolute worst cases uh, for mitigation planning. Um, lastly, I'll just sort of have a quick mention of uh, types of sensors that we have available at the moment, just to sort of give you an idea of what we're what we're looking at. Um, if we look in the sort of top right here, uh, those would be our sort of laser cavity systems that uh, tend to be the uh, resolve of the academic community, but I fully believe that these are things that uh, I'd like to see becoming more widespread in, in industry, especially if we start using open path um, measurements a lot more. We're still in the area of twenty, thirty thousand dollars at the very cheapest end. Um, there are cheaper sensors coming onto the market. These have a you know a accuracy of about one ppb uh, in atmospheric methane. They're incredibly precise and really, really good uh, in academic instruments. There are now systems coming into play that are 10 to 100 ppb that are cheaper cavity systems that are about 5,000 US dollars uh, and still and very small, totally drone mountable, uh, might become very useful. And then we're into the commercial sort of um, metal oxide sensors, NDIR type sensors, which from an academic perspective are not something that we use, uh, but in, if we're going to move to sort of things like long-term monitoring uh, that you could attach to infrastructure or, you know, very, very close to infrastructure for long-term monitoring, then they might might well have a role to play. So I'll leave you with my take-home message, which is really that the gold standard for quantification is still our bespoke chamber systems. But I fully believe that if we are thinking about sensible things to, to help us, then if we want cost-effective bucketing of emissions uh, for mitigation planning, and so we can calculate emission distributions, then th there's plenty of open path technologies available, and uh, and hopefully that'll improve as things develop. So I'll stop talking. Apologies if I've gone a little bit over, Mary, but uh, I'll let you carry on. No, no problem. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sue Brantley who's also joining online. Thanks, Mary. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So um, your slides, give me, give, give us a second for your slides to come up here. Um, yeah, I'm sharing them from here. So it's going to take the. Oh, we see them. Uh, it's, it's, if you want to change it to uh, slideshow mode. Yeah, it looks great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Sue Bradley. I'm a professor of geosciences at Penn State University. I've worked for almost 40 years in how water interacts with rock. And since 2011, I've been looking at water quality around uh, shale gas wells. And I'm uh, transmitting from that very well-known oil and gas region of the Adirondack Mountains. That's a joke in case you're not a geologist. Um, I'm transmitting over Starlink. So if Elon Musk, his satellites or clouds or trees get in the way, I may go in and out a little bit because um, you have been going out a little bit, which doesn't usually happen, but hopefully you'll have patience as I go along. So um, I'm gonna talk about uh, mostly my observations from Pennsylvania, uh, but informed by national. And as you heard yesterday, Pennsylvania has, I believe the most number of abandoned wells and so, we have a lot to say on this particular topic. And in the work that I've done uh, throughout Pennsylvania with graduate students, Josh Woda and Sam Shaheen, who's now working with Jim Sayers at Yale, uh, we actually discovered that not only are there uh, discharges all around Pennsylvania that look like you see the picture on the left, left the acid mine drainage, where uh, acid is being released because pyrite uh, associated with coal or its surrounding rocks is being oxidized. And so it's acidified uh, discharges. But we also see now a uh, gas leak drainage where we believe that methane that's being released from old legacy wells and sometimes uh, more recent wells goes into an aquifer and uh, draws down the oxygen and then actually releases iron into solution. And interestingly enough, when you see them in the field as the one on the right, uh, they don't look that much different if the iron 
is also oxidizing. So basically what you're seeing is the uh, orange red color is that iron that was mobilized uh, that oxidizes and precipitates is what people call rust or uh, iron oxide. So I thought what I would talk about is kind of very pragmatically, my understanding is that the DOI is asking for each grant recipient to document uh, methodologies and indicators and attempts to measure and track contamination of groundwater and to look at this as pre and post plugging. And so I just wanted to think about, you know, what, uh, what might happen to, to do this tracking and, and monitoring. So the questions that come to mind are when should water be, wa when should water be sampled and analyzed? Who should do the sampling analysis? What could be chemically analyzed and where should the water be, be sampled? And I'll try to talk about each of those. Now, uh, for anyone that's looked at any kind of hydrogeochemical issues, contamination problems, proving that uh, some source has caused a problem is really difficult in hydrogeology. And we typically use what's called a multiple, uh, 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 multiple uh, technique uh, approach. And we can look at water chemistry, all different kinds of chemistry, gas chemistry, isotopes, pump tests, geologic mapping, geochemical modeling, hydrologic modeling. And in this case, what uh, companies would like to see would be that plugging has fixed a problem. So either you've got a problem and now you're fixing it. And I think it's clear that timeline data before and after uh, plugging, that kind of data is really gonna be the gold standard, which, which is really obvious, but it's uh, sometimes in my experience over 40 years saying the obvious is, is worthwhile. So that's the first question, when we have to do some kind of measurements before and after. Who should do the sampling? I think this is pretty obvious also. It should be professional hydrogeologists and then certified uh, labs. And uh, most of these uh, contaminants can be relatively straightforwardly measured, uh, although it gets difficult as the, as the concentrations get very low. So what could be analyzed and where uh, should be analyzed? So where, what could be chemically analyzed? I thought that uh, there's three overarching criteria. One, what primary contaminants do we expect? So why don't we look at what's released from some uh, modern oil and gas wells when there's problems or legacy oil and gas wells? And then what se secondary contaminants are released from the subsurface when the primary contaminants um, are released? And then I think we should always look at this from the point of view of the people that live in these areas the first question is kind of a scientific uh, professional question. The second one is what toxic species should local residents be most worried about because we might wanna uh, look at those as well. So this is just uh, the percent of issues as stated in Pennsylvania water supply determination letters indicating problems caused by shale gas well de development as of 2023. So you can just sort of see that like, for example, 50% of the uh, determination letters by the state regulator were citing uh, methane release. And uh, so that is going to be most likely the, the, the biggest problem, the most uh, likely problem. But we have to recognize that there are many sources of methane that are unrelated to oil and gas, biogenic gas, so gas produced by bacteria and other, and other biota, swamps, riparian zones, landfills, and then there's also gas from depth, which is really shale gas, but it comes up naturally uh, in some parts of the country and especially in Pennsylvania. And so to document that methane is from a leaking well generally has required analysis of isotopes. So carbon isotopes, uh, deuterium sometimes. And then we often look at the longer chain uh, gases like ethane, C2H6, but as soon as you start putting all those isotopic measurements and, and ethane in there, you're, you're starting to get upwards towards uh, you know, hundreds of dollars per sample. And even with those measurements, it's never 100% definitive. It's not truly a fingerprint. This is just an example. This is uh, uh, hydrogen isotopes in methane plotted versus carbon isotopes in methane. And uh, the biogenic parts of the, of the region where you expect Biogenic gas to plot are shown down at the bottom here. And then thermogenic gas, this is gas coming like what we think of as oil and gas gas, is up here in the middle. 
And then you can actually see that different sources, uh, depending on the geological age, Upper and Middle Devonian and the Marcellus, actually plot in different parts of this, of this region. And this is from a study with, I did with uh, grad student Paul Grieve. These are samples from different rivers up in, uh, in the north, northeastern part of Pennsylvania plotted on here. And you can see that the thermogenic gas in these streams actually looks a lot like the, the gas coming uh, from depth. And some of these we think might have been uh, um, leakage, but some of it was natural, natural uh, leakage. And then oxidation can actually change the isotopes as well. And then I just put this picture in of myself. This is near Fredonia, New York, which is uh, very near one of the very first places where methane was emitting at the surface. Th again, thermogenic methane was emitting at the surface coming up through fractures and shale and was used, I think in 1815, 1812, something very early uh, to, 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 to light uh, uh, the town of, of Fredonia. And so it's a very long standing knowledge that thermogenic gas can be emitted naturally. Now, when this methane uh, is leaked uh, from a borehole, as shown here schematically, secondary contaminants can be, can be released as well. So for example, the methane can be oxidized and uh, that can be coupled by bacteria to reduction of sulfate. So there's always some sulfate in water. Uh, naturally, and when it's uh, reduced, it goes to hydrogen sulfate, sulfide, which is a toxic gas. This is the rotten egg smell. Uh, methane can also be oxidized to CO2 at the same time that rust, iron oxides, are reduced uh, to iron 2 plus. And so it turns out that a lot of iron oxides uh, are present in the subsurface, and they often have other metals in them like arsenic, so that can be released into solution at the same time. So these would be secondary contaminants. And uh, the iron two and sulfide can precipitate as, as different forms of, of iron minerals. And depending on which is higher, the iron two or the hydrogen sulfide, you get different kinds of chemistry in your gas leak discharge. But if that iron eventually oxidizes, that's where you get the, uh, the you know, the, the discharge that looks like this. So the second most frequently identified contaminant group from the shale gas identified by the regulator are iron and manganese and uh, turbidity, so little particles that are released. And this is related to this process that I was just talking about, the redox changes. And distinguishing this from natural iron and manganese is obviously difficult, but you need to, if you look at before and after, then you can make some kind of determination. The third most commonly identified contaminant group are salt species. And that's because um, oil and gas comes up with a lot of water. And this is something a lot of people don't know, but it is very true. Um, very large volumes of uh, salty water come up with uh, the oil and gas. And so it's very common, again, in the shale gas region of uh, Northern Appalachians to see high total dissolved solids, chloride, and uh, barium because that's an indicator uh, salt. Most of the salt in these brines are sodium chloride, but there are these indicator elements like barium. But again, there are other sources of salts. Road salt is ubiquitous up here where we have uh, heavy winters, but there is also brine, which is this same Appalachian ba basin brine that comes up naturally. And there's other parts of the country where uh, basin brine comes up naturally. And then there's other sources of these elements that are other sources that are the types of pollution that are not oil and gas. So distinguish this often requires identification of element element ratios. And here's just an example. This is plot of chloride to bromide versus chloride. And you don't really need to understand all of this, but you can see that uh, uh, these brines coming up in the Marcellus kind of plot over here. And so these were uh, domestic water wells that are starting to show a signature that looks like it may have been impacted. And this is in a, in a published study by one of my grad students. Well, so it is uh, worthwhile thinking about what's in these brines and uh, the brines around the country and the different basins are different. Uh, the Marcellus in uh, the Pennsylvania and the Northern Appalachian has some of the saltiest, seven times saltier than seawater. It's mostly sodium chloride and then it has these indicator elements but there are also some toxic elements and uh, thallium and arsenic are, are two of those. And there's also organics that are present. And uh, some of these organics can be put into the brines uh, 
essentially are part of the injectate uh, when the wells are fracked, but some of these organics are also natural. They're part of this brine, which is water that is, which is present in the rock um, at depth. And then uh, I think all the brines have uh, uh, radium also. And it turns out again in the Northern Appalachians, uh, we have some of the most radioactive brines. So radium is the main contributor of radioactivity. Um, and in the Allegheny National Forest, my grad student Sam Shaheen has observed that some of these abandoned well discharges, so the water that comes up with these abandoned wells can have as much as 1% brine in them. And so some of these more toxic elements then uh, can be elevated in concentration uh, to very slight amounts. But there's much more salt than there is the toxic elements. And uh, I just did a back of the envelope calculation to, to figure out what the chloride concentration would be in drinking water if the water were contaminated by average Pennsylvania production water. So the sort of average Pennsylvania brine that's coming up. And I assumed that each metal uh, reached the EPA maximum contamination limit. Because I was wondering, you know, if there was brine contaminating somebody's drink, drinking water, would they taste the salt? And turns out that uh, some of these uh, toxic elements are uh, at concentrations that you wouldn't probably taste the salt if it was uh, contaminated by kind of average brine. Now, there really is no average brine. The brine varies across the, you know, every basin in the country and varies across Pennsylvania, uh, but it just uh, behooves us to think about some of these metals because they can be, or they are toxic for humans. Where should it be sampled? Well, surface waters is, is one possibility. Uh, we did a study at one point to try to figure out if you could use surface water to detect methane contamination from oil and gas wells. And this shows uh, like almost 150 sites and the concentration of the methane in the surface waters goes actually uh, relatively high in these surface waters. And uh, what we discovered was almost every site was always super saturated with, uh, with respect to methane in the atmosphere. And that's because there's lots of sources of methane, natural sources, but also some uh, contamination sort of sources. The median of non-wetlands, so non-swampy background samples was 0 0.5 uh, micrograms methane per liter. And the maximum was four micrograms methane per liter. And so we suggested that as a threshold for non-wetland sites, surface water sites, concentrations above this tended, we think, could be used uh, as sort of, again, a back of the envelope threshold that shows you either there's some kind of leaking gas well, shallow organic rich shale, which is releasing thermogenic gas like in Fredonia, New York, or coal releases uh, or landfill. And then there are places where we observed uh, uh, relatively high values that were near what we thought were putatively leaking shale gas wells. So we also went out to around 41 non-wetland sites near active plugged orphaned abandoned wells. Some of these were some of Mary, Mary Kang's uh, high emitters. And we, of the 41, 12 of them were above the thresholds. So you could use surface waters to sort of find some of these sites, but it's difficult because you have to avoid wetlands. And then there's other sources of methane as well. Groundwater, I just wanted to emphasize uh, mainly that uh, a lot of the subsurface doesn't look like a perfect layer cake like this. This is from uh, Mary's uh, slide earlier. In some terrains, uh, contaminants are not observed in the groundwater close to the source. They're observed one to two kilometers distant. And that has to do a lot with the subsurface uh, fracturing and faults uh, and folding. And, and this is especially true in parts of the country where oil and gas are developed. Um, in stratigraphies like uh, in the Northern Appalachian Basin. This is an example I published in 2013 based on uh, uh, Garth Llewellyn, who's a consultant. He was doing a project, this is not oil and gas related, but you can see a LIDAR image of, you know, here's some streams in Pennsylvania. This is in, uh, I think, uh, Northern uh, Pennsylvania. They injected bromide in a quarry and then they uh, thought that that bromide should seep into the nearest stream and down here. So they uh, sampled here, but they also sampled at a seep over here and the next drainage over more than a kilometer away and then in this spring. And here's what happened in the seeps over here, 
they saw after the injection, the bromide went up and then they injected again, they saw it go up again. And they never really saw any responses over here. So geology can be very complicated in terms of finding uh, connections uh, between uh, source and then and, uh, and contamination. And this is an example that wasn't an oil and gas in that last example. This is an example where groundwater supply uh, down here, this is again in um, uh, north, northeastern Pennsylvania, some homeowner wells uh, here were contaminated. And here you can see that they were definitely contaminated. And they were uh, between one and three kilometers from some shale gas wells that were uh, drilled here. And before this kind of contamination happened, this is 2-BTBE that was uh, uh, kind of a foaming agent that got through to these wells. Before this uh, was observed, uh, methane uh, emission was observed in these homeowner wells. And then this is the Susquehanna River over here and bubbling was observed over here before uh, any of this actually happened. And so this is a cross section of this area. This is a big fault and this is the manifestation of the fault at the surface. And to the best of our ability and Garth Llewellyn, uh, who is the uh, consultant who worked in this area, it looked like uh, contamination moved this way along the plane of this fault and then emitted. And then it also uh, got into um, the bedding planes, which are shown here. And so it kind of was able to move not only this way, but also upwards and got into these homeowner wells. So this is my final slide. Uh, when should water be sampled and analyzed? You'd have to do before and after. Um, who should do the sampling? Uh, you need professional hydrogeologists and certified labs. None of this is uh, completely easy. Uh, and so you need professionals to do it. Um, what could be chemically analyzed in the water? Uh, I put could here because if you did all of this, it would be very expensive, uh, but we could analyze gases and you can look at methane and ethane for sure. There are other longer chain uh, hydrocarbons that could be analyzed. The salt cations uh, uh, could be uh, analyzed and then the anions can be analyzed, including looking for H2S and then metals and toxic species as well as some of the low concentration organics that could also become problematic if there's enough brine uh, that gets into uh, uh, drinking water. So like where brine has come up uh, some legacy wells, uh, you could certainly expect possibly to start worrying about these toxic elements as I've indicated. And where should water be sampled? Well, uh, monitoring wells always sound great, but I always worry because monitoring wells would have to be perfectly sited, and I'm not sure where a perfect site would be. So drinking water wells might be great to uh, sample around uh, legacy wells, because then you're also Satellites. Probably within a kilometer at most uh, three kilometers. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Um, now I want to turn it over to Greg. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Greg Lackey. I'm a research engineer at the National Energy Technology Lab in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, there we go. Uh, so what I want to present today is some work that we've been doing over the last, I guess, five or six years, uh, where we've been really leveraging publicly available data sets to understand well integrity risks. Uh, so we've had some really nice presentations in this session about methane emissions and groundwater contamination. Uh, this work really seeks to understand the source, so the wells themselves. I'm using the term integrity intentionally, right? Because wells can have integrity issues and not leak. They're systems of multiple barriers, right? Um, so here, what I'm, I'm going to dive a bit deeper into some well diagrams, things like that, and analyze some of these large regulatory data sets that look in, uh, look at, you know, well integrity testing. So, uh, most states heavily weight the integrity status of a well in their plugging prioritization system. Uh, they heavily weight the leaking status of a well. Uh, I think James did a really nice job of showing all of the locations on a well that can leak and, 
uh, an integrity issue certainly can be a source, especially when we're talking about these older uh, undocumented wells. Sometimes it's just the well bore that's left on site. So I wanted to show this figure. It's from a study that my colleague, Jay Sri Iyer, uh, is leading. Uh, we're doing this under the, the catalog project in the Department of Energy. Uh, and what we've done is we've aggregated as many of the state plugging prioritization systems as we can. And a lot of these are quantitative. So they're assigning actual values to, you know, attributes of well. So we were able to aggregate them and put them on the same footing. Uh, and what you can see here is that, you know, number one is distance to sensitive receptor. I think after a lot of the images we saw yesterday of, you know, wells in gymnasiums, things like that, obviously these are the, the top wells that we want to target first. Uh, but number two is leaking status, right? So uh, what we tried to do is characterize how many wells might be leaking, how many wells might have integrity issues. Uh, number four there is, is also well design and well integrity. So really top stuff that states are using to prioritize uh, the plugging and, and abandonment of wells. And I know we've seen this image many times. So upwards of 150,000, uh, 140 some thousand documented uh, orphan wells. Uh, there's just far too many of these to have actual measurements from at least right now, right? So I know most states are making decisions about how they want to go about plugging these orphan wells. Um, we need to, you know, know what the integrity of these wells are, if they're leaking. Uh, that really is the challenge. So um, we know that it's it's really not feasible if you've got, you know, potentially uh, tens of thousands of orphan wells on your book to go visit every single one of these wells uh, and know exactly how to prioritize them. So this is where uh, I wanted to explore what we can do with these well integrity monitoring data sets. Um, I'm showing a few cross-sectional well diagrams here. Uh, these wells really look more like you know, modern wells. There's no wooden casings here. <laughs> There's no uh, open holes. Uh, but, you know, we're just seeing a few, uh, I guess really the difference between these is the cement top, uh, uh, you know, for production cement top, right? So on the far left, that looks maybe more like a, a shale gas well. Uh, some of these in some states, cement's being brought to surface on those production strings. Uh, in the middle, we're seeing that cement brought into the, the bottom of the next larger casing. And then on the far right, uh, this is actually just much more common situation where you have cement just over the producing zone. Um, and some of these leakage pathways, uh, I mean, Sue just did an excellent job of illustrating uh, some of those leakage pathways into groundwater. Um, they vary based on, on the construction and the locations of the casings in the cement. So uh, to have a leak, you need to have a source uh, and a leakage pathway, right? So a source, obviously, these are producing or intermediate zones that um, maybe you have an overpressured zone, uh, something that's going to transmit fluids into a well bore. Uh, to have a pathway, uh, it could be you know an open, uncemented portion of the annulus, like we're showing on the far left here, uh, or it could be you know a cement flaw. Uh, microannulus, we talked a lot about that yesterday. Uh, you know, gas channels, fractures. Um, or you could, you know, have a casing leak. These are all pathways that exist for that, you know, gas or brine or oil from the source to enter into the well bore and migrate to the surface. Uh, in most states that we've looked at, these well annuli are sealed at the surface. Um, and so what happens is when you have a leak like this, when you have a, a, both a source and a pathway and fluids are being transmitted up the well bore, uh, they build a pressure at the wellhead. Uh, now you can bleed that pressure off. It will return typically if there's an active, uh, you know, source bleeding the fluid into the well. Uh, we call that sustained casing pressure. Um, and there's lots of easy, you know, straightforward ways to test for sustained casing pressure. So a lot of the data that we'll that I'll show here are kind of pressure bleed down buildup tests for sustained casing pressure on those well annuli. I guess I should also here. Let me go back highlight just some of the different pathways to groundwater. So um, Sue highlighted a situation where maybe there's a, a fault or a preferential pathway along the well bore where gas migrating upward can escape into. Uh, but, you know, we've documented, at least in Colorado, some areas where we think there's issues where, you know, sustained casing pressure has been allowed to build to a degree that it's di displaced fluid from the surface casing. Kind of like, you know, when you blow bubbles into a straw, that's kind of the visual you could imagine where gas would then become, start bubbling out the bottom of the surface casing. So, all highlighting reasons to monitor for things like sustained casing pressure, reasons to have a, a well integrity monitoring program. Uh, and then pathways to the atmosphere, right? So if you leave those annuli open, I know a few states vent uh, that surface casing annulus here in the US. 
um, and most Canadian provinces vent that surface casing annulus. Uh, those fluids that are transmitted into the well bore will escape into the atmosphere. Um, so important to note here, of course, that's not the only leakage pathway. You could have faulty fittings on your wellhead, uh, right? That could transmit production gas, things like that. But uh, these are the ones that, you know, we're interested in for understanding the integrity of these wells. Is there a cement problem? Is there a casing problem? Uh, you know, what does this tell us about kind of the, the long term, uh, I guess, you know, prospect for this well? So uh, I'm highlighting here some results from a study that we put out in 2021, where we aggregated these testing data from three states where they were publicly available. And as far as I know, these are the only three states that have an operator reported program that is publicly uh, available. And if I'm wrong, if you're sitting there thinking you've got a large data set on this, please email me. I'd love to love to look at your data. Um, uh, so what we found here, the key takeaway is, is that the frequency of integrity issues among wells varies widely. Uh, so in Colorado alone, uh, we were seeing between 0.3 and 26.5% of wells, depending on the basin. So in the Raton Basin, you have these shallow coal bed methane wells, uh, a very small percentage of them develop sustained casing pressure. Uh, but up in the Denver Julesburg, um, in the Wattenberg field, we're seeing much higher frequencies, right? So 26.5% uh, was the number we had in this study. We're revising that now that the state is requiring testing for all wells, and that percentage has come down to about 17.1%. Uh, but again, you know, it depends how you look at these data. So uh, we're doing our best to interpret these data according to API protocol. So API you know, has a protocol for interpreting annular pressures uh, and diagnosing sustained casing pressure. Uh, that's, those are the methodologies that we're using to identify this in wells. And why do we see these big ranges? I was delighted, Sue, to see that you showed some geochemical plots that I don't have to attempt to, to explain this with you on the line. Uh, so in the image on the left, we're seeing uh, some, uh, some results from surface casing vents. These were collected in the Lloydminster area in Alberta. This is an area where there's a cluster of integrity issues. Uh, and, you know, at least from this relatively sm small data set, they were seeing that it was mostly intermediate gas in these surface casing annuli. So um, it was gas from the Colorado, uh, I guess the upper Colorado group entering the, the annulus and bleeding out. Um, so maybe these wells, they may might not have had cement over that interval. Maybe this isn't an integrity issue. Maybe they're just bleeding off kind of intermediate zone gas and that's what's causing the leak. Uh, but then this is a study that we put out Two years ago in the Wattenberg field, uh, it's a really large data set, about 2,000 some wells where they had uh, geochemical samples from the surface casing annulus. We've got a lot of production gas samples. Uh, and we found in about 70% of the wells that we looked at, uh, the gas isotopically matched production gas and that the cement top was above that zone, right? So these wells most likely had microannuli, some type of a cement problem uh, that, was, that was causing uh, the sustained casing pressure we were seeing in the field. So these really large data sets, um, there's lots of great groups taking these data now and building machine learning models to try to understand what causes these types of issues. And Dr. Van Ort stood up yesterday and, and shared some results from a study that he led. Uh, we've been working on this as well. Uh, and the whole idea here is gather everything you know about a well, put it into a large model, uh, and see if you can predict these types of issues. And if you can, if you can make decent predictions, it can tell you something about, you know, you can look at the importance of the features, it can tell you kind of what the drivers of these types of issues are. Um, and what we found is that we can build pretty decent classification models. So these models do a good job of telling you which well might have sustained casing pressure, which well might have casing vent flow. Uh, but what we can't do yet is predict the magnitude of that issue. So as far as I'm aware, uh, no one's produced a model that can tell you this well is going to leak five, uh, you know, five grams of methane per hour, right? We, we don't, we're not there yet. Uh, but at least at this stage, these models are valuable for screening, right? If you have thousands of wells on your books and you're trying to figure out which ones you want to inspect, you're trying to figure out which ones might have an issue, this can help constrain the problem and give you a probability uh, of leakage. And models like this are, are telling us a lot of uh, conflicting things. So, <laughs> you know, Mary uh, showed this slide, uh, showed this in her slides, um, 
her and her student did a great job of reviewing all these types of studies, looking at the different attributes that studies have identified contribute to integrity issues. Uh, and there's a number that consistently seem to affect, uh, affect leakage and integrity. And there's a number that kind of have conflicting results. And I think, you know, if you look just a few slides ago, we're talking about, you know, how, how, how much variation there are in well types, how much variation there are in, in sources uh, and different pathways for well leakage. Uh, so I, I think these findings are not unexpected. And I guess they just really highlight that the more data you have from the area you're concerned about, the better, right? The more you can tell uh, about that basin or that field. I wanted to touch on a few of these. Uh, number one, we all have been talking about well age. Um, and at least in these data sets, uh, we see that the relationship between well age and leakage is often reversed, uh, where the models will rely on well age, but they'll typically favor uh, younger, newer wells. Uh, so this is partially because we do see higher frequency of integrity issue among you know newer horizontal and directional wells. Uh, that's that's pretty well documented in the literature that you know wellboard deviation it gets harder to you know get your cement seal. We do see a lot more gas uh, gas leakage issues in those types of wells, uh, but it's also because our data sets are are biased, right? So a lot of these data have only been collected since around you know 2000, if we're lucky, 2010 even. Um, so we don't have a really long history of integrity testing data. Uh, you could imagine that older wells, and maybe you were in, it was installed in the, in the 50s, 60s, if they were problematic, they were likely abandoned before these tests were taken. So we don't have a complete view. Uh, and then when we're talking orphan wells, you know, there's no operator to go do these tests to enter them into these data sets, right? So um, keep in mind when you're seeing stuff like this, this is on a modern well data set. There's, uh, these wells typically look like the ones that I was showing uh, on a previous slide. But some findings that, that are pretty strong is that we, we do see that well integrity issues are, are spatially clustered. Um, so we see, we've seen spatial clustering in Alberta. That's an image there on the left, that Lloydminster area, Cold Lake, uh, lots of spatial clustering of integrity issues there. Uh, we see them spatially clustered in British Columbia and the North, uh, in the Fort Nelson and, and Plains area. Um, and when you think about it, a lot of this makes sense. Uh, we're just talking about how variable geology is in the U.S., right? Uh, we design wells for specific geologies, specific operators operate wells in specific areas. Uh, Tobler's law uh, comes through here. So wells that are located closer to each other are more likely to be like those wells, right? They're inherently intertwined with the geology, uh, and, and we're seeing that come through. Uh, I also think there's some of the issues that, that Sue was highlighting. Uh, some wells, when, when they leak, they can transmit fluids to other nearby wells, right? So uh, we heard anecdotes yesterday of plugging one well and having gas come out another well. Uh, you know, some of these wells are connected. So when you have a problem in one well, it might turn into a cluster, right? And uh, we're, we're finishing a study right now where this is really clear in the Wattenberg field. We, we essentially did that large U.S. study. We came back to revisit the field where we feel that we have the best data in the U.S. Uh, in the Wattenberg, um, we've been in testing wells for their integrity, you know, for quite a while now, over a decade. Um, we have 40,000 wells in the region, uh, you know, tens of thousands of tests taken over many years that we can use to build these models. Uh, and what really stands out more than anything is the role that geology plays. So uh, in both of these figures, I'm highlighting what we're calling a hotspot for sustained casing pressure, not to be confused with the hotspot or the thermal anomaly in the field, uh, but that kind of aligns. Uh, and what we see is this region, there's almost a quadrupling effect. So if you're a well located in there, it's almost four times more likely to develop integrity issues than wells located outside of that region. Uh, and that region directly follows the Longmont Wrench Fault, right? So these large wrench faults uh, are in the basin. Um, and that area where the Longmont Wrench Fault is, it kind of intersects the basin axis. It's, there's a lot of geologic complexity. There's a documented increase in subsurface fracturing there. Um, and what's really interesting is when you layer it on top of ground elevations, the hotspot lies in the river valleys of the St. Frain and South Platte rivers. We know that rivers often follow fault lines. Uh, so we're seeing kind of a nexus of a number of things here, right? Increased migration in the subsurface. These are, you know, groundwater discharge zones. There's lots of fluids moving in the subsurface in this area. Um, and I think that those are all the things that would contribute to, to these types of anomalies. So um, 
really having these well integrity monitoring programs can really help us identify these types of areas. And when I think about orphan wells, right, we know that they're not in these data sets. I think some of our findings that can help here are, is the, you know, the spatial clustering. It's almost unsatisfying when you're a scientist. You know, you want to find very tangible, pragmatic findings. You want to say, oh, we need to have cement tops here or intermediate casings. Like I was hoping to have a really clear message from this type of modeling. Uh, but no matter what I did, these models really rely on the spatial element to make their predictions. Uh, but when you abstract and think about our challenge with orphan wells, it's almost better in this way, right? Because you don't really need to know all that much about the well. Uh, maybe its location is enough to, to make a prediction about uh, whether or not it might, it might be leaking. Um, so these are two images from on the left. That's from the Wattenberg field. Uh, you can see that, you know, what I'm showing on the x-axis is the distance to the closest well with sustained casing pressure. Uh, the number, each bar represents the number of wells in that category, and the orange bars are the wells, you know, with sustained casing pressure. And the percentage, you know, increases uh, multi, up to over 20% if you're within about 400 meters or 500 meters of another well with sustained casing pressure. Uh, yet the further you go away, right, those percentages drop uh, precipitously. And I was surprised. Now we're, you know, working with states to interpret compliance inspection data. Compliance inspections are generally a lot uh, more qualitative and not quantitative, right? On the left, we're showing results of engineering tests. On the right, we're showing uh, responses to questions like, is the well leaking, yes or no, right? Uh, but we're seeing the same trends, right? So this is from New York State. Um, and again, in New York State, when we look at this, um, the, lo the closer you are to a well where emissions have been noted during an inspection, the more likely you are to, to have an emission. So I think this really poses the question that I have, you know, will these learnings that we have from these large integrity data sets translate to older orphan wells? Um, I've mentioned it a couple of times on the, on the right. I'm showing just the, the histogram of well ages for uh, orphan wells, uh, documented orphan wells by their completion year. Uh, on the, the, in the green, I'm showing where our digital integrity testing records have been collected. Uh, on the far left, I'm showing where most of the undocumented orphan wells live in time. Um, so I think obviously some of these newer orphan wells, some of these findings convey, but there's a, an interesting question to be answered here. You know, will these findings translate? And I'm showing just kind of the difference here and and what it looks like uh, to have an open well. Uh, some of these images where you you no longer have a wellhead. Maybe there's cement in the well. Maybe there's casing. Maybe there's not. Um, certainly, uh, this is something that I think we can we have an opportunity to find out. So. Um, this is the map that, that Kimbra showed, uh, thousands of, uh, I, guess, I guess, I don't know the exact number of how many wells have been plugged uh, under, the, under the orphan well program, but we're certainly building a really large data set here. Uh, we have the opportunity to collect emissions measurements from these wells. We have the opportunity to figure out if they, uh, if they were, were leaking and, and had these issues when we abandoned them. And aggregating these data is, is really critically important to understand wells and well integrity and well leakage. Um, I would also say, you know, if you're managing one of these programs and you're going out and you're taking these measurements at multiple wells and you only plug one of them, those other data you gathered are also valuable. So those, those, those zero, uh, zero rates, when you find a well, if it's an orphan well and it doesn't have emissions, record it, right? This is all really valuable when we try to understand this at, you know, the 10,000 foot level. Um, and I wanted to highlight some work from colleagues at the USGS here in the bottom right. Uh, you know, they, they, they put out a really nice study this past year where they aggregated a lot of the emissions measurements that have been done and showed uh, the, the leakage rates by uh, which geology they're in. And, you know, we are seeing, you know, more, I guess, higher emissions from wells located in thermogenic gas reservoirs. So this is kind of where we're going is what I'm trying to show, right? Like there's a pretty small data set right now, but as we gather more data and as we put it together, we can really try to understand uh, well leakage at, the, at this bigger scale. And certainly, uh, I would be remiss not to give a plug for what we're doing at, at DOE. So we are trying to develop methods that will help categorize and, and document uh, some of these orphan wells. Uh, so, you know, documentation is a spectrum. There's a lot of these wells that we, we know where they are. We know their age. Uh, but, you know, they're pay, they're, they've got paper records. They're not in the digital database, right? 
Um, we're developing tools to help digitize old records using you know, OCR, uh, different uh, large language modeling techniques. Um, there's groups working on you know, synthesizing uh, multiple sensors data, multiple forms of data to, to locate wells in the field, applying that to old topographic maps, things like that. Um, and then they're working on non-invasive well characterization techniques that I think we could help populate some of these data sets. And I, I, I do want to stress that, you know, uh, we need to continue collaborating with the states. Um, pretty much, you know, there's, there's lots of valuable information here. Uh, on the left, I'm showing uh, some work that uh, Sue did in 2014, just looking at uh, compliance inspection data. So a lot of my results I'm showing here are not compliance inspection results. Um, but most states have a compliance inspection program. Uh, and I've found that it's absolutely important to sit down in the room and work with uh, the inspectors themselves to make sure we're interpreting the, you know, the, their data the right way, make sure we know which instruments they're taking in the field, what the detection limit of those instruments are, um, the type of information they're bringing back. Uh, so we're doing this right now, like I said earlier, with New York State. Uh, they have a, a really thorough compliance inspection program. They've inspected most of the wells in the state within the last 10 years. And, you know, I'll just leave everyone with, you know, we're not the only community working on this, right? So um, all of these findings will be valuable for those seeking to use the subsurface for other purposes in the future. Uh, what I'm showing here are uh, locations where Class 6 permits have been submitted in the U.S. There's been over 100 Class 6 um, you know, CO2 injection well permits submitted. Uh, each one of these will have an area of review, potentially with legacy wells. Uh, a lot of these legacy wells might be orphan wells. Um, so some of these trends that we can understand about wells and well construction, how they relate to well leakage will convey uh, to other fields. And they'll be really important for us to understand, you know, what, what is the risk of that legacy well leaking? Uh, obviously, in these situations where we're changing the subsurface, right, we're, we're, Yes, I'm almost done. We're we're increasing pressure. We're 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 changing all of that. So uh, we certainly um, really need to have a good understanding of what what causes these wells to uh, to leak and, and what they look like. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have Jim Bears from Yale. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for staying with us. I know uh, um, hour and a half is a long time to sit in one place. And I see that the 15 minute uh, time limit is more of a guideline than a rule, <laughs> but, but, but I will attempt to treat it as a rule. Once they start. Once they start. <laughs> Can I see it on my screen here too, please? Okay. All right. Well, anyways, um, what I'm going to do is is build a little bit on what, yes, what what Sue was talking about. Stay, go back to the groundwater realm, and talk about how models can inform groundwater monitoring plans. But I promise no equations. So I'm going to start with an observation. Um, the first is that groundwater quality monitoring is central to aquifer and human health protection, but it's expensive and it's rarely done to assess orphan well contamination. Um, based on this, I have a premise. I would propose that to make groundwater monitoring around orphan wells practical, measurements should be made that target areas of highest vulnerability to contamination. With that in mind, um, this presentation is going to describe a vulnerability framework that might be suitable for informing the design of groundwater monitoring plans to evaluate orphan well impacts. So start with a definition of vulnerability. Vulnerability is a likelihood or probability of drinking water impairment at a receptor location in the event of a contaminant release from a source. So in this case, the receptors um, that we're often interested in are residential or household drinking water wells. Um, but it could be a, a stream discharge area. It could be a public water supply well. Um, the source here is uh, nondescript, um, but it could be an orphan well, for example, that is leaking. Um, 
The notion here is that when contaminants are moved from a source, they don't move randomly, but they travel in a preferred direction according to uh, physical flow and transport processes. Therefore, vulnerability of a receptor to contamination uh, depends on the spatial relationship between sources and receptors, as well as groundwater flow patterns and rates. Vulnerab vulnerability can also be estimated with hydrologic models. So model-based vulnerability assessments can help address the, the following questions that are important to groundwater quality monitoring around orphan wells. For example, it can help inform which domestic water wells are or will be mostly affected by orphan well contamination. When will contamination from orphan wells likely be detected in water supplies? And where should monitoring wells, if any, be installed to detect and characterize orphan well contamination? So what I'm going to do is discuss uh, a vulnerability framework that um, with some examples from studies uh, that we conducted in the Appalachian Basin looking at the vulnerability of residential uh, drinking water supplies to unconventional oil and gas development. In this, these examples, the unconventional oil and gas well pad is um, the source of contamination. And here we are typically interested in spills of wastewater that Sue had talked about. But a similar analysis could be done um, using an orphan well or orphan wells in place of unconventional oil and gas pads. So we started our analysis in um, northeastern Pennsylvania um, in a watershed that's 300 kilometers squared in Bradford County. And it's shown here. And in this um, figure, you can see uh, unconventional oil and gas well pads. Those are the gray hexagons and the blue circles um, are residential drinking water wells. In this area, the Marcellus Shale is primarily targeted for um, natural gas. So the first step in the vulnerability assessment is to develop and calibrate a groundwater flow model. The purpose of the groundwater flow model is to predict the distribution in hydraulic heads or groundwater levels. From this, groundwater flow patterns can be deduced and then contaminant migration can be simulated. So we calibrated this model by um, identifying an ensemble of, of simulations that allowed us to match mo or mo allow allowed model predictions from the flow model to match groundwater discharges to stream and measured aquifer water levels, okay? The results here in this picture at the left are one realization of the groundwater flow model. We actually ran 2,000 realizations. And the reason that we did that is we wanted to assess the uncertainty in the model parameterization on groundwater flow. So this picture at the left shows the colors are the hydraulic heads or groundwater flow distribution or groundwater level distribution and the arrows are groundwater flow directions. Most of what happens in the Appalachian Basin is groundwater is recharged in the highlands and discharges into streams. Once we had the groundwater flow model set up, the next step was to couple that output with a particle tracking model. And here the notion is that we injected virtual particles at the well pads, the WPs, and followed their trajectory as they move through the groundwater flow system. So these are path lines shown in the center picture or particle tracks, and they show where and how far the contaminant might travel, an aqueous phase contaminant, um, according to groundwater flow. So we conducted this particle tracking simulation 2,000 times for each realization of the groundwater flow model, producing 2,000 hydrologically plausible trajectories for contaminant migration away from the well path. Then the next step is we use these particle tracking, particle tracks to estimate vulnerability, all right? Vulnerability was defined for each grid cell in our model domain. And it was defined as the number of uh, simulations in which a particle track intersected that grid cell to the total number of realizations. So vulnerability ranges from zero to one. Higher values of vulnerability indicate greater realization among or greater agreement among the realizations that a grill cell, grid cell falls on an effective transport path from the well pads. So here are the results of vulnerability predictions for a snapshot in time. Vulnerability, um, vulnerable areas shown 
are shown in color here. And so low areas are blue, higher are in yellow and red. And so these results show what areas might be impacted if a contaminant released from a well pad were to occur. And so if you look at these vulnerable areas, you'll see that they're elongate, they're not circular, all right? And this reflects the groundwater flow direction, all right? But if you look across the whole study area, you'll see that these vulnerability plumes are not all oriented in the same way, all right? But there's a distribution in the orientation. And this reflects the role of topography, geology, and the stream river network in creating very complex groundwater flow patterns. So our next step was to take that vulnerability approach and scale it up from a watershed scale to the entire county. All right. And we also wanted to compare our vulnerability estimates to actual measurements of drinking water quality within uh, Bradford County. And so here's a picture of Bradford County here. The areas where we went out and collected a drinking water sample are the blue bullseyes. We collected those samples um, over a summer um, and there was about 91 total. And the pink circles are the distant, the locations of the unconventional oil and gas pads. So here are some data from that groundwater sampling campaign. And these data are presented in terms of elemental ratios. So for example, the ratio of calcium concentration to strontium concentration, or the ratio of calcium concentration to magnesium. The reason that scientists in the past have looked at these elemental ratios is because they can help you distinguish non-impacted groundwater from it, water that's been influenced by inputs of produced water, briny produced water. And this produced water may, for example, be released inadvertently from shell gas pads. So if we go dig further into this, um, the red circles are measurements from gas wells or from measurement from water wells um, which our hydrologic analysis suggested were vulnerable to contamination from a well pad. The blue circles are from uh, water wells in which um, our hydrologic model suggested were not vulnerable. The gray symbols, all right, in the oil and gas produced region, those are samples collected from gas wells and oil wells. So the first thing you'll notice, you'll say, aha, but... Um, a lot of your samples, all right, that look to be vulnerable are not impacted. Well, that's not surprising because you have to remember that actual impairment in a water well depends on um, that the water well actually vulnerable or hydrologically connected to a gas pad, but also that there's an actual spill that has occurred. And spills don't occur every day on these well pads. They're actually fairly rare. Um, but if you drill down further into this, you'll see eight samples, and these are highlighted in the green, are in the shale gas produced water region, all right? And six of these eight samples were from groundwater wells that we identified as being vulnerable, all right? So this suggests a potential linkage between spills at well sites and contamination. So we were curious if we could actually find written records of spills, um, at, uh, that were proximal to areas uh, where our wells are vulnerable and were impaired by produced gas or, or produced water signatures. And five out of six of our vulnerable wells, all right, that had produced water signatures, all right, um, were actually near um, well pads where spills were recorded. And sort of public records, for example, um, for well pads near site 46, document um, releases of, of wastewater and other fluids. So we went on to sort of modify, modify our, our vulnerability approach to make it scalable. And we apply it to a very large region, 100,000 square kilometer region in um, parts of Ohio, West Virginia, and um, Pennsylvania. And this within this area, there's been about 10,000 uh, wells drilled into the Marcellus and Utica shale. All right. And there are also about 1.5 million people who rely on private water wells for drinking water. OK, our analysis suggests that 4 percent of the study area is predicted to be vulnerable to contamination from unconventional oil and gas. If you were to map that against drinking water wells, that's about 2 percent of the population. 
but the vulnerability is really unevenly distributed. Some areas, there's very little vulnerability. Some areas is concentrated. The vulnerable areas, the areas with color in the maps here, show where you might monitor, all right, if you're concerned about um, contamination from leaking or, or from contamination from well pads. So they can give us information on how to effectively, cost-effectively monitor. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, by talking about some of the utility of um, vulnerability modeling to the orphan well problem. First, we can't monitor everywhere. It's prohibitively expensive, and there are also access limitations. But the vulnerability framework can help us optimize locations for groundwater sampling to characterize contamination in a way that's cost effective. All right. It can also identify domestic wells of greatest risk for targeted monitoring and preventative action. And Sue talked about sort of within the Appalachian Basin where we've done a lot of work, there's lots of potential source of contamination. There's coal mining, there's active uh, oil and gas development, there's abandoned wells, all right? And there's also just uh, household pollution, all right? Um, vulnerability analysis can help us exclude some of those sources, all right, to um, more confidently attribute real sources. And importantly, Vulnerability analysis um, can be conducted with free public domain software, and it can be conducted by professionals that are widely employed in consulting firms, governmental, scientific, and regulatory agencies. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, to all the panelists uh, for the excellent presentations. I, I learned a lot. and. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the discussions and really welcome uh, opinion from uh, everybody, uh, particularly the states uh, on the on the usability or um, uh, implications of some of the of the various research uh, and um, work that we presented. So um, I'm going to start with a question from the chat. And uh, this is uh, this is for you, Greg. Um, but actually, it's from Tom Lopez, and he's uh, he's here. So I'm gonna let him speak up and ask the question himself. Really great present. Is this is on right? Okay. Yeah, really great presentations, Greg. On yours, I I think you kind of answered it. I asked it early, but on the spatial clustering, I was asking. If, if, yeah, I mean, you have a large enough data set at places like Cold Lake with lots of wells, like a huge data set and long duration time periods. And it was, the question was just simply that spatial clustering is quasi independent from the era of the wells. So if you have 1950s, 1970s, 2000s, you're still seeing the same spatial clustering. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. But probably even within that elevated sort of well integrity failure cluster do you still see the the time dependency like the 1970s has a localized spike or the 1980s yeah so i you know we analyzed most of the time series data every way we could and we we don't see you know essentially that larger trend of what i was showing is kind of what holds true so um you know when you dive into that hot spot it, it's not like another time series pops out um so that was one of the challenges with that study is you you know there's lots of correlated features and, and and aspects that can affect the data set. So trying to dissect it all of those ways is definitely something we considered. So uh, yeah, pretty much across the board, we were seeing higher frequencies of integrity issues of, of these like, you know, deviated well bores. In particular, it was the, the directional wells installed kind of between, I guess, 2008 and 2012 before they went full horizontal. Those were kind of the biggest category. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I've, I've got a quick one for Jim. Um, in your models there, uh, were you using like a geostatistical distribution so those permeability porosity parameters for those? Because it seems like you must not have a lot of conditioning data because the, the spread in the particle tracking was huge. Uh, I, I was just curious how much having additional sort of measurements and conditioning data might uh, narrow down the range of potential affected areas. Yeah, you're that that's a good observation. So the the spread in a way reflects 
the uncertainty. Um, and so uh, what we tried to do is, is uh, use data that were available and we did a, a pilot point calibration. And so we can account for considerable variability in a hydraulic conductivity field, but there are different solutions to that field that will give you results. If we had actually more data, all right, to characterize sort of the, the, the hydraulic conductivity field, um, that, would, that would reduce the uncertainty. But I will say that even though, you know, those plumes, they appeared, well, to me, they didn't appear very big. They, the important thing is they exclude a lot of area. Okay, and they tell you in a lot of places where you shouldn't spend your time monitoring. Okay, great. Um, so there's a uh, question from yesterday that wasn't addressed. And um, the question is, are North American insights and best practices on plugging wells transferable to other extractive industries and other continents? Um, I, can, I can start by uh, making some comments here. I, I think it's um, yes, to some extent. Um, but I think there's a lot of research and additional monitoring studies that are needed um, to really confirm how transferable um, everything is. I mean, definitely something, uh, some um, aspects are uh, transferable. Um, you know, specifically, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'll turn it over to James because um, there's a lot of, for example, the methane monitoring work that could be transferable. And a lot of the stuff he's mentioned are actually you know, not specifically for orphan wells. And so some of that monitoring could be transferable. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of uh, different plugging standards, you know, the NORSOC, the, uh, the API, um, and also the Canadian ones. Um, and so there, there's elements that could that could definitely be transferable. And, you know, uh, Sue talked about other, and, and uh, Jim, to, to some extent, talked about other extractive in industries. So I'm going to turn it over to James and Sue for to kind of uh, elaborate on this. Yeah, thanks, Mary. I mean, I think it's safe to say that there's a lot that can transfer. I think you're right. I think there's plenty in the methodologies that for, for the emissions monitoring, but I think we just have to be aware of how different some of the regulatory aspects are in different countries and how different practices have been uh, performed over the years. Um, certainly looking things over here from in the UK, it's not a problem that we're especially sort of seeing with our abandoned infrastructure. Um, I think it's a recent-ish bit of work that sort of went and looked back at some of old old wells that have been, been plugged and we're not really seeing any emissions at all on repeat visits. Uh, and over in Germany, they're seeing very little as well. Um, but then there are places like, like Romania, bits of Italy, and then there are uh, where we are seeing emissions from abandoned infrastructure. And then there's parts of the world where we've frankly got no idea um, so upscaling a lot of uh, a lot of the models would become incredibly challenging unless we we actually have some boots on the ground emissions data to base those from. Do so if you wanted to add on other extractive industries in particular, but other things as well. I was just gonna um, say that first of all, I totally agree. I think. Of course, you have to take uh, information from one site and extrapolate to another, but it isn't always going to work. Any geologist will tell you that the geology is always local, always different. Um, and just one example that I think is pertinent and interesting is that Sam Shaheen, the, my grad student who's now up at Yale with Jim, uh, he looked at sort of incidents of uh, methane uh, fugitive methane problems related to shale gas development, and he looked in the two. Uh, foci in Pennsylvania, the Southwest, which is just south of Pittsburgh, and then in the Northeast. And uh, he saw that the methane incidents were higher up in the Northeast as compared to the Southwest, where uh, there was a lot of conventional oil and gas development, some of the oldest wells in the world, um, and a lot of coal mining. And he concluded, at least as a hypothesis, that um, that probably the lower incidence in the Southwest was because so much of the intermediate depth, depth gas, natural gas had already been extracted in the Southwest. And so the problems up in the Northeast were still some of that intermediate depth gas that had never been extracted because there hadn't been a big conventional industry up there. So even if you understand the geology in different locations, you also have to understand what has happened um, in terms of legacy extraction activities as well. 
Great. Thank you. So um, they, I'll first go with this online question. This is for Jim. Um, do you believe uh, it says this H and H method um, could be scaled up easily? I'm assuming it's hydro hydrological modeling and vulnerability assessment okay. methods um, by the private and state, uh, by the state and private sector. Uh, yeah, I I do. Um, I I touched on at the end about you know the the models. We we actually extended this to do some machine learning models, but before we did that, we uh, used Modflow and in uh, ModPath to do this analysis. And those models are widely used uh, by um, hydrologists and consulting firms and in regulatory agencies, Department of Interior. Um, and so, and so it is, it is trackable. It's not just something that can be done in sort of academic ivory towers with high performance computing. Well, I, I'm going to, um, and I'll go get to you, Duane, in one second. <laughs> I, I want to give the states an opportunity to speak up here. Um, you know, how useful are some of the discussions like the, you know, methane monitoring methods that we presented and, um, you know, scalable or applicable in your states and uh, and also groundwater modeling that Jim talked about how to what, what extent are they used at all and um, so I I'd, I'd really encourage the states to speak up while Dwayne asks this question <laughs> um, you can have a few minutes to think about it but Dwayne go ahead yeah, thank you for that Mary uh, you mentioned that the emissions seem to be concentrated in recent wells and postulated it was related to deviation, which is a, a good operating theory. It is harder to get a good cement bond than a deviated well. There is a second mechanism, which I don't think we have the data to test yet, but we should be paying attention to. When we uh, fully deplete and are finished with a shale well, we've only gotten a recovery factor of on the order of 3 to 15 percent which means that over the time period that the plug is intended to last, the reservoir will almost fully recharge at the base of the wellbore, which means that the plug that we install must, over its functional life, be able to withstand not a depleted three or 400 pounds like a conventional reservoir or a um, water drive reservoir that might get back to um, hydrostatic, but something higher with more uh, gas. So can we differentiate? Do we know whether or not we need different standards for decommissioning to prevent leaks from shale wells that will repressurize over years to decades? So that's a really good question, Dwayne. And I, uh, I, I guess I should clarify just some of our data, right? So, um, you know, when we're looking at these unconventional wells, it's not necessarily an emission, right? So some of these wells are building sustained casing pressure that's trapped at the wellhead. So that's what we're looking at there. And these were all active wells. So we really don't have any data like this, what I'm showing on plugged wells, right? So all of those numbers are coming from wells in active operation, you know, gathered by operators. So I, I think those are fantastic questions, but I don't think the data that we've collected can answer them. Um, certainly, you know, we talked a lot about mon long-term monitoring of plug wells, things like that yesterday. You would need data sets like that to to answer those types of questions. I think the argument that you get uh, significant active uh, migration for producing wells is stronger yeah than have you know if, if you get those you're going to get them for abandoned wells you know uh, kind of argument uh you because we don't go back and repair uh cement bonds and and the migration pathways and you're going to have uh you know nobody's planning to plug fifteen thousand foot horizontal wells with lots of cement out into the lateral right i mean there's nobody there's no state that's going to go require that so that's all going to be open and if there is pathways right now that yeah get assuming this that the surface casing flows are actually uh from deep reservoirs right which i can't imagine they're from any uh, that's the only test we've ever done in sort of i know the the loving county stuff is like that um so i, I think the argument is strong that uh, if you have that problem in producing wells, you will have that problem in produce and plugging wells. And we got to find some alter, some way to repair that and do that sort of 
plug in because we we drill those wells so quickly now yeah. and have so few DV tools and other things like that. We're going to we're setting ourselves up for some problems. Yeah, that, I mean that's an excellent point, Nathan. And I, I guess what I would add is, you know, some of the states that are doing this integrity monitoring are requiring operators to repair, uh, you know, do squeeze jobs or do other methods to repair those annular problems. Uh, but you'll notice that I only showed three states with these types of integrity monitoring programs. Not saying that that people aren't doing inspections for integrity. I know that there's other avenues for doing that. Uh, but yeah, it is critically important to know which wells have these problems and that they are remediated prior to abandonment. Um, I think the Canadian regulations are pretty clear about that. They set thresholds for serious problems and non-serious problems and when you need to remediate those through the lifetime. But um, yeah, that's not necessarily clear in, in all of the jurisdictions in the U.S. Yeah, so I, I would like to invite the state <laughs> uh, if you want to make any comments. So, oh, yeah. Thanks, Mike. I, <laughs> to, <feel> obligated. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twice <laughs> now. Better speak up. Uh, a couple of the issues that I see that um, aren't being addressed uh, directly uh, is that there's a lot more to these systems than the well. We get reports all the time of gas coming up in the middle of a field someplace that is connected to uh, a leak in a flow line. And it's it can be a mile from the well. It can be a mile from the tank battery. You can have a wellhead and a flow line that are all completely sound, perfect integrity, and it gets to the tank battery and they're discharging it. So um, does that count as a leak? If it's intentional, you know, they've got all the valves shut, um, but the leak is happening elsewhere. So uh, that's one of the issues. The other is uh, these wells surge. These wells do not flow uniformly. Uh, we're talking about Mother Nature here, and she can be a wicked witch. <laughs> and... <laughs> mother nature <laughs> um <laughs> the pressure can build up on a uh polished rod packing uh to a point where it will eventually overcome the elastic strength of that packing and push it open and start leaking at that packing and leak for an hour and then that pressure in that tubing is reduced the packing can seal back up and you can come out there and measure it and get zero and we document our zeros all the time we love those zeros and we want third-party verification i deeply appreciate the zeros <laughs> yes <laughs> but they're not necessarily accurate we have had wells that went on emergency pluggings where we had uh two of our very most reliable inspectors go out and look at the same well their intent was to meet there and look together one guy entered his uh, gps with the wrong api number and he got there a couple hours later first guy found no leaking the second guy found a huge leak an unmistakable leak there's no doubt that it wasn't leaking when the first guy was there so um the discussion about how long should we monitor uh, when we're testing these wells is a very difficult one. Like so many of the other questions we've had here about um, credits and monitoring and measuring and quantification, there's a lot to it. Thank um, you. Um, I don't know if you, we, we, I don't know if we want to respond to that at all, but maybe Steph or, or, or both of you guys want to say something. I can just say you brought up a lot of great points, Mike, and, and certainly the uh, the first part uh, about the many facilities on the well pad, that's something we have been trying to expand what we're doing with these types of models to not just focus on well integrity to consider the whole well pad, but um, these types of, I guess, emissions inventory from all of the infrastructure are starting to exist, uh, but certainly are, you know, my plot of where those data exist, they'd be even more recent than our well integrity data. So yeah, those are all really great points. Yeah, thank you so much for raising those points as well. I'm thinking a lot about, you know, where we need to go and the growth associated with the mission state. I was thinking from the lens of Subpart W, which of course is is not necessarily capturing the wells that we've been discussing today, but improving accuracy there and maybe what we could see in the future as well. Um, for Oregon Wells too. 
Great, thank you. Um, and and that question was recently from Mike Key from Colorado. And, and uh, can you uh, please announce your name before you ask a question? Thank you. I should have said that earlier. So. Um, I'm Brian McClellan from the Alaska Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Um, I'm I guess I'm interested in evaluating the effectiveness of our plugging program. And I'm looking, I saw some interesting ideas on, you know, gas monitoring and water quality monitoring from James and Sue and some of the stuff from Greg on well integrity. But if you um, had a kind of a simple and low cost way to screen your wells that have been plugged and abandoned, um, you know, just to go out and have a quick, you know, something that's easy and practical to go evaluate the effectiveness of your wells in general, you know, taking a subset of wells in different regions of your state and just doing something relatively simple. Uh, and I'm interested to hear what you might recommend, you know, if you had an idea for a simple program like that. This is a, it's a very good question and it's not, a, there's no easy answer. Um, I think there are tools that are being developed at DOE and elsewhere. Um, I, I will say we are working, We every time we've gone on the field and did these tedious <laughs> chamber-based measurements, like for each component, <laughs> uh, we've been doing this, but we've also done a lot of screening. And so we're analyzing that data right now to see how useful that screening information is given that we've done simultaneous measurements of emission rates. So. Uh, this is something that we are analyzing, um, but also uh, lots of folks at DOE are developing useful tools. Yeah, I, I can add. So under the catalog project uh, at DOE, we are working on kind of a, I think they've termed it the FAST method. Uh, it's a it's a low cost way to, to measure emissions kind of, uh, I believe there's a, a fan involved and then kind of just concentration measurements, right? Um, I'm not personally involved with that, so I could put you in contact with the right people who could tell you more details. Uh, but I, you know, the, the part of your question that uh, really interests me is if you're looking to, to to verify already plugged wells, if the the wellheads say been cut off below surface, I'm not sure how well those methods would apply. A lot of times we're looking at you know emission sources that are uh, from from the wellhead or from an open hole. So certainly it gets more complex when you have the wellhead cut off below surface. And it, yeah, it's. I guess um, what was interesting to me on potentially um, some of the stuff James was talking about with a, maybe a drone or some other thing that could just, if you can identify methane emissions, if you know it's cut off in the area, you don't in it, but it, it's not, there's not like a point source that you can identify and put a gas monitor on, but could you identify it with some kind of. Um, remote sensing technique that would be so uh, so I'll 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 jump in there and um and I'm gonna let James speak to it in a second but I will say for plugged wells and also in general sometimes you don't see any methane emissions at the ground surface right and there's a really good study by Scout and all um based on in, in Netherlands and but there's a lot of evidence for this so you don't see any methane emissions at the ground surface and we measure this too and you dig you can just dig by your, I've dug like just, you know, a couple centimeters, even like 30 centimeters and you see methane, right? So, mm -hmm. so we have to be careful if we're just, I mean, if we're only concerned about methane emissions to the atmosphere, then that's fine. But if we're also concerned, concerned about subsurface impacts, um, so that, that this becomes a little bit gray, but with that, <laughs> sorry, James, I'll let you uh, chime in here. Yeah, hi. It's, it's a lovely question because I think this is something that's going to come up over and over again as time goes on. Um, the technology on the TDLS uh, laser systems uh, that we have at the moment is is quite, uh, poor is not the right word, but it's th there's a lot of challenges using it for quantification. But as a screening method for really potent leaks, I think it's got a lot of, a lot of potential um, and you can potentially use it quite quickly on a on a hybrid drone, you can cover quite a large area relatively quickly. Um, if you're bothered about only seeing the medium to large leaks, then I think that's a, you know, it's a potentially good viable screening method. Um, aside from that, I'd probably be going along with something like Greg's been mentioning. Um, I'd probably want to do it with a, a more high precision instrument than I think the recommendations are at the moment, where you could do a, a you'd have a, a PPB level 
instrument on a backpack and you would go out there with a with a sniffer wand and walk downwind uh, across several transects and see if anything's picked up um that would be probably be my sort of preferred ground method for screening um but yeah i think somewhere somewhere in between the two we might you know hopefully there'll be some technology developments on the td lasses in the near future as people want to use them a bit more mary if i could say something yeah too. yes please so you know, when I was making my slides of all the different things you could analyze in water, I was very aware of how expensive it is getting the samples, analyzing them, all the different things you can analyze for. And I really, you know, screening tools, we've, we've seen just like the gentleman, I think it was from Colorado where, you know, we've seen methane coming out in one, one place. And then we've noticed that it's coming out along a, a fracture over into the next farm. And we've just, you know, detected it with, screening backpack methane detectors walking around and you can make a map of you know and then get kind of a rudimentary estimate of emissions i guess i my point is that some of these screening tools are actually decent and i'd rather be spending the country's money on plugging the wells um, and not you know thousands of dollars of monitoring into the future of all the different uh, water analytes I, I i think you know some simple screening for methane might be really useful uh, Jim, I didn't, I, I wasn't sure if you wanted to add to that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. And um, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, this is Mike Hickey from Colorado again. And I just wanted to mention that with the changes that Colorado's gone through recently, a lot of our uh, counties are doing some of their own testing. And one of them in particular is uh, the city and county of Broomfield. Uh, they have a limited number of uh, orphan wells, uh, plugged wells within their jurisdiction, but they have hired on their own a third-party consultant to go out and do soil gas sampling. So the methane that is too low a volume for you to pick up uh, in the atmosphere with the uh, OGI cameras, et cetera, can be picked up in uh, very, very small quantities but very high concentrations in the soil above those wells. That methane works its way up, and you can actually see them on Google Earth. That methane displaces the oxygen in those pores and causes the plants to die. And you can see these big round circles of um, no vegetation after years and years as you go back in time on Google Earth. You can see these things have been durable over the side of a well, and uh, you can map the two together. And uh, the city and county of Broomfield did find a well in a neighborhood uh, where the soil gas concentrations were up at 90, 100% and the pores in the soil. And we went in and uh, that wellhead that was leaking uh, was actually 18 feet below the pavement of a residential street. So that was a real fun one to get down onto. It had a live fire hydrant on it. It had neighbors in the neighborhood. My plugging rigs, outriggers sat on a residential sidewalk. So I have bought pavement and sidewalk to fix some of those things. And it's a soil gas sampling that's pretty easy technology. There is a cost to it. The county was picking up the bill, so I don't know exactly how expensive it was. But in that case, it was completely effective. I think I thank you for that. I don't know if anybody wants to comment. If not, I'm going to turn it to Jim. And you know, you talked about moss low and moss hat that's, you know, the modeling and the saturated zone. I mean, the soil gas sampling is the unsaturated component. And there are saturated, unsaturated couple models. Those are much trickier to use, but could be really valuable. So maybe you want to maybe can I ask you to comment on that a bit? I'll give it a shot. Um, yeah, so you're you're right. So those are multi-phase flow models. Um, would be really critical if you're interested in in uh, um, uh, methane in both the dissolved and gaseous states. Uh, it's there will be much more difficult to scale. Those models could be used on smaller scale areas, perhaps where you have identified a few wells. Um, they're also parametrically more hungry um, in that they require greater characterization um, 
than than sort of you know just single phase flow. So it it's it's conceivable, um, and and I think that they would be a, a good guide into helping you where uh, um, figure out where to look. But at the end of the day, you'd want to verify that with some measurements. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Don's been waiting, so well, Don, Danny, and then there's a question um, online from Eric uh, Van Oort. So, um, and I think we'll end with those questions. So, Don. Okay. Hi, Don Hegberg, Pennsylvania DEP. I just wanted to give a couple comments on this section. I, I uh, thought Jim's uh, concept of uh, uh, you know solute modeling, vul vulnerability prediction for, uh, from water supplies is a good idea as we do our prioritization to try and pick which wells we plug. We have a lot to choose from. I think that's uh, that's, that's a good approach, something I'm going to think about. I've uh, uh, And as, as that would evolve to do we sample the do sampling? Uh, someone who's managed water supply stray gas divisions uh, and looked at thousands of samples. Uh, our, our unconventional industry regulations are pretty robust and they require pre-drill sampling of water supplies within a certain radius before they drill. Uh, we, we've done a lot of sampling. We've looked at a lot of samples. And uh, I guess you want, I want to caution that when you do sample somebody's water supply, it's probably going to exceed some standard because... Uh, Water supplies are inherently not maintained. Uh, the integrity of that well itself is subject to surface contamination. And uh, we spend a lot of time trying to explain uh, why it wasn't caused by oil and gas. And a lot of times uh, it's assumed that it is as soon as you give them bad news. So just, just a caution when you do sample water supplies, you're going to have a lot of talking to do with that homeowner who doesn't know anything about water quality. Uh, uh, some sampling. You could even do basic geochemistry analysis. Even conductivity is a good clue. If you're looking at keeping costs down, you know, chloride's the best tracer we have for a bronze bill. Typically, uh, crude oil, not a lot of volatile organics, at least in Pennsylvania. You're not going to find much. Uh, you could sample, uh, you know, VOCs, SVOCs all day long, and you might find occasionally. Uh, typically, uh, the brine spills will be the tracer. Uh, we've done brine uh, service e e EM surveys just to look for uh, high conductivity zones. That's another thing that you could consider around a uh, a well site before you look at spending big big dollars. But just if you see high conductivity subsurface areas, that can be a clue. And interesting, Greg and and uh, and what Susan mentioned, we do see problems up in the Northeast. Uh, that is an area that uh, where. Uh, Unconventional operators, even uh, cementing new wells, they get uh, uh, casing cementing problems where they get channeling and they have well integrity issues that are seem to be due to those shallow Devonian uh, formations that just weren't traditionally produced. And uh, they don't even see a gas show drilling the well, but suddenly it's showing up in their annular gas. And it is a problem in that area. Great. Thank you so much for your perspective. Um, I'm going to let uh, Danny provide the perspective from Texas before. Yeah, I felt like I should Thank say you. something for Texas. Um, yes. Last count, we had uh, 8,674 orphan wells. And those orphan wells, you know, we check. We have 10 districts throughout Texas. Those 10 districts all have a minimum of two FLIR cameras. So those those wells are checked regularly to see if there's leaks. And if you remember yesterday when I was talking about priority, priority one is if a well's leaking, it's, it's plugged. Um, the other thing that as far as contamination, um, the 180 inspectors we have in oil and gas all carry salinity meters. So they're capable. They they have the ability to check immediately to see if there's any pollution in any creeks or anything nearby. Um, which is checked normally during inspections. Um, it's, it's pretty much routine for the state of Texas. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we're, we are kind of short on time, but I do wanted to ask if the panelists wanted to respond to uh, some of the state comments or add anything. I would just say one thing, and that is that... Um, Groundwater data is very hard to get for the entire country. And um, there are 
three states that I know of with oil and gas where you can get quite a bit of groundwater data, Pennsylvania, Colorado, and Texas. And we really need more of that groundwater data put online. And I really want to salute my home state of Pennsylvania because <laughs> well, that, that's a good place to a place to freeze. Um, well, we have. Uh, sorry, I Eric, uh, Eric, if you wanted to quickly ask your question, Figure out what's going on? Oh, oh, you're you're back. Uh, we heard that you wanted to salute Pennsylvania. Oh, just to, <laughs> that. There's so much data online. Violation data is online. Groundwater chemistry now is getting online. A lot of the integrity data is on. Line. That is the way that the public can be safeguarded and we can get the most number of people looking at these data sets and trying to figure out what's going on and how to make things better. Great, thank you. Um, do you wanna ask your, the, the final question, and sorry, I'm holding you uh, for lunch, but I think these discussions have been really helpful, please. Uh, Eric Van with uh, UT. I had a question for, for Greg. I told you yesterday that I'm a big fan of the work. I think it's, uh, it holds great potential both to uh, prioritize wells for permanent abandonment as well as find wells that have good integrity that we could potentially reuse and reprioritize. And I think that's really important to operators who have this massive asset retirement obligation, right, and could potentially find wells that they could uh, repurpose. Uh, so I'd like to work with you to see if we can entice some operators to share some data sets. But you also indicated that uh, there is something that the model cannot do yet, right, which is really make forward projections and and talk about the, the quantity of the leakage or right? how severe the leakage is. And I, I wondered if you were aware of the work that's being done at Harriet Watt in England on kind of probabilistic modeling, which is still relatively simple, right? But the probabilistic modeling actually allows you to project into the future and, and tell you which wells are likely to gonna leak and to what severity, right? And if you saw opportunity to kind of connect that, with the work that you are doing to get a, a tool that can actually predict and forecast into the future. So I'm pretty sure Harry Watt's not in England. <laughs> Scott. What? <laughs> so, Eric, is that is that the work that Dr. Cahill's uh, part of, Aaron Cahill, or I guess I I've seen yeah, a, a lot Cahill of the work. Johnson, yeah, yeah, I've seen a lot of the work that Aaron's done in the past. I guess I. Uh, I'm not up to speed on exactly where they're at with the probabilistic modeling. I, I think that there's good potential for that for sure. Uh, we we certainly, um, at least in some of our carbon storage work, uh, have tried to use some of these data to help us build uh, probabilistic models of wellbore leakage. So I'd be absolutely interested in working with them on that. And and the points you make about repurposing are, are definitely uh, really interesting and uh, spot on. I know there's a lot of people interested in repurposing wells uh, for lots of different uh, lots of different applications, um, geothermal, uh, carbon storage, things like that. So yeah, I definitely interested in working with you on it for sure. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we're a little bit over time, and I don't want to keep people uh, from lunch. So uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, yeah, enjoy lunch. <laughs> so um okay so well welcome back to the um to the welcome back um so now we have session five on reclamation and restoration i should have some slides here soon um but we have really great panelists today um, I'm not going to go over all their bios because it's written, uh, but uh, I'll just, uh, there's Mike Kiki from Colorado. I, oh, I guess you've heard him speak a few times and we've had the pleasure of hearing his, uh, uh, about Colorado and we look forward to hearing more. We have Brent from Red Willow uh, Company um, and we have Ron Krofchik. Yes. <laughs> uh, I practiced that. <laughs> And, and we have Forrest Smith from the National Park Service. Um, I think it's happening. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So uh, this is the wrong session. So there was a session five called Restoration and Reclamation. It's a separate PowerPoint that I sent this morning.
Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> uh, my dancing skills are not great. <laughs> uh, well, should I sing? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so restoration and reclamation, uh, I, you know, a um, couple things there. These terms are kind of used interchangeably. Uh, so um, and we are going to use them kind of interchangeably here. But if anybody has other definitions to really separate those out, we'd love to hear them. So this is the stuff that comes after plugging. We've talked a lot about plugging. But this is the stuff that comes after. There is something kind of in the middle there, um, remediation, that's sometimes included in that plugging part. Sometimes it's not. So some of our panelists will be talking a little bit about uh, remediation as well, which is a big, huge topic uh, uh, that uh, we could probably spend two days or more just talking about. But um, we're only we're only going to touch upon that here. Yes. Okay. So reclamation and restoration is the title of this session. But again, we're going to sprinkle in some remediation. And so feel free to... Um, add comments or ask questions about remediation in the panel. Uh, so I'm gonna just provide some introduction and framing. Um, so Forrest is gonna talk about um, park service uh, or orphan well projects. Uh, Ron's gonna talk about uh, various orphan well and reclamation remediation issues um, in, in a variety of states. Um, uh, and he, uh, Mike is gonna talk about um, uh, lots of stories from Colorado and case studies and issues. And Brent's going to uh, talk. Actually, he, uh, so if people don't know, Red uh, Willow Production Company is owned by the Southern Utes tribe. And so he'll provide that tribal perspective, I think, which is a really uh, interesting perspective. And then we'll end with uh, some discussion and uh, q and um, I, I, you know, I tried to pull some definitions for restoration and reclamation. So I have one from the BLM. And then there's also one from this uh, paper, you know, uh, reclamation helps to ensure that any effects of oil and gas development on the land and on other resources and uses are not permanent. So there's lots of things included in here, like natural vegetation, hydrology, wildlife habitats. And, and in most cases, the idea is to go back to pre-development conditions or before the land was disturbed. Um, another kind of uh, nuanced addition to that is uh, the Society of Ecological Restoration says it's not just about restoring reclamation, but assisting that recovery. Um, and then environmental remediation is really kind of separate from that. And that's about cleanup of um, hazardous substances. And that can be from soil, groundwater, and sediment. So this is a paper, a summary paper from in 2000 um, by Bradshaw. And I think the only thing, so this is primary succession. So this is what nature will do on its own without us assisting. <laughs> and so these, the primary su succession takes a really, really long time. So I, I just, I'm going to start with the second numbers. So it says one to a hundred, one to a 50. Those are number of years. Some things can go 50, okay, some are as quick as 10 years, surface stabil uh, stabilization, but some go on to thousands and ten thousands of years. Some of the, but at the same time, those same processes can be achieved within a year. There's huge, huge variability in primary su succession, but in general, it can take a long time. So that's where, you know, assisting that may be valuable, and it really depends on, uh, how you want to restore and reclaim your land, um, and it and and really matters what you're starting, what what you're trying to do. Are you are you in forested areas? Are you in agricultural areas? Are you in a developed area? And all of these things matter. So this is just a uh, this is a study that we did. Um, this is the same study that we talked about many times. So Adam presented on it. I've presented some slides on it. It's the same study. So this is buried in the supplementary information, but um, it's there. We did an analysis be, be using the USGS land cover, and we kind of aggregated some of the land co cover classifications. And so the red dots are the documented orphan wells. This is the first set around 80,000, but you can see the distribution is largely the same. But the top two land cover um, are forests and agriculture. There are more in the forested areas. 
quite a significant number in developed areas as well. So these are, you know, these things really matter when you're thinking about restoration and reclamation. Um, I know the panelists are going to talk about costs. Sometimes restoring reclama uh, restoration and reclamation can be expensive. <laughs> Um, but there are a lot of benefits. So there was one study that uh, did uh, that looked at um, oil and gas infrastructure lands over 50 years across the United States. And they said the benefits uh, from agriculture and carbon sequestration are $21.3 billion. But to restore that same land, around $7 billion. So you get kind of a three times the number, the benefits are about three times that. The time scale is a bit different because... <laughs> The, you know, to fix it up, you, you're spending seven billion now, but that's you know, twenty two bill, twenty one billion is over fifty years. But I mean, there are there can be substantial variation. Uh, there's also substantial variation depending on where you are in the country as well. Okay, with that, this is just my last slide. I mean, there's a lot of different issues. You know, we want some questions we want to ask. How do remediation and restoration options vary among sites because they do vary substantially? What are key metrics? Um, vegetation, is it vegetation? Is it wildlife? Fragmentation, I think the pictures on the left are a really good example of how land can be fragmented and that could have some ecosystem impacts. Uh, ecosystem services, um, and what are long-term maintenance and monitoring efforts? Uh, what, are, what, are, what are needed? Uh, we've been talking a lot about monitoring here, so um, that's something to consider. And what are the data gaps and how can new technologies be used to address them? Um, with that, I mean, the one thing that's, in, you know, I, we're going to see a lot of pictures, but at the very bottom, that is a restored site that was pre-restoration and post-restoration. <clears throat> but if you just look at the aerial image, you can still see, see the impacts. Um, and it, 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 you know, depending on where you are, it can take a long time. So, um, but, you know, there's a positive side to it. There are a lot of benefits. Uh, to the general public and ecosystem. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, uh, which is, is Forrest Smith from the uh, National Park Service. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Forrest Smith. I'm with the uh, National Park Service. I've been with the National Park Service for about five years now. Before that, I worked in private oil and gas. I started out with Halliburton doing all sorts of wireline, worked for them for a number of years. I've worked uh, for Newfield Exploration as a production operations engineer. I've worked for a number of mom and pop um, companies before eventually coming into the national parks. Um, okay, so my discussion today is going to be partly reclamation, but I, I, I want to highlight the issues that we have at the national parks in that we have to cover everything from deserts to rainforests to deep sandstones, unconventionals. We we have it all in the national parks. And I know what you're thinking. The national parks have oil wells. I was surprised too. I didn't, I did not know this. Um, when I actually came into uh, my job five years ago, we thought we had about 530 oil and gas wells in the parks. My first job or my first assignment for myself was to find out if that was an accurate number. I came back a month later after looking through hard data, hard copies, uh, state databases, and we have closer to about 2,600 wells in the parks. Um, that number got lost, I think, over years of um, moving from paper copies to digital, um, also having retirement, uh, people leaving the office. You just didn't keep up with that kind of stuff. Um. With that being said, with the uh, BIL money that we've received, we were able to uh, hire on three additional petroleum engineers that are basically just field inspectors. And they have gone out to um, about 112, or uh, sorry, 1,200 different oil and gas sites so far. Um, they have the probably the worst job in the national parks is they just get to go out to the parks and just hike in the back country, and look for these wells. It's really terrible. Like, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. <laughs> um, we we have uh, oil and gas wells in at least fifty five different park units. Um, we're we're finding more uh, pretty much every day. We'll have um, sometimes we'll have hikers 
come in from the back country and be like, you know, there's a pipe sticking out of the ground, you know, just over here. I took the lat longs. Can you go look at it? Um, that's how we found a couple in Zion national park, actually. Um, to date we've so far, we've found 45 orphaned wells. Um, about a hundred of the wells so far that we found are actively leaking methane. That includes most of the orphan wells that we've found, but also a lot of wells that uh, have been either long-term shut in or have been plugged and abandoned in the past. Um, so we, we are finding wells that were plugged 30, 40 years ago that are now actively leaking again. So that's a, uh, it's an issue that we're starting to see more and more of. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of our projects of, uh, from what we've done across the country so far. So in Cuyahoga Valley, um, this is the FF Hunt well. Uh, it was located at the base of a ski hill within the park. Um, the, Cuyahoga Valley is one of our um, considered urban parks because it's it's mashed right in between Cleveland and Akron, Ohio. So you have a lot of people living within the park, outside of the park. It, there's a lot of activity. And it's also one of our largest oil and gas parks. There's over... Uh, Last count I remember is 150 to 160 oil wells within that park. Uh, with the FF hunt, this well had been orphaned for at least three decades that we know of. The topsoil was a little uh, fouled from hydrocarbon spills over the years. So with reclamation for that site, um, it involved first uh, coming in and clearing out the, uh, the old well pad. We had to cut down quite a number of trees. Uh, we pulled those to the side. We got in and we plugged the well with no issues. Uh, but then we scraped off some of that uh, that contaminated soil and kind of did a mix and till to kind of bring up a little bit of the lower soil and mix everything together. Uh, once we were done with that, we recontoured the site, brought those felled trees back in over to the location, and then we reseeded and remulched the site. Um, some of our bigger parks actually have their own vegetation departments. And that's what we ended up doing was having the park itself uh, go in and reseed and remulch because they know what's best for uh, their parks individually. So that's what we did with uh, that well. There was also another well in Cuyahoga Valley called the EC Bender. This well was partially plugged and orphaned almost 80 years ago. It was, uh, it was, all but forgotten about on the state records, it was considered plugged. Um, when we went out there, we were actually finding that it there was no surface casing. There was it was completely open. When we actually got onto the well, we got down about I think four or five hundred feet and ran into a brush plug. So it was a very large chunk of wood that somebody had shoved down there years ago. Um, it took us about two. Actually, I say us. Uh, if Steve's here from uh, plants, he he actually plugged this well for us. Um, it took him about two days to mill through that, that brush plug, just pulling up wood chips day after day. Once we finally got through that, we, uh, we went down hole another 1,000 feet, about 500 feet from TD, and we ran into collapsed casing. So at that point, we decided to plug at that, at that depth, came up hole, plugged with the uh, fresh water zones and the surface casing, and uh, clean that site up. And we did basically the same thing as we did with the FF hunt. We uh, clear cut the site, reseeded, brought back in the uh, the vegetation. And yeah, one, one interesting thing about the parks is each park has its own individual um, establishing documentation. And the parks have different goals. With Cuyahoga Valley, it's not they don't want to represent the park as it was before settlement began. They want to represent the park as it looked in 1850. So you have these giant fields that run through the parks and you're like, Oh, there's, they're still farming in these parks. It's not the case. What they're actually doing is they're just mowing grass fields to make it look like it was actually being farmed. It's uh, and each park is completely different that way. So some, you know, want it to be back to pristine. Some of it want it to be this way. And it, it's a challenge for us just to make sure that uh, we're, we're doing it up to what the park is intending. Um, in Golly River National Recreation Area uh, in West Virginia, we had the Mauer Lumber Well. Um, this site had been orphaned for several decades. Uh, it was actively leaking a lot of methane um, 
from two different locations, from the wellhead itself and from a flow line, which was entirely bizarre. We, we didn't realize what was going on until we actually got on the site. Um, when we got on, we plugged the well and we found out that the flow line was actually still connected to active wells farther down the mountain. So we, we ended up having to plug that uh, flow line and then let the active operators know that, hey, you're losing gas. Um, once that site was plugged, we went in and reclaimed the site. We recontoured the old mountain roads that came up to the site. We cleared the trees, put down vegetation and mulch, and uh, started to replant that. I wish I had better uh, after pictures, but these have been so recent that we don't really have any vegetation growing yet. So just in a couple of years, I'll show you some more pictures. Uh, in Big Thicket National Preserve in uh, southeast Texas, we had the Arco Rafferty 1 and 2. The Arco Rafferty was a well site. The Arco Rafferty number 2 was a common tank battery that went to several different wells. The rest of them were already plugged. Um, we ended up having the Texas Road Commission orphan the Arco Rafferty number 1 um, due to negligence by the operator. Um and we did have the national, or we did have Texas Road come in and, and plug this well for us and reclaim this site. This site was heavily contaminated with with heavy metals, uh, mostly chromium, barium, and some lead. Were the specific heavy metals that we found were really high in the soil. Uh, our our reclamation plan or re remediation plan for this was that we came in and scraped off the top six inches of soil. Uh, we brought in some native soil from outside the park, but near the area. Uh, then we did a mix and till, tilled everything together and did more soil samples after that. And it, it did, it, it, it brought the levels down below where they needed to be. Um, Big Thicket is kind of interesting because we've done soil samples across this park, uh, top to bottom, and chromium and barium actually are relatively high across the park. We don't know where that came from, but Big Thicket National Preserve has been clear cut several times in the past um, before it became a national park. So it could have been from industry from that. It could be just naturally occurring. We don't really know. But this site was higher than normal, so it needed to be remediated. <clears throat> so I'm going to go into a couple of couple of sites that we haven't been to yet, but we're, we're thinking about um, uh, re reclamating. And it's just kind of showing you the the breadth of what we have to deal with. So this is in Guadalupe Mountains National Park on the opposite end of Texas from Big Thicket. This is the pure oil well number one, which was drilled in the 20s and then deepened in the 40s to 14,000 feet. Um, they'd found just traces of hydrocarbons. There wasn't really anything economic. So the oil company just walked away from it, just, just left it. They gave it to some local uh, uh, farmers for a water well. So what the farmers did is they filled in the well uh, from 14,000 feet up till about 1,500 feet with just sediment and mud. Uh, they were able to produce some water for their cattle off of this for about 20 years. And then in the 1970s, a big wind, windstorm came in and knocked out the electrical lines to the, the site and the farmers just walked away from it because it just wasn't, it wasn't worth dealing with. So what we have left on this site is um, we have the original pump jack. We have a Derrick frame, a frame that has fallen over into the side of the, the uh, well site. We have an old tractor that was used as the primary mover. There's a couple of tanks up there and the site is littered with debris, junk and garbage, um, all kinds of stuff. And it, it's really a hazard to both the visitors that very rarely come up there, but also the wildlife in the area. Um, there's a lot of snagging issues. There's a couple of uh, deep cellars near the wellhead. So our plan is to get up there and uh, reclamate that site to the point where we can uh, get rid of some of the piles that are a little bit more dangerous. In the national parks, the thing is that after 50 years, items in the national parks become antiquities. So now we have to deal with these. Uh, these are basically historical structures now. And so we have to preserve them in some way. We can't just get rid of them. Um, so we have to find a, a good way to stabilize these things. And that's what we're currently working on. Um, the site is, has like the most extreme access issues we've had so far. The, the well site was uh, dug into the side of uh, El Capitan, if you guys are familiar with Guadalupe Mountains. It's pure limestone. They dug out the side of the mountain. Uh, they brought mule trains up there. That was the only way they could get everything in was mule trains. Um, and we're looking to have to do the same thing. 
it, it, but we're probably gonna do mule tra trains, helicopters and hiking in, which is like a six mile hike about, it takes about 10 hours to hike in there sometimes. So it's, it's really rugged. Um, our next, uh, park is channel islands off of, uh, this is off of Santa Barbara, Los Angeles area. Uh, the Garini well was drilled in 1965. Um, this well was also, uh, an exploration well that didn't pan out and was given to the local ranchers as a water well. And so it was partially plugged, not completely. Uh, they were on this well for some sort of a work over in the 1970s and the rig fell into the cellar and they just left it. They just left the rig there with the, the mast hanging up and they walked away. We, we got to the site just after it became an antiquity. So we have to figure out what we're going to do with that, uh, that cable tooling drilling rig and the doghouse that goes with it. The biggest issue we have for this site is that it's archaeologically very sensitive because there are native burial sites both in and around this site and the access roads. So it, it's causing us um, to be very cautious. We're working with our local, with local tribes, with everybody to make sure everything is going smoothly. Um, let's see, what's the next one? Yeah. Uh, we have Jean Lafitte down just south of New Orleans. Uh, this is the Bartaria Swamp area. Uh, we have a ton of wells that were plugged in the past. We're not sure if they're still um, if they're still plugged. So we're going through and we're we're pulling these wellheads out because they are a uh, an impediment to boat traffic in the area, and we don't want somebody to run into these wellheads, which it has happened in the past, and have spills or you know make one of these wells open back up. The 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 wellheads are not historical. The pier the pier structures might be, but you know. We're working on that. Uh, we also have Big South Fork uh, National Recreation Area in Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, we have funding for six orphaned wells to be plugged in the park. They're all actively leaking methane. And in FY25, we are submitting funding for another six that are all actively leaking methane. And the thing with uh, Big South Fork is it's an older park um, with a lot of older wells. There are, you know, open open casings everywhere. There, there are some wells that aren't even cased. Um, the pictures that you're seeing there are just some interesting things we found. The bottom picture in the middle is actually where uh, a bear was chewing on the polyline of this well. So we, we have to deal not only with visitors and weather, we have to deal with wildlife as well. Um, another thing to, to talk about this big South Fork uh, park is um, all of the wells that we have funding for to fix were all plugged and abandoned previously within the last uh, either 50 to 20 years, and they're all actively leaking again. So that's something that we're going to have to uh, address when we go back to plug these. We're going to have to re-enter them, and it's very expensive. Um, so it's something we're going to have to watch for. Um, in addition, uh, this is just kind of going over our inventory and inspection program that we've gotten. Um, we're about halfway through our inspection process. We have another uh, 1,200 to 1,400 wells to inspect. They they range from Alaska down to the Everglades. They range from uh, Cuyahoga Valley down to Petrified Forest. And any almost any park you can think of probably has at least one oil and gas well. Um, this picture on the left, this little fuzzy well, this is actually in the middle of the Olympic National Park Ho Rainforest, where they drilled a bunch of wells and abandoned them in the 19 teens. The center photo is from uh, Chaco Culture, which is in the middle of New Mexico, a very rural area, a very archaeologically sensitive place. And then the last photo is the picture of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse out in North Carolina. And I, I took that picture. I'm standing on top of the deepest oil well ever drilled on the East Coast that they drilled in 1945 to about 14,000 feet and then uh, plugged and abandoned and I, I know I'm I'm going over my time, but the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was uh, in danger of being eroded due to coastal erosion. So in the 1990s, they decided to move this lighthouse inshore, and they found a nice, sturdy, flat area that nobody remembered what it was for, and they moved that lighthouse back onto that onto that. Uh, apparently, what it was is was a well site, and they missed putting that lighthouse on top of that well by 30 feet. So I, if they'd put that on top of there, that would have been one heck of a, a way to plug a well, obviously. <laughs> but uh, um, 
And that that is that is my time. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we have Ron. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to be here and speak today. Um, I'm Ron Krovchik, the senior project engineer uh, with Parsons on our orphan well remediation team. Uh, for 18 years now, I've been doing um, a lot of legacy and most recently orphan well work. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of the differentiation between those two terms, but a little bit about us. Uh, we've been in business for 80 years. Um, we're a large engineering consulting company. Uh, we do uh, obviously environmental um, oil and gas work, but we also do defense, um, cybersecurity, um, infrastructure, things like that. Um, you can see some of our clients there that we do um, uh, private and public sectors that we have uh, we do oil and gas work for. Um, I'm primarily in uh, Michigan based on our mid-Michigan project where we have um, cleaned up over a thousand um, legacy oil field sites uh, across four counties um, in Michigan. Uh, we also have done over 800 uh, methane well studies up in Canada, um, subsurface and, and surface casing vent flow studies. Um, and then we also uh, managed pre-IHA funds, managed uh, New York State's orphan well program uh, and plugged over 80 wells for the uh, high risk wells for the, that program. Um, just a little bit about what our, our orphan legacy well does. We basically can do soup to nuts, every aspect of, of orphan legacy well problems from locating them, researching them, um, desktop risk analysis, um, down to environmental investigation, um, re-engineering for access and plug and abandonment work. Uh, we also, I've been doing uh, geophysics work to look for wells um, that in the 1940s and World War II area, they stripped casing out of the ground and to re-enter those and to properly assess them. I have to find where the well actually was. Uh, so we've been doing ground-based magnetometry for about 13 years. Um, and then in the past two years, I've been doing uh, aerial-based magnetometry. Uh, as you can see here, here's some of the results from our um, our Parsons own magnetometer drone survey. Um, we were looking for wells, and half of the sites I get to deal with, that's all I have left as far as well infrastructure. I get a mudded hole in the ground that I get to find. Um, not the most ideal situation. Most times I have to rebuild a well to plug a well uh, is what we do a lot in our program. Um, so... For us, the, the drone-based magnetometer has been really integral into getting our crews onto the right location on the right site because a lot of times the state records and, and the old records from the 30s and 40s, the locations and survey survey spots can vary up to 200 feet. And that's, a you know, we start talking about trying to investigate a 200-foot radius to find where the well actually is. It can be a lot of, lot of time. Um, so we also do turnkey orphan well plugging. Um, you can see the pictures of some of the debris we pulled out of some of our New York wells. Um, that was some Bolivar Peninsula in Texas, um, coastal well orphan investigation we did. And then um, two years ago, uh, there's a well I did in uh, in the central Michigan area where when the well was drilled in the 1930s, there wasn't a lake. Um, now there is that that lake was built in the 50s. And unfortunately, a gentleman building his very nice house there uh, was dozing in a private boat ramp and sheared the top of the well off and it had gas pressure on it. So I had the joy of getting a drill rig in and not cutting down his, his trees. And um, my tubing trailer was just about hanging over the lake on that one because there was not much room. I had about a, a 50 by 60 well pad and that's all I had to deal with. Uh, we also do uh, methane monitoring for the state of Michigan orphan well program. Um, we use the RMLD and uh, high flow instruments from Heath. Um, all TDLIS based. Um, very, we've done, had uh, field field results of leak quantification down to 0.3 gram an hour, which of course DL regulations, that's uh, guidance that's non-detect, but uh, we've seen some very small leaks. And for the most part, our leaks have been on the small scale, probably averaging less than 20 grams per hour. Uh, we also have been the past couple of years doing a bunch of R&D research on a risk-based alternative to well plugging. Um, say on wells that are going to be a complicated re-entry or they're just leaking methane to surface. Um, there's no other subsurface or fluid impacts. 
Um, we've patented a system of a methane biofilter that we can place over top of the well or landfill cap, what have you, um, and actually enhance the biodegradation of methane and at least convert that leaking methane to CO2. Say if this is a, a lower priority, lower leak rate, rate well, um, you can put this solution over top of it and um, and buy yourself some time or give you additional monitoring time or um, just because you know in your program you're not going to get to this well for maybe a decade based on current funding. Uh, we also do a lot of remediation decommissioning for, you know, a lot of oil and gas, um, but all sorts of industrial contaminants. Um, one of our large successes in Michigan is we operate a land farm facility where we're able to um, remediate and use as un unrestricted use backfill um, and can remediate between 100 and 120,000 cubic yards per year. Um, and since 2006, when we uh, built and started running the facility, um, we've remediated over, I think, one and a half million cubic yards total um, and worked on those thousand sites. We also do flow line removal, whereas that's a bunch of uh, World War II era uh, asbestos concrete flow line that they use, especially for brine lines. Uh, we do also operate a class two UIC well for all of our leachate disposal. Um, now we get into to some of the, the different issues of just getting onto these, these old sites that have been forgotten about time. Um, there's many access challenges. These early era wells are really drilled without modern environmental cons considerations. They put them next to rivers, next to streams, um, you know, sometimes a lot of the wells are put on uniform spacing patterns and wherever the closest point to that was, that was on solid ground. That's where that well went. Um, and most of the wells I work on were all drilled with cable tool locations. So the well pads themselves, especially when they're middle of a swamp, are very small, much smaller, half the size of this room even. And so we have to do a lot of engineering and permitting to be able to get a service rig onto these and once again, build a well to plug a well. Uh, as you can see here, that's a 1938 aerial image. You can see that the uh, standard derricks um, right next to the, with the river running in between. Uh, that well to the north is only about 50 feet off of that river. Um, but it's actually an eight mile drive to get from that well, which is 660 feet south, up to the north well. So that and that was a bunch of old forestry road we had to rebuild, repermit, um, and floodplain issues we had to deal with. Now, when you get dealing with uh, these old legacy and orphan orphan well site remediation issues, and there's a lot of different stakeholders that you can run into depending on if it, the well's on private land, if it's on public land, um, but early engagement of all the stakeholders you have is, is definitely key. Um, and some sites have absolutely many, and we've seen examples of wells under power lines where you've got Department of Transportation right-of-way permits, uh, you need driveway permits to, to build, rebuild your lease roads, um, whether it's wetlands, floodplains, um, all sorts of different regulatory bodies that you have to permit and deal with, let alone the, the private, the corporate, the club land ownership, and all the, the different issues that that can entail. So there are special access considerations that we have to engineer around, and this uh, photo here in this case was a um, high pressure gas line. And we actually had to do engineering, build an air bridge to cross, get our rig across that gas line. But we also had to do bonding to the utility company in case that they required in case anything happened to their line. Um, once again, these wells exist in utility right of ways. Um, there are corporation owned properties where you sometimes have to deal with um, other corporation lawyers and things like that. Um, and other municipal agencies and, and all of their engineers and permitting. It can get quite complicated. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about land use changes. Uh, once again, what, what the land was at the time that well was drilled may very much not be the case today. Um, in this example here, uh, that field was drilled in uh, 1935, 1938, and abandoned anywhere in the late 30s up to the 50s. And there's still a few operating wells going on in there. Um, but in the 1960s, they built a very nice dam and created that lake. And now there are numerous wells out in the middle of that lake. Uh, we've had to address a couple of them out there and um, basically wait till wintertime when the municipality draws that lake level down for the wintertime and get in there at that point where we have better access and, and can uh, then work in the shallow areas outside of the uh, old river channel. 
The other challenge that created is now because it raised that groundwater level elevation level up in that whole area. Now the creek that runs to the north northwest out of that lake, that whole area has become a very large cedar swamp. And um, you know, you're talking you're going to think about anything, try to get down the old roads, and it's just a, a complete reconstruction to get your way back in. Uh, here's another example of what we did. Um, the wells were drilled originally in the 1920s, and then there was some secondary recovery efforts in that field in the 1980s that didn't go so well. Um, so the wells were plugged anywhere between the 1930s and the 1990s. Um, that operator then that had those wells uh, then became a sand and gravel company and built a sand and gravel quarry on that old lease they held. Um, then subsequently, they built a golf course over top of that quarry. Um, and unfortunately, those old abandoned wells are still there. And so when we investigated them, we found one that was leaking right on the slope of the uh, one of the large golf course ponds. I actually dealt with a few on that golf course. But the challenge created there was is we had to wait till their their play season was done in the fall, do all of the, all of the temporary construction. That was about a, a 12 foot high rig pad. We had to build out into that pond in order to get, get on access to that well bore and get equipment on there. And then we had to have it plugged and all restored and everything put back the cart pass repaved all the sprinkler infrastructure that we had to remove to, to do the excavation put back by the next spring where they could start growing their grass on it. Um, there's also, once again, modern infrastructure and land use changes. Um, Upper left-hand corner, that's a well we did in New York for the Orphan Well Program where it's directly under a power line and it was leaking. Um, we had to get the power power line, uh, do an emergency shutoff on it because that had vented. Uh, just to the left is actually a, a restaurant and a parking lot. Um, so it was a very high-risk well. Um, the facility you see on the right-hand side there, it was an active U-Haul facility that the well was just outside of their barn and we couldn't impact their operations. Um, so there can be a lot of coordination with with some of those industrial clients and or um, just other stakeholders that still have to be able to do their daily job. Um, then there's oil field redevelopment. That was a site we did where um, the independent operator put a flow line right down the middle of that lease road. Well, our well we were looking for is right next to it. And they failed to tell us where their line they put in was, and they didn't even know where it was. And of course it was active and it was three foot away from the well we needed to access and replug. And so it was a surprise when we found that. Permitting, um, you know, there's different levels of permitting that you need to go through. Army Corps engineers, nationwide permits, any state permits, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, wetlands, floodplains, NPDES, which we avoid because um, we usually don't have a reason to discharge any of our remediation. Um, stormwater prevention and, and erosion plans, which can um, in Michigan are handled on more of the county level for the erosion plans. Um, now with some of the, the grant funds, we're getting into Section 106, National Historic Preservation Act. Um, there's different Department of Transportation permits, like I mentioned. Um, threatened and endangered species and significant community screening. Um, and then also we work on a bunch of state forestry lands. So there are uh, state forestry requirements and bonding that we have to deal with. Uh, here's an example of a permit for um, for a well pad and a lease road. We had to get in through a floodplain. We actually had to cross through a creek. Um, so and there's many different layers, uh, a lot of public notice, and once again, just coordinating with all the stakeholders. Um, there are many access restrictions. Uh, Central Michigan, deer hunting is very popular, so we basically get kicked out of everywhere come October, November. Um, there can be agriculture planting seasons where we have to wait for the harvest to be done to get in in that farm field, do our work once again in the winter and the off, off season. Um, we have to very much plan our work around wet seasons, flooding. Um, I think it was Steve Plants mentioned that, yeah, you don't wanna pick a well site to go into in March that you know is gonna be to totally inundated. You need, to, you need to work with your queue of sites and really, uh, really manage what time you're going into these sites and pay attention to all of your different restrictions. Um, there's cultural areas. Uh, we can't clear any trees without special permission in a forestry unit because of oak wilt disease, where from uh, April 15th to, I think, uh, September 15th, we can't clear, cut trees or do any branch clearing uh, without special permission. Um, then there's the different endangered species mating seasons and, and all this stuff have to intertwine and really manage well um, to deal with your large queue of sites. 
Um, now, restoration times, there's there's different seed mixes, uh, whether it's emerging wetland, upland, um, uh, forested wetland. You know, we did uh, uh, actually had to take out that whole stream bank to plug plug and remediate an orphan well. Uh, those bottom two are the, the same well site looking from different directions. Um, and that was in, once again, in somebody's backyard. And so we had to do all the permitting and everything, um, temporary bypass pumping while we were doing the remediation of those waters. And of course, we had to wait till it was the dry season to do that, where there were going to be minimal to low flows. Um, so how are we uh, minimizing our disturbance and increasing our efficiencies? Uh, we're doing early desktop reviews and starting to category, uh, categorize sites into different buckets and estimate what lead time we need to get, get our surveying done. Um, once again, that early stakeholder engagement is key, getting everybody on the same page. Um, we're, now we're doing upfront drone surveys, we're doing magnetometer and LIDAR to really do all of our mapping and data collection um, and get, get everything into the digital world ahead of times. So that way our field crews can go out with field maps on their phone, walk right to the right spot, start their investigation, and it really minimizes rework. And then say for floodplain permitting, all my cross sections, I can pull right out of the digital elevation models and I don't have to send surveyors out there to hack through brush and, um, and really start looking for those. Something unique about that picture of those wells, uh, the top well, that well site 10, the top of casing was ripped off at 163 feet. And at well site 11, the top of casing is 182 feet. Um, our magnetometer and, and our ge geophysics processing we use um, really helps us see those, those deeper wells where they've done the pulling of casing. Um, with that, thank you very much for being here today. Happy to answer any questions anybody has later on. Thank you. Uh, and now we have Mike Hickey. My wife assured me that by Friday afternoon, nobody would be left. So uh, anybody who wants to leave, now's your chance. Um, my name is Mike Hickey. I'm the Orphan Well Program Supervisor for the Energy and Carbon Management Commission in Colorado. I think the program says it's COGCC still. That name changed in um, 2023. Um, but I will... Um, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about our numbers because I'm standing here looking at the numbers right in front of these guys from Texas who just blow us away by an order of magnitude. And with uh, Pennsylvania in the room, I almost feel like I should leave now. Um, so I won't go into that very much. Um, I'm here to talk about the uh, remediation reclamation. And those are two terms that we use. I don't really... I uh, have a lot of familiarity with restoration. Uh, remediation for us is the environmental cleanup and the uh, reclamation is the bugs and bunnies. So um, before we start a plugging and abandonment program, uh, we have to have Form 27s reviewed and approved. So our planning process starts weeks, even months before we can actually get out on the ground. Form 27 for us is a remediation plan. So we have a remediation reclamation plan in place before we can put a tooth in the ground. Now we can get started on the drilling, but before we can dig that casing up to cut and cap, we have to have an approved remediation plan. Typically those uh, include just a requirement for uh, confirmation samples. When we dig up that wellhead to get two walls and a floor, to just verify that the dirt we're leaving behind is clean. When our contractors uh, get in there to do it, um, if there's a little extra, we encourage them to take it. But sometimes that turns into the back of Godzilla's head and we have to come back later. We also have Forms uh, 6 as our notice of intent to abandon. We talked a little bit yesterday about the uh, approved plan uh, you tell them what you're going to do, then you go out and do it, and you do a six subsequent that shows them exactly how it was done. And there's typically variations for that. As uh, I think uh, President Dwight Eisenhower said, uh, the plan is useless, but the planning is priceless. 
uh, and having been through the desktop review and reviewing all the documentation we have in order to file that notice of intent to abandon, uh, we can form a plan, develop a wellboard diagram, and uh, fill out that form that says how we're going to plug it. That goes to the ECMC engineering group, just like any other operator. They review it and approve it. Uh, fortunately for us, they have a schedule that is not just like every other operator. We're very fortunate to get some uh, very active participation and uh, collaboration with the other parts of ECMC on every level. Um, the Form 42 also goes out uh, 48 hours before we move in to rig up. And we have a second Form 42 to notify the local a government designee that we are going to plug a well in their jurisdiction. Uh, we have a uh, geophysicist genius that takes care of a lot of that um, paperwork for us named Deb Abrams. We have a guy in the field who's been plugging the well, plugging wells in the DJ Basin in Colorado for 47 years um, named Kelly Reinhardt that everybody knows. Uh, one of our main um, plugging contractors uh, at Bowler Well Service. Mike Bowler actually went to high school with Kelly, so they've known each other all their lives. And um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, infrastructure law, uh, has language in it about encouraging us to get family-owned businesses uh, back to work. And uh, if Mike Bowler... Uh, is ever late with his daily reports, I pick up the phone and call his mom. Um, our, our DCOM contractor, uh, Ramco Well Services, Roy Ramirez, that owns the company, if he messes up an invoice, I call his wife. She hands him the baby and takes care of business for us. So we've got these Family-owned businesses, when we need something done, we know who to call. They take care of business. They've gotten up to date with their uh, DBRA compliance, their certified payrolls, their weekly pay. Um, and it's, uh, it's a hard road to hoe for these guys to make this conversion from the way we've always done it to the level of monitoring and reporting and data collection that's required now under these federal bills. Um, this is some of the pre-plugging methane work that we've done. What you see there is sort of a um, all hands on deck application. It's a variation of the chamber measurement that you saw before. And what we found is a combination of using um, a combined weapons attack uh, that by using a opened up static free bag like that to form a background on the well on the upwind side to minimize the interference from the wind uh, gives us a, a better reading on the high flow measurements. There's, there's issues with all of these methods, and by doing combined arms, we find that we've gotten better results. This day, we happened to be out there with All-American, and we had a well that had uh, excessive pressure on it and that we were blowing down, and they could actually uh, choke down and measure the flow rate that was going to their incinerator as we blew down. So we knew how much gas was coming out of these openings when these guys were doing these measurements. So we could make accurate comparisons between just the high flow measurement and using a backstop uh, for uh, the elimination of the wind issue uh, when we use the uh, optical gas imaging the same bag provided that clean background that you don't get the the gas and dirt background on the infrared images and also help just improve the uh, accuracy of these measurements uh, on the right there you see uh, our state and federal uh, participation in the well i picked the 
picture that's uh, got my hand in front of my face so you don't have any more of me than you already have to deal with. But that is Governor Jared Polis on the left in the blue shirt and the Secretary of the Department of the Interior, Deb Holland, came out to actually visit and see what one of these sites looks like. Her picture was, what is this thing and how does it work? And that's I'm pointing to the tank battery that it goes to when it's done with this separator. This is what we're up against. Um, with Colorado's new regulations, um, we are actively removing miles and miles of flow line. And I know some of the other states are also uh, removing flow lines. You can see the kind of issues we get when we're removing these flow lines. That tank in the lower left, you can see a couple little holes that are about the size of my thumb. And I only know that approximately because when I put my thumb up against it, it turned into a hole the size of my fist. And the puddle you see in the very lower left corner was what was under that tank. And that's Sussex oil that you can smell from a half a block away. Uh, the flow line corrosion that you see there was flow line number two, where we were expecting only one. Uh, one of our industry partners had plugged this well and flushed the flow line for us and plugged it in accordance with the rules and left it in place. And we came back to remove it. When we went to remove it, we had a budget, uh, we had a contract for a $60,000 removal because it went through three private yards and under a residential street before it got to the tank battery. Um, when we started digging, we were expecting a clean flow line made out of steel. And what we found was three. Uh, when these flow lines started leaking bad enough and they saw a decrease in production at the end of the month, they laid a new one. And they left the old one the way it was. And when we went to go pull it, uh, it came apart in pieces. Uh, number two there had enough fluid still in it that it made a big mess for us. Uh, the number three flow line was not much more than an orange stain in the ground. And we had uh, about $150,000 cleanup before that one was done. The Flow line dig, you can see there sometimes there's multiple wells that feed a single tank battery and we re are removing multiple lines. When we are removing those flow lines, if we find an incidental spill, like I said, we encourage our contractors to take a little extra, clean it up as much as we can, we have third-party professionals out there monitoring and sampling while we do this work. Anytime they see something that looks suspicious, they will check it with a PID, a photo ion detector. They're very effective at picking up hydrocarbons. We have a mix. These flow lines, oil, gas, and water always occur together. The produced water contains some petroleum products, but it's the inorganics that really catch us by surprise more often than not. We can get uh, the PID readings down to an acceptable level, think we're done. Uh, we take confirmation samples, and two months later, we get them back from the labs and find out we got to go back. Um, going back is just an unavoidable part of what goes on with these remediations. It makes them hard to schedule. It makes them hard to finish. And it's a big reason why industry really doesn't like doing them. Um, when we find a big mess, we leave it. We will put a layer of sand on top of it so that we can come back and find it, kind of seal it up a little bit and protect it and backfill the hole and reprocure. We'll start a new contract to go back and do it again. When we do that, we will first uh, do a separate task order to go in and try to delineate these sites. And you have to do your best at delineating these things, but we haven't really gotten very many of them right. These things surprise us almost every time. On this one, uh, this well had operated with an Ajax engine, uh, which is a, a one-cylinder engine that runs off the casing head gas. That gas has condensate in it. They put 
tires on it to drop the condensate out so the gas that goes into the Ajax is a little cleaner. It's not really very clean. And the exhaust from Ajax, and Ajax engines um, splatter condensate and exhaust and burnt fluids out the back of them and make horrible messes on the surface. That's what we found when we were initially uh, investigating this site. And as we went around it, we put a perimeter around it and drilled down 15 feet. When we got in there, that source, that red arrow there is pointing at one of those dryers. The Ajax engine on this well had two very large uh, dryers on it. When the neighbors moved in, you can see the houses in the background there. Uh, the residential development converted them from the Ajax engines. If you've ever been around one, it's the pop, 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 pop that you hear all over the industry. And they wanted the electric motors on it. When that happened, they dug a little hole next to those dryers and pushed them in. They sat there and leaked that condensate into the ground for 30 years. When we started digging, we found the layer that you see there. Does this have a... No? Okay. The layer that you see there on the right with the two pieces of pipe kind of laying on it was 18 feet down. It was just deep enough to get below our 15-foot uh, test holes. The condensate from that dryer, from those dryers, hit that sandstone at 15 feet and chased it for about 50 feet till it got outside of our perimeter, found some fractures and got down to 34 feet. The deeper pit that you see over there is the spot where it pooled at the bottom. The fence you see on the right there is at the boundary of a 10-inch high-pressure gas line. So it was a, a place where we didn't want to go. The gas transmission company didn't want us to go there. So we kept our distance. Um, these are the volumetrics. We have a, uh, a couple of reps who have been clearing these sites for us. Uh, Reed Wold and Jason Leverton have been uh, reclaiming these sites for us. And Jason is our drone pilot. And he came out here and did some of these volumetrics. And what you see there with the red volume there is the overburden. This is the soil that as we removed it, trying to chase this stain down, uh, our third party consultant determined this was clean enough to reuse as backfill. And um, the volume there on the left is what we removed. We wound up transporting 3,555 yards to disposal. The most accurate estimating number I've ever come across is this $100 a cubic yard for impacted soil. That includes the removal of the overburden, the removal of the contaminated soil, transport, disposal, uh, the third leg from disposal to source to get clean and clean back tipping, placing, compacting. It's very expensive. I'm going to be talking to Ron from Parsons about some of these reclamation processes he has as soon as I get home. <laughs> um, this is after the remediation. Uh, we've got a remediation expert who's been in this field for, I think, 28 years. He knows everybody. He's been on some of these sites in the past. He would be a better person to be standing here telling you about remediation, but he was busy in the field, so they sent me. Uh, after we get it clean, get it backfilled, uh, our reclamation guys come in and do the soil treatments on the surface and um, leave you with a site that you can build a house on. This landowner, uh, Andy uh, Neitenbach, was a great guy to work with and has uh, built homes for his brother and himself on this site. And uh, if I had more current pictures, you'd be able to see those. Uh, that's our website. Uh, you can see we have an Orphan Well Program button on there. That's the best way to find me. I think my uh, contact information is uh, down the row a little bit from that button. And uh, thank you very much.
Great. Thank you. Last but not least, Brent. Hi, everyone. Uh, Brent Wilson. I'm the Reclamation and Sustainability Manager at Red Willow Production Company. And as Mary said in the introduction, uh, Red Willow Production Company is wholly owned by the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of perspective, uh, giving an introduction to Red Willow, uh, the San Juan Basin, uh, where we operate, some regulatory oversight, um, maybe some uniqueness with uh, being a tribally owned operator. Um, some challenges we have with reclamation and then um, some stuff that uh, my team's put together to take more of an engineered approach uh, towards reclamation. Um, so to kick it off, um, Red Willow Production Company was formed in 1992. Um, they were formed to uh, take ownership of the tribe's energy resources within the San Juan Basin. Um, but since inception, we've expanded. Um, we've got non-operated partnerships in the Green River Basin, the Delaware Basin, and then we have two floating production systems in the Gulf Water, deep, uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the Southern Indian Reservation is about a thousand square miles, and it's that little uh, red uh, rectangle that I drew uh, kind of on the border of Colorado and New Mexico. Um, so, regulatory oversight for PA reclamation. Um, this is where we're in a very unique situation. Um, the Southern Indian tribe, um, has sovereignty. Um, so a lot of the state and local jurisdictions don't apply, uh, when we're talking, uh, of the tribe's operations within the boundaries of the reservation. Um, and so projects are conducted under oversight of the Southern Ute Department of Energy, uh, the Southern Ute Department of Natural Resources, the BLM and the BIA. Um, we, uh, deem projects complete. Uh, when the wells are released through a final abandonment notification, similar to any well on a federal lease. Um, and they are done in, in concert with the Southern Ute Department of Energy and, and uh, Department of Natural Resources. Um, they all work together. So this is where it's a very unique situation uh, for my team where uh, we are the oil and gas operator. Um, we are the regulatory body that we work with, the, the BLM and the BIA. Um, but then also the tribe is the landowner at the end of the day. So um, a very unique um, circumstance, which has is, is allowed my team to really dive into uh, reclamation practices and um, you know, try to do our best to give that land back to tribal membership um, and, and use it for, for what, they, what they need to. Um, so, as I mentioned, the reservation is uh, on the border of Colorado and New Mexico. We are in a high desert climate. Uh, we, for the past 10 years, probably longer than that, um, have been in a pretty severe drought uh, situation. And uh, so, uh, historically, reclamation practices, um, they were kind of... An afterthought when you think about it, the, the petroleum engineers would um, plug the well and then they'd hand it off to like the environmental team. The environmental team would move some dirt around, uh, test for contamination. If everything's clean, they'd seed it um, and walk away. And typically what we would do would be to seed it going into the winter. So a late fall dormant seeding. Um, the new kind of drought characteristics and then some changes in weather have made that very challenging. And actually what's been happening is um, we have these storms that come in January that um, are a lot warmer than what should be for that time frame. Um, we get a rainstorm in the middle of January in Colorado uh, that triggers the seed to germinate. But since it's still winter, a few weeks later, we get a cold snap and it kills all the seed. Um, so my team has been presented with challenges to basically take our um, idle well program and look at it in a way that uh, is basically addressing the drought issues, um, addressing the climate of the area, and then um, basically building a program uh, that accounts for all that and tries to mitigate some of those issues. Um, Mary had a, 
a slide about this. This is kind of the same idea, but succession is really what we're after. Um, so when you're doing a reclamation project, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you want it to blend in as best you can with the the natural surrounding. Um, what we use is succession. So uh, that slide there shows kind of a progression of species that that come onto the location after they've been bare ground for a long time. Um, so we go from bare ground and kind of like some weeds uh, to perennial grasses and shrubs. Um, and then basically that's our goal in reclamation. If we can get grasses established and, and a few shrubs on location, um, that's enough to get this process going and let mother, Ma mother nature take over. The last thing we want to do is plant a bunch of trees that are just going to die because there's no water. Um, we want those to come in naturally and to basically find their own way into, uh, um, into our surface. So, um, we look at about a two to four year, um, establishment process. Um, if there's one thing that, you know, the States can kind of take away from this is, is don't let, don't let this be an afterthought. If, if you take all those thousands of wells and then add on however many years it takes to, to reclaim the surface. Um, if you think about how much time and effort, um, that means, um, you know, it's a big deal. Um, so we were kind of in a similar situation. We have much less wells than, um, than some of the states in here. But in 2019, uh, the team was established. And basically, it's uh, in the engineering department. Uh, we took over ownership of the uh, reclamation jobs. Um, and really, you know, my background in engineering, um, I was using data to drive the decisions. And so what we wanted to do and what we still do to this day is we take our data. It's a very, um, you know, strategic approach where we collect as much as we can. Um, we generate our plans. We communicate that with our counterparts over at the Southern New DOE. Um, and basically we try to tee everything up to where we can just hit these reclamation projects with one effort um, and not have to come back um, over the years to, to try to get these things to grow. Um, this is just a snapshot of one of the reclamation plans. And I know this is too hard to to, they're too small to see on the screen, um, but it shows you the level, level of detail that we put into these plans. We've got contour lines. We've got um, some uh, section lines showing the gradient. Um, we've got areas where we know that there is like a drilling pit, for instance, that we don't want to dig up. So we want to add some extra cover to that. Um, and then, um, you know, different call outs for various drainage, fe drainage features that we want to leave. Um, and then kind of an oversight of what will be seeded and where um, and what seed mixture to use. So to do that, um, we implemented uh, drone mapping uh, technology. This is consumer level uh, drones. Uh, this is nothing fancy. Um, it's basically taking uh, photos of a location and stitching them together and then looking for small differences to generate a 3D model um, of the location. And so um, what we do is we basically generate a hillshade model, which is on the left there, um, run it into a contour uh, line generation software. Um, and then uh, I got a better picture here. Yeah, let me, sorry, I'll back up. So we take photos, which is on the left there. Um, this is a location before we've done anything on it. You can still see the equipment on site. Um, the right is the generated 3D model um, and what we're looking at is to the top left, so it'd be the northwest, there's a hill where when they built the pad, they took a bunch of material down and then they, they kind of built up that southern corner. And you can really see in the uh, hillshade model, the darker lines are the more extreme gradients. Um, and, uh, and so the, those drones actually, I mean, they're picking up individual um, puffs of grass. Like it's very, very detailed. Um, and very useful for us um, to figure out. So we run it through AutoCAD, generate our contour lines. Um, again, this is too, too small to see for everybody on there, but this just kind of gives you an idea. Um, if you look at the contours kind of all throughout, what we're trying to do is pick contour lines um, and then basically find their counterpart on the other side of, of the pad and then draw them through to make a, uh, a, a consistent um, flow of, of surface um, 
I'm through the pad. And really what we're trying to do here is maximize the amount of time that the water can stay on location without turning it into a pond. So we want it to be sheet flowing off a of location. We don't want any sort of head cuts to develop. Um, we don't want anything that could have any sort of velocity behind it. Um, basically, the longer we can hold the water on, on the pad, the better for us. It seeps into um, you know the first few inches of the soil and, um, and helps us out in the long run. So this is a drone image of that same location. Uh, this is before seeding. Um, so you don't see any of the mulch or, or seed or anything, but the reason I put this in there is kind of what I was talking about. So we want to, we want to promote a gentle drainage of the location. And, uh, I wish we had a, uh, a laser pointer on this, but if you look on, uh, maybe on the, on the hillshade, hillshade on the West side of the location, you can kind of see that the, uh, shadows, um, continue into the pad kind of at a uniform rate. It's a little tough to see because the vegetation is not there yet, but um, really, uh, if you if you just kind of follow the edges of the location, you can see that the shadows are, are kind of mimicking what's what's happening on the outside. Um, and so this is kind of an instance of where we're doing that upfront work to ensure that uh, we're leaving something that's going to be stable enough to do that succession and to grow um, those species and, and help reclaim. So additionally, uh, we've been working with soil additives. Um, one of the first things we tried is uh, biosolids and we still use biosolids a lot. Um, biosolids are a byproduct of wastewater treatment plants. You guys can all figure out what that is. Sure. Um, so we're introducing nutrients back into the sterile soil. If you think about a natural gas or oil and gas operations, it's always this nice flat pad with no vegetation growing on it. That's after decades of weed spraying and, and ground sterilant that's been basically just sitting around and making your soil tough to grow anything on intentionally. But when it comes to my team, we have to undo that process. And so biosolids introduce those nutrients. Uh, two years ago, we started implementing biochar uh, where we're tilling that into the soil. Um, biochar is, uh, we're sourcing it from a company in Colorado that, that makes it out of beetle kill. Uh, so the trees are already dead. We're not really impacting any sort of ecosystem or anything, but biochar is a wood substance that is burned in the absence of oxygen. And it creates this, um, kind of like a crystalline, uh, carbon structure. And it's, it's similar to like a water filter, uh, that uses carbon to kind of trap contaminants. Um, so we use it in the soil to, to try to, to trap anything that we don't want in there. And then it also has an affinity for water. So it increases the soil water retention. Um, and then the last kind of like non-tech way that we're, we're managing this is we actually flip the uh, top foot of soil. Um, and that's, again, we have that ground sterilant that's left after decades of production. Um, and we use our dozer to flip that over. If we have any sort of like cut and fill, we try to tuck that into the, um, into the fill slope so that it's out of the way and off of the seed bed. Um, we started uh, a few years ago, we realized that uh, straw mulch uh, might be really good when you have a lot of rain and it sticks around. For us, we have way more wind than we have rain and straw is very uh, straight and round and it does not like to stay in the soil. So uh, mulching, which it, I mean, it kind of sounds, you know, like it should be easy to do. Everybody should be able to do it. It took us a really long time to figure this out. Um, we moved to an Excelsior mulch. So it's basically a shredded, uh, we use Aspen Excelsior, but it's a shredded woody fiber. Um, and you can see that picture in the middle there. Um, those fibers grab the soil and they, they kind of expand and contract based on the moisture level. And so they kind of dig their way into the soil and that stuff stays around under any condition. Um, we've seen years and years where the, the Excelsior is still on location after many, many storms. Um, it's similar to hydro mulch um, in the sense that it creates a nice, um, basically a nice uniform um, area to trap moisture, but hydro mulch is very expensive. Uh, we typically only use hydro mulch on like steep slopes. Um, and then lastly, so 
kind of going full circle. So we're, we're using data to drive the decision-making process of um, how we're designing these reclamation projects. Um, we're now using a similar technology to measure our success. And so we've got um, a new multi-spectral drone. Uh, we are using the infrared camera on that drone to look for vegetation signatures. Um, that image there is a visual spectrum image with the infrared laid over it. And so it's kind of like a um, artificial color uh, showing the green as the vegetation. Um, and what we do with that is we actually do our vegetation monitoring with the drone. And so, you know, previously, and, and a lot of people still do this, um, I think everybody else still does this, you would walk out on location, you would walk your transects, you would um, make a measurement of your vegetation density, and then try to compare that to the surrounding area. Um, what we're doing is we're basically using the drone and then counting the number of pixels that return back that there's vegetation there, uh, and then using that to compare. Um, and so on the right there, you can see the different transects that we flew with the drone. Number five is off a location, uh, showing what should be there on, a, on an undisturbed location. And then we're basically using that to drive the decision to uh, request closure of, of the locations. Um, so I know that was kind of a departure from what the rest of these talks have been about, but um, I wanted to at least share some some insight from being in a very unique situation. And I think a lot of the states are going to are going to run into this with the orphan well program where you all will be managing contractors and, and um, there's going to be a lot of learning going on and trying to figure out what works best for you guys. And so um, we've seen a lot of great success um, and we're going to continue to, to work on things and try to get better. But anyway, thank you for your time. Great. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, have a lot of questions, but I first want to open it up to the audience. Um, and I'm just checking if there are any um, questions on Slido. But um, is there is there a question here? Okay, yes. Uh, can we get a mic? Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, from the sample analysis we did, um, our and this was with the uh, our the first version of the magnetometer sensor we we're using that a three meter accuracy GPS. Um, from the data set we did, and we excavated and actually uh, used our Trimble unit to survey the well bores. Our, our average distance to well bore location was 12 and a half feet, and we had a standard deviation of 6.8 feet. Um, included in that data set were wells from anywhere uh, three to four foot surface casing all the way down to that 182 foot surface casing. We did have one where there was a uh, driven water well that was about 60 feet away from the well bore location that did skew our results. Um, we admitted that one just because we knew that one messed with us. But other than that, yeah, we've, and we've, our data shows that we should be able to see top of casings beyond 200 feet. What kind of device did you use this magnetometer device? What it was? Um, it was a geometric of mag arrow. Thank you. Great. Go ahead. Great. Back with many deal. Uh, this is a question for Mike, maybe Ron. Um, okay, very glad. Uh, this is a question for Mike, maybe Ron. Um, some of these images you guys are showing about the amount of uh, soil that's pulled out of the well pad. How how common is this? What percentage of wells uh, that, that you're going in and plugging are you removing uh, this much soil for to, to remediate? You know, it's sure. It's definitely not every well. Uh, we've had uh, three of these over the last three or four years that were really, really large. Uh, and when we, one thing I didn't get to with this slideshow is when we do these, we try to bundle them. And uh, so this particular one, we really never know for sure how big they are 
So this project, we just took a wild guess at $200,000 per site for three sites. Uh, this one site, we spent 588000 of that. So we just lopped the other two sites off. They'll go into another contract in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you wind up, that's not all on that site. The other two sites had some investigation and some restoration that we could do to make it better. But um, it uh, it's hard to predict. Yeah. So I don't really have an answer for how many of them are out there um, because we don't necessarily know till we get there. We've had three or four pretty good sized ones so far. Thanks. Uh, for us, it's been, um, you know, probably half three quarters of the well sites we remediate. A lot of it is is error dependent. Um, like I say, working a lot of stuff from produce, produce and drilled in the 20s and 30s. Uh, we do a lot of analytical methodology to see if if we're dealing with, um, and especially that comes into our wellbore integrity analysis, is we use our analytical soil samples to determine is it weather crude, is it fresh crude? You know, we kind of look at that fingerprint analysis that we uh, pull from different wells, operating wells in the field to see kind of what our ratios are and how, how it's been weathered. Um, a lot of the well sites, it's also dependent on if we are have a high water table, deeper water table. Um, a lot, of, most of your well sites, if you're primarily soil, soil matrix clay, um, unless it's a fractured clay environment, you're probably not going to see much of anything. Uh, if you got a lot of sand or there's a lot of leakage from that well, um, tank batteries are going to be some of your worst sites. Um, the largest one I personally dug is 140,000 cubic yards, and that's a year and a half of my life. I early career I won't get back is wow. dealing with that one. <laughs> um, but they, they can range. Um, I did have a slide and then showed a couple excavators bench down and fractured clay down to about 35 feet dealing with that and, and running benzene. And so it, it's definitely having good site investigation, um, good analytical samples, and uh, just in good overall environmental consulting to really help mitigate those risks and, and manage that moving forward and um, say lumping things together and just making intelligent decisions for efficiency. Yeah. Thanks so much. Go ahead. Hi, Adam Peltz from the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, two thoughts for anyone to take or leave. So one is that I've learned that when you have salt in the soil, there's really no shortcuts other than scoop it up and get rid of it. Um, do people agree with that? So that's one. I see a lot of nodding. The other one is we haven't really talked a lot about if you have groundwater contamination. Is there anything that can be done about that or do you just have to call it a loss? Uh, yes, for, for the most part, um, if you have brine contamination, um, yeah, that's pretty, we've dealt with a lot of that and done uh, several excavations just for brine because you can't get anything to grow on it. Your reclamation is going to fail if you leave that in the soil. Uh, depending on site regulations, I know in Michigan, we've got um, a pretty tight regulation on chlorides in groundwater at 250 milligrams per liter. So we have to consider a lot of brine impacts and things in Michigan that I think in other states have, have a little higher regulations. Um, and as far as your other question, um, groundwater impacts, generally, unless you've got a, a really big leak around the well, um, oil and water don't get along and that's kind of the advantage to it. So especially with that heavier crude oil, it tends to stay bound to your soil matrix and it slow groundwater movement. It really doesn't move too far. Um, now, like your gas condensate or things like that, or old gas plants can be a different story with that real light end stuff. Um, but for the most part, crude oil doesn't go too far. For what it's worth, the scenario I'm thinking of is where you have saltwater intrusion into a freshwater aquifer. We have investigated and, and have dealt with many of those. Yeah, there's there's not a lot you can do. You can um, In Michigan, we deal with that in a very messed up glacial depositional environment. Um, really mixed up. No, there's no continuous predictable aquifer. Um, and we've had it where we'll have a monitoring well and we step over a hundred feet to try and delineate our plume and there isn't an aquifer there, or you went from having one to now you have three or four interbedded. Um, it can, it can get, so then we'd bring in a lot of 3D modeling techniques and, and do a bunch of different things like that to help us understand what's going on in that case. On the groundwater subject, uh, we've got a project that we're just buttoning up right now where um, the spring water table came up 
And as we excavated the flow lines, uh, they started out every morning by using a vac truck to suck up the coffee colored water that was coming up in their ditch every day. And as they um, hauled that away every morning, um, it came up cleaner and cleaner every day. Uh, but again, this is one of those projects that we have buttoned back up that we're going to come back and address uh, with a new task order when the next funding round comes in. So it's one of those ones that's sitting out there waiting for us. We definitely know we have crude oil in the groundwater. And um, the only way we've addressed it so far is to uh, remove it and haul it to an injection site. Uh, we do. We are also investigating the possibilities of reusing uh, an orphaned well uh, that was designated as an injector, where we can use some fresh water to flush a big salt kill and collect the water at the bottom of it in a pond and reinject it. And we're just in the very early stages of that investigation based on some things that I learned in this room in the last couple of days. Wow. Sounds intensive. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> These are really expensive projects. The project we're looking at uh, for the salt kill is 38 acres, I think. And the, the salt intrusion was over uh, the course of 50 years. Uh, we think it's at least six feet thick. And we've got, if we have to dig it up and haul it, it's going to be a high dollar project. Well, thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, okay. that darn uh, sodium chloride is very stable and there's chemically, there's not much you can do to break it. The person that comes up with how to remediate Brian, or they'd be a billionaire overnight. Um, but yeah, let's pump and treat most thing you can do. And unfortunately, that's one that's pretty much just got to let it flush and dilute. And, um, you know, like talking about if you have disposal wells, you can do a pump and treat system and use some of that old oil field infrastructure to help remediate. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that question on remediation, because that's something that um, we probably could talk a lot more about as well. Um, I, I, I'm going to interject here and have a question for Brent and Forrest. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, thinking about the whole restoration is a higher priority for both of you. Um, I wonder if you can speak a little bit about how does that change your overall cost for well? Um, yeah, I could touch that. So we typically budget about twice the cost of plugging uh, for a reclamation job, and that does not include soil remediation. Um, so when we get into like what Mike was dealing with, which is, about one in 30, I'd say, are are pretty big like that. We, we typically have a few, you know, spots that we dig up and, and can handle with just normal equipment. But um, our, our biggest thing is uh, trying to return the surface back to the tribal membership. Um, they use the area for hunting grounds. Um, and so we, uh, we have a lot of, um, I guess, more incentive to, to get it back um, quickly so that they can, they can use it again. Um, and that's just a really unique portion of the landowner is there are community members and, and, um, you know, they're all interested in, in the success of the reclamation. Great. Thank you for us. If you wanted to add to that. Uh, yeah, kind of like what uh, Brent was saying, we, we budget very heavily for reclamation because we are the national parks and we, we do like to reclaim back to pre-operation as much as possible. Um, I don't like to use the word pristine or perfect because that's an unachievable goal, but we like to get back as close to pre-operation as possible. So we do budget pretty heavily for a reclamation. Um, and that does depend on the individual parks, uh, how much they need to be reclamated. And, uh, yeah. And, and one of our biggest issues on top of that, you know, plugging the well is just a very small part of our whole operation, you know, getting access to these sites is, is, um, pretty intense in some places. And we actually have to reclaim a lot of the access that we have, that we have to get to get into those, those spots. We have to reclaim that as well. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very good large chunk of our, of our planning. Is it times two times three? <laughs> uh, I'd say it's close to times two. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, and please. 
Um, I, <clears throat> uh, Dan Arthur, ALL Consulting. Um, I 100% agree with everybody on the groundwater issue. It's an issue. It's a, it can be a challenge on soil. I don't disagree with you when when you are in a in a short time frame, but there's actually been a good amount of DOE NETL research that like we've performed um, on uh, brine impacted soil cleanup uh, using things like phytoremediation and soil amendments during the coal bed methane boom, say in the Powder River Basin, uh, uh, managed irrigation with produced water uh, was done extensively with all sorts of different things. Um, and some of that, some of that depends on, are you needing to clean it up right now? And then Ron, I would agree with what you said is that there's not much you could do, but if you have time and you could, and you could do this, you know, say over a few years to clean that up. I mean, it didn't necessarily occur overnight. Um, that gives you a, some, I, I think your options are a lot better. And there's a lot of published information out there by guys like Kerry Sublett, uh, retired from the University of Tulsa, DOE. Yeah, we have tried phytoremediation. Um, ultimately, it was uh, great for the crude oil compounds and things like that. We're doing some of that with the leachate for uh, for a disposal well under our pilot study program for our land farm. Ultimately, the chlorides were accumulating, and we just, before it got too bad, we decided to um, nix that and put in the disposal well. And that ended up being about a million and a half dollar a year cost saving for our client, just from having to truck water from, we get quite a bit of rain in Michigan. Um, there are many in situ injectable. Um, we've done some ozone, ozone degradation. Um, in Michigan, the hard part we run into that is, is there are a lot of oil and gas exemptions for remediation and very simplified site investigation and sampling requirements and constituents. When you start doing some of the in situ remediation, um, now you're going to move over into the uh, more Superfund type regulations, general environmental. We're going to have to worry about heavy metals, daughter compounds, things like that. And in some of these oil field areas where you've got high backgrounds of some of those heavy, heavier metals or arsenics, um, it can then just bite you in the butt in the end. So um, in, in some cases, some not. Yes. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for a great session. Um, we're going to take a five minute stretching break so we can reconvene at uh, in at two or five. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Last one? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne. <laughs> I appreciate the support. Okay. Um, All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, this is going to be our last uh, session today. And um, I thought it would be good to actually end on a positive note. So let's look at some uh, advances in plugging and abandonment for idle wells, both from the technology, materials, practices. And um, in order to make this on time, uh, you can read about every of our panelists in the uh, bio section of the agenda. I'm just going to introduce them. Um, first, we have uh, Susan Nash. Uh, she's a director of innovation and emerging science at American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Susan will set the stage and, and kind of give a broad picture of what is out there because she um, is aware of uh, who is doing what. Uh, then we have um, Thomas Lopez, who is a principal PNA expert for ExxonMobil. Um, I personally believe, even though you may think you don't need uh, to uh, utilize all the advanced practices and materials and technologies in some of these orphan and idle wells, I think it's good to know uh, what are the highest standards that we have in industry for PNA. Um, 
personally, I also think it's good to break some of these silos. And uh, while we are focusing on idle and orphan wells, uh, I think we should also think about PNA in general. Uh, next, we have Jesse Frederick, he's the owner on WZI, um, who actually also has some really interesting samples here on the table. So you'll get to uh, feel those as they come around. And then we have Nick Genotus. I didn't do that right. Um, I practiced pronouncing, but it obviously failed. Uh, he's a physical scientist at the Central Energy Resources uh, Science Center at USGS in um, Denver. Denver. And then uh, last but not least is uh, Eric Wanort, who is a uh, uh, JJ King Chair of Engineering Professor at uh, UT Austin. Uh, and uh, after that, we'll just have a closing remarks from uh, Missy and Deb. So that's for the reminder of today. Uh, we'll have also some time, hopefully, for questions uh, and comments at the end of this session if every speaker sticks to the allocated time. Thank you. So let's start with Susan. You have an timer here and over there. Great. And Thank this you. is the Thank you. point. Well, everyone, it's really nice to be here. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. And first of all, how many of you are, are geologists? Excellent. How many engineers? How many geochemists? Excellent. How about um, geophysicists? Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> and others? Any others? <laughs> so I'm I'm assuming um, you're maybe administrators or program developers or directors. Is that correct? Or um, attorneys? Um, okay, great, excellent. Well, so I'm I'm just basically basically I'm assuming that not everyone knows about APG. So. Um, uh, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists has been around for over 100 years, but our Division of Environmental Geosciences is um, not 100 years old. We st it started in, in the 70s, and we have an incoming president, president-elect, Dan Arthur. Are you here in the room? Uh, yay! Dan is our, our president-elect, and, and um Amanda Vise, you might know her. She's uh, um, will be vice president. The president is Matthias Imhoff, who's at ExxonMobil. So, anyway, so we, the uh, the mission of the Div Division of Environmental Geosciences has been to to do things to preserve the uh, integrity of the environment, in, especially in conjunction with oil and gas operations. And a lot of the, the um, impetus happened in the um, 1980s when there was a downturn, but then a lot of people diversified and went into environmental ge geoscience just when a lot of EPA um, and, and um, regulations were coming into to, um, force. So it was a pretty interesting time. I mean, years ago, I was an international operations analyst for Kermagee Chemical, and Kermagee Chemical was, was an integrated company, and we had our own Superfund site. <laughs> and so a lot of the things that we're doing now remind me of the things that, that were formerly addressed by Superfund, except this is more distributed over everything. But still, it still presents this challenge of, of how on earth do you tackle these and so the, the um, AAPG has taken the position that you t tackle it by communicating, you tackle it by sharing information, you tackle it by having interdisciplinary conversations and by having focused technology that has a desired outcome. So what we've tried to do is, is look at groundwater, surface water, and also things like induced seismicity and, and also just understanding what happens when you bring together the possibility of employing new technologies? And right now we're talking about obviously things that have to do with uh, um, AI and large language models and, and, and analytics, as well as things of gathering information, et cetera. So what do we do? We have workshops, webinars, publications. Um, so that's one of the ways that we, we share information 
we also have platforms where you can continue to get in, in touch with each other. And, and for example, in meetings like this, it'd be great to have a way to get keep in touch. So not only do we have the networks that are established here, uh, feel free to do um, take it, avail yourself of the things that APG does, and you do not have to be a member. Anyway, and then just a few orphan well initiatives. And I, I took this picture, I took all these pictures, but I took this picture on this nice foggy day saying, okay, can you see the orphan well in the background? Probably not, but we're all in this mission of discovery. And so to do that, we've had um, 10 webinars on, since 2020 on orphan and abandoned wells, on, on things like methane t uh, detection, on modeling for using new technologies for modeling the subsurface, modeling cause and effect. And then I just put a list of the, the ev events that we had. Um, Mileva was, has been really uh, instrumental in getting the workshops going. We had one in August, uh, actually in, the first one was in August, 2022 in, in our annual me meeting, but then we had a dedicated one in Oklahoma City and a dedicated one in Pittsburgh, and we'll have one in March of 2025, place to be determined. <laughs> but the point is, is that in all these things, we get a chance to see not just what's going on with regulations and not what's happening in terms of, of where we are, but we find we have a chance to talk about initiatives about how to find funding for the the, uh, for example, the uh, Kimbra and, and the Department of Interior, all these opportunities for uh, tackling the, the problem. So, for example, um, Kimbra has att attended quite a few and talked about, okay, here's how the money flows. It goes to the states. Here's how to get in, in touch with people. But in order to do that and make it really effective, there's it's really important to have um, – consistency across the board and to have communication so that in each state, everybody knows where what to do. And so it's been so great today to, and yesterday to have regulators and have people from the state saying, okay, this is how things are in our state. These are the things that are required. Also, what are the rec new regulations that need to be done in order to comply with the requirements for getting the money and also being inspected. Those things are, are important and to have a database and best practices to be shared. Um, one of our webinars really focused on the best practices that were, are, were being done in Ohio and, and the, the, the databases and the, and the plugging best practices. And it was pretty interesting for people to go through and say, hey, Let's look at the different states and the different processes and the and the requirements. And they were, were um, similar, but not the same. The other thing that we've been looking at is marginal wells or future or orphans. So how to be proactive and preemptive. Then additional funding sources. Okay, we talked about traditional. Um, those are the, the bonds and the, and the companies that need to pay. Then there are the, the um, funding from Department of the Interior. And then also innovative funding sources, Dan suggested, alluded to some of these, have to do with carbon credits and the different methodologies and also developing markets. So those are the things that, that and so, um, and then also data integration and analytics, machine learning, AI, and then repurposing. So what we're seeing a lot of is, is not just the importance of open communication, but we're looking at new platforms for knowledge sharing and support. So for example, a lot there are initiatives, like Nick will talk about this, about um, orphan well at the USGS databases and classification and understanding what the differences are between the orphan wells and the wells that need to be abandoned and the, and the remediations or the interventions um, then the Department of Energy has uh, Orphan Well. I don't know how many of you know Andrew Govert, but the, one of the we're, initiatives he's working on is, again, finding unidentified um, orphan wells. 
So what we know about is basically the tip of the iceberg. And once we know about those, what do we do about it? I mean, we've, we're hearing a lot about things that are being done to, to, to find them. So that, those are things that include, um, um, obviously, FLIR technology for finding the emissions and, and drones. Also, people have talked about satellites and also um, any type of, of um, uh, airborne studies. And one of the things that, that I'm seeing at, at our new technology showcases that we have at our events and also in our, our near surface is that a lot of people are trying out new approaches, but the key is how do you work with the, the people in on the ground and how can they afford them? And are there new partnerships that are taking place to allow people to form um, approaches for finding um, finding the these the wells. How many of you have, have been taught in conversations recently about the new EPA uh, emissions requirements or uh, and how those are potentially going to push a lot of marginal operations into orphan status? How many people have felt a concern for that? Now, once that happens, it's happened. What can we do ahead of time? And how can we? How can it be possible to partner, for example, with the technology companies, with the methane detection companies, the monitoring and measurement? And how is it possible to find new ways to plug efficiently with economies of scale? So um, I wanted to go back. Whoops, this is not the one that had. I had a new presentation that had lots of pictures of of um, of the new technologies. I'm sorry, I didn't have it. I was going to show you. So the, I'll just briefly briefly uh, mention them. So one of the things I put on there is, is one of the issues that we're looking at is what do we do with the data once we have it? Once, once we have the data, how do we reconfigure our imaginations to think about things in new ways? Because what this has clearly become is not just a technology problem, but a thinking problem. How to, do we apply the knowledge that we have, for example, in, in um, modeling or what we know about water floods? In, um, I'm sorry, that I, I really apologize for having the wrong um, presentation up. But at any rate, what I, one of the things I put up it was um, taking the knowledge we know from no, water flood and what we know about fluid flow and modeling fluid flow in the subsurface, how does that affect all the other wells? How do we use that in a proactive way to, for example, identify new new orphan wells? And, and how do we do things almost like deliberately that we would say we would never want to do in the past? For example, deliberately try to trigger those wells to see what happens. What I mean, think about things in a way, a new way. If we're monitoring induced seismicity, what do we do if we deliberately try to induce seismicity? Not to say that we want to do it in real life, but what? Why not think about all those cause and effects, and then come up with new ways to tackle tackle them? So, just in a nutshell, just to to summarize the categories of, of new technologies that that at least I'm seeing, that has to do with sensors, detection. So the early, early stage, exploration, kind of following exploration. And then we're also looking at the development stage. How do we actually do the processes of, of the um, plugging effectively? And then finally, the monitoring and the new, new materials to make sure that there's inte well bore integrity and the groundwater is protected over time. So anyway, I just want to say thank you, and I'm happy to share my presentation, and I'd love to be in touch with all of you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, next is Tom. Uh, let's see the presentation for Thomas Lope. Yep. And do we have the uh, PowerPoint version pulled up, not the PDF? 
Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. I'm going to do, a, as my kids would say in the video game uh, world, a speed run through this uh, thing to try to respect the 15 minute um, time limit we have here. But basically, quick introduction uh, Thomas Lopez. I'm with ExxonMobil. I'm our PA principal. Uh, what does that mean? It means that I am responsible for our global standards. What uh, what we have to do for all of our PNAs across the globe, they're typically more strict than most regulatory requirements. Uh, I'm also involved in training, uh, technical endorsement of our more complex or sensitive or various PNAs. So uh, I'm going to talk all about. Uh, basically, I was asked to bring the perspective of what are we currently doing and where do we see PNA going, and I'll give you the sort of Exxon Mobil global perspective, and then let's try to find ways to sort of create tie points to this uh, orphaned wealth initiative. So, uh, all right, just kind of why am I here and why am I talking? You know, ExxonMobil, we have a, a, a rather large footprint in many ways. Uh, on, on Like just this year alone, I was counting it up. I know we're doing well over 2,000 PNAs uh, globally this year. Everything from one-off um, land-based PNAs to in Bass Straits in Australia offshore, we have uh, two PNA rigs, one wireline and cement pump set up. We've got a heavyweight intervention vessel and a jack-up rig coming, and we're doing 450 offshore PNAs, subsea and platform base. So we kind of span the gamut, and uh, there aren't very many plays where we haven't been involved, at least as a partner, but typically as an operator. So we bring a lot of learnings, and that's another part of my job is to sort of uh, talk with outside, with our partners, with technology companies and and sort of try to find where we can bring all these things together. So uh, I'm not going to read all the words on the slide, but um, one little disclaimer at the bottom, I'm not here to, to endorse or refute uh, the merits of every or any particular company. I just kind of give some general thoughts on, on the state of where we're at and, and what, what's currently being done. Just, just a quick review of barrier basics. I think we all know this by now, but just to give you some context for what we as ExxonMobil are trying to achieve. I mentioned it during one of the Q&A sessions. Our main objective is a restoration of the cap rock. Uh, we find that, that, you know, from our perspective, that's the way things were before the well was drilled. That's what we're trying to get back to. Um, key points here are that, you know, front, like I said, in Norsoc, the barriers are, are intended to outlive any sort of concept of how long they can be there from our perspective. These aren't meant to be done with materials that are going to, uh, let's say, degrade over time due to thermal degradation in 100 years. We have to go for things like cement, things like steel that we know in the context in which they become part of a well barrier envelope that they are going to last th literally thousands and thousands of years. So um, yeah, and basically it's going to look like this. It's got a incorporate a sufficiently long plug it's got to be placed in an impermeable cap rock the cap rock has to have sufficient strength to withstand future recharge pressures so and and of course like i said i'm going to run through these things pretty quickly so please catch me after the presentation if we don't have time during during the pna and i'll talk more about these things um uh, i wanted to talk this section a little bit on philosophy this is really again geared towards offshore but it still applies in places like this. There's plenty of places where, you know, the first bullet point there is equipment selection. You know, I, I'm, I come from an area where the original mindset is if I've got a 22 well platform to PNA, let's get that drilling rig back up and let's get it running and let's have that because then we've got the Cadillac of equipment to get the barriers in place. And, and, you know, just philosophically speaking, we've got to right size the equipment that we're using. Don't use a drilling rig. Don't spend $70 million to reactivate a rig when you can bring in a PNA unit that's a hydraulic casing jack type sort of situation or something like that. And instead of doing it for a million dollars a day, you can do it for $200,000 a day. So it, th this mindset can translate not just for offshore, but for also onshore type stuff. The other idea here is uh, using a phased approach, which just basically simply means tackle the things that you can tackle with the most efficient equipment and personnel at a time. And so if that means I'm going to do a diagnostic phase where in a field I've got 50 wells and I'm going to go around doing logging and doing some sort of uh, discovery with that unit, I'll do that first for three months. Then I'm going to come in with coil tubing if I can use that. And I'm going to utilize that for the next 
four months. Then if I need to start pulling tubulars and that sort of thing, I'm going to go up, but I'm going to stage up and I'm going to group things together and I'm going to be utilizing the smallest footprint that I can just for efficiency, safety, all the, all the things we love. Uh, the other one is just challenging the status quo with novel execution techniques. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but basically that's things like rather than running a work string in and, you know, pumping a balanced plug, why don't we look at things like through tubing cement placement? So, um, and, and this last point is something that we do engage with regulators frequently, which is identify which activities are not necessary that don't add to actual long-term well integrity. And let's, don't do extra things that don't that just add time, money, complexity, but don't actually improve the status of the PNA. So, one of these basic things we talk about and we do a lot, like I mentioned, Bass Straits already earlier, is rigless PNA. Uh, these are very simple drawings. The one on the left is basically before PNA, you've got a well, you've got casing, you've got perforations, and you've got tubing inside of it. In the middle, you show what's a typical PNA, which is I'm going to go in, I'm going to pull the packer, I'm going to run in, and I'm going to set bridge plugs, set cement plugs, and you know do things sequentially like that. Um, a rigless approach might be I go in with a very low, you know, low cost E line unit or a slick line unit. I scrape tubing, I run a brooch, I, you know, run calipers, I check everything, I go in, I set plugs. Then I punch holes on E-line and I just have a cement pump out there and I'm circulating plugs in there. And I, you can do it in ways where you leave it so that you can log it if you have to. But uh, the, the basic concept here is, and I know this, again, I'm really kind of talking offshore, but that same mentality can translate to other areas, which is find ways to do it more efficiently while still having as good or better results. Oh, and, and one thing I put here is, if you're concerned about things like contamination, well, you compensate for that with longer plugs. If I have a hundred foot requirement, well, in this case, maybe I'll put a 600 foot long plug in there to sort of have a lot of overkill. Um, one thing that affects us quite a bit offshore, and I know, you know, we, we've we recently acquired like Denberry, who is a conventional, um, well, sort of conventional operator in the, in the domestic U.S. and, and, one of the things I find talking with them is there's a lot of parallel points there where they have issues with, let's say they can't get a tubing string out of the hole. Let's say they can't get a casing string out of the hole, whatever the case may be. And we have this, this, this one on the left kind of illustrates a case where you have, uh, let's say that's your nine and five eighths production casing or whatever the size is, but you, you're uncertain about that cement quality that's across the cap rock in your confining shale. So um, you know, what do we typically do in a contemporary approach? You may perforate and try to circulate uh, some cement around the backside. You may perf and squeeze. There's a number of things you could do. You could try section milling. And I don't know how operational folks are here, but typically in section milling, um, that that one on the left that says poor annular cement, that's the original situation. The second diagram is what I was talking about, where you punch and you circulate cement up the backside Perf and squeeze is the third one. Section milling is you literally go in and you're taking a, a bit or a mill and you're milling a hundred foot window to remove casing. It's long, it's slow, it uh, creates a lot of swarf material that you have to handle at surface. It's, um, it, it's just not a lot of fun. It can take way too long. So you know, just to give you some idea of sort of what are the technologies that we use offshore, Offshore, uh, we, we've started using in quite a few places around the globe what we call perf wash and cement. The elevator speech version is that we punch holes uh, across the interval. You can kind of see it here in green. Uh, and then we pump cement through that, uh, across that interval. We may go drill it out and log it after the fact. But there's, you know, a number of different things that you can try to apply in order to get that annular barrier in the backside. The other one, and somebody mentioned this before when we were talking about long-term, is the concept of crep shale, which I've used when I worked in Norway, which is we identified through DCM uh, what are the what are the the shales that are ductile and that over short periods of time are going to creep in and actually reform a natural seal around the casing. It's pretty common in certain certain areas, and so you just have to have systems in place where you can identify where that's going to be, you can log it, you can punch holes and pressure test it, and you can come up with methods. What's on the on the horizon, you can see these kind of interesting cartoons over here. One of the techniques people are working on is something called casing ablation, 
which is literally trying to vaporize the casing using uh, propellant. Uh, another one that's come along is there's a company in Germany working on a uh, coil tubing, uh, erosional milling, where it's doing it all through abrasives. These are alternate ways to, uh, to, to put windows in there where you can restore. You know, ultimately, what do we have in all these cases? We have a plug inside the casing and we have a rock to rock barrier. Okay, zipping along. Uh, another thing that's been utilized a lot offshore, and I've seen onshore, there are places where we can try to start utilizing this, is cement bond logging tools. Uh, traditional ones, you can only, uh, if you want to know what's behind the casing to evaluate it because the cementing records are poor or whatever, you've got to remove a packer, you've got to remove tubing, then you go in with a either an ultrasonic or a traditional acoustic uh, thing to figure out where your good cement is. Uh, a number of companies have a number of different approaches where they are utilizing um, a combination of, of techniques or some new processing or some new equipment where they're doing what they call through tubing. So they can run it through the tubing without pulling it and find out what's behind casing. Uh, this is not a super mature technology. And there are certain things that you need to understand through a lot of the a lot of the techniques, there's some machine learning involved in some of them. You have to understand the exact combination you have of casing sizes, tubing sizes, weights, cement grades, formation slowness. There's a lot of information that needs to be taken into account, but these are emerging technologies that are going to enable both onshore and offshore uh, the ability to do things uh, without having as much equipment on site, basically. That's a simple way to put it. I'm not going to talk about all uh, alternate abandoned materials, but one thing that was asked about to me was uh, either bismuth plugs or thermite-based plugs. I'll skip to the to the punchline, which is there are two companies, one based in Norway and another based in eh, sort of in the U.S. Uh, that are both kind of converging around similar solutions, which is A, running in hole with a thermite uh, tool, the thermite will basically get up to, I think it's like 3,500 degrees Celsius or 25, oh, there it is, 2,500 degrees Celsius, and it will melt everything. That tool will melt the tubing. It'll melt any residual cement. It'll it'll melt casing. It'll even melt formation. The issue is first generations of these tools, it'll form a pug or almost like a slag kind of melted thing, but it's not gas tight. And so there have been issues with that's not really a, a sealing material, but both of these companies are sort of converging on the same solution, which is first do this thermite plug to create the window, then have a bismuth plug, which is a molten metal alloy that will then sit on top of it, conform, and it it's 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 corrosion resistance. It uh, like ice, it swells when it cools, so it it'll expand and sort of create a tension, which keeps it in place. Um, the only thing that's sort of less attractive about that to me is the fact that um, uh, it, it creates a very small plug. Instead of hundreds of feet of cement, you only have a couple of feet of cement. And so you, if you have uh, issues in your in your cap rock, um, natural fractures or something like that, it's not as uh, dummy proof. Uh, one other thing I'll just briefly touch on because I have one and a half minutes. I'm taking the 15th. Uh, is uh, <laughs> things like uh, uh, leaking channels. And, and, and there's a number of companies trying to solve this through very similar ways. You can see the simple cartoons here on the left. This is my idiot's version of if there's holes inside of whatever cement or whatever you have, they're trying to plug the holes by pumping things that pump through like water, but then over time solidify. One of them is biomineralization. Uh, and they basically pump in bacteria and things that'll convert the salts in the fluid to uh, to a solid plug. Um, there's companies that are looking on basically doing mineral scale, and it's basically barium sulfate formation, pumping incompatible waters down there. And as it goes down in there, it's going to do the same thing. It's like uh, arteries clogging, basically. There's another company uh, based in the UK that's doing the same thing with dissolvable glass. They take glass, they dissolve it in a fluid or in a, in a solution, they pump it down hole and it pre precipitates as it, as it comes in contact. Another one uh, that Maleva is familiar with is uh, another way to kind of go about solving some of these microannula, microannulus issues is to actually go in. Shell has worked with some companies and licensed out some technology where they go in and they basically create dents in the casing 
that uh, expand and it compacts the actual cement back there to eliminate these channels. And she can tell you a lot more about the chemistry of it. Um, that's the very short version. I apologize. I couldn't be less clear. Um, but uh, I guess the couple takeaways that I really just wanted to point out here is that, you know, there's a lot of ways to plug and abandon a well. At the very top point is the quality has to be, always be as good or better than your traditional techniques. So, you know, barrier quality is first and foremost. But then beyond that, we do need to have continual gains in efficiency, safety, all of those sorts of things. Different ways to solve problems that would otherwise create compromises in those plug and abandonment operations. Um, the second point is one that I think is really vital to me, which I love being in the plug and abandonment space because I meet with a lot of our competitors and we have very collaborative discussions on this. We don't consider plug and abandonment to be a, uh, a competitive space. We consider it to be somewhere where we can help each other get better and to kind of, it's the rising tide lifts all boats. Sounds naive, but it's true. Um, the other thing about doing it more efficiently means in a case like this, you have a fixed budget, the more efficiently we can do it, the more, the more wells we can get plugged. So we just got to find the right solutions and the right equipment to do it. And then the last thing is companies, universities, governments, we all need to work together to, uh, support, promote, and test the new technologies that are coming out. So that's all I have. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to have these out real quick while they get slides up. Uh, yeah, yeah, give me that. Okay. Show, and tell. Show and tell time. This is for all you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You want them all? Just have fun. <laughs> this is uh, uh, one. Okay, we are not allowed to have <laughs> it's almost like you you can make jewelry out of this. <laughs> That's compressed. Um, I will. So, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna blow through this uh, kind of wild and shoot, which is pretty much my nature anyway. Uh, this is uh, which way does the clicker go? This way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's Novolac. Yeah, don't don't. I I it'll stay plugged. Yeah, you're, you're not supposed you. to be the you know distracted from the talk. Okay? That's okay. That's okay. I'm gonna go through this. So, well, it's it's Zonite. Yeah. Oh no, no, that's that's not Zonite, but uh, it it worked. Um, so I, I know we're supposed to be talking about all good news in this se session, but I got to show you something. So I, I've seen everybody show their worst abandonment. So what you're looking at there is what I consider to be the worst abandonment. Uh, what you're looking at is Beverly Hills on the upper right hand or upper left hand corner. You see Century City Towers in the background, the uh, duplicates of the Twin Towers that came down. Uh, in the middle of that picture is a 90-foot hole down to an MTA tunnel that's going under Beverly Hills High School, uh, intersecting a 100-year-old well on the other side of the fence. Yeah, <laughs> for those of us who have suffered with this, uh, that, that's what you're looking at. So it was a real challenge. But what's more important is in that same picture in the far left, you see another uh, Derek in the background, and that Derek is on 19 wells in a well cellar on Beverly Hills High School. And that became my two-year laboratory for alternate materials to solve various problems that we encountered. Um, is this working or am I pushing that? Okay, so how does it, this is my favorite. So you guys talk about how to find a, a problem well. You see that little bit of mud there? That's that's tunneling, that's boring mud from a tunneling machine that showed up right under one of the uh, high school buildings that was being restored as a historical site. <laughs> so uh, I, I was going to say, you know, the thing about wells, it's location, location, location when it comes to abandoning these wells. A lot of urban, I know that we deal a lot with rural wells and typically if somebody comes to me with a problem rural well, I don't view it as 
particularly difficult other than the technical requirements of just achieving the abandonment. But the logistics just don't preclude using traditional means uh, typically. Uh, if you want to find an orphan well in the L.A. Basin, psh, dig a pool or a basement. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, my go-to document. This is the Prutzman 1919 map showing all of L.A. before they built anything, and the wells are there in the uh, map that oftentimes people don't even realize. So this is what it looks like when you first encounter a, a hole that you dig and you find shot-off casing. Uh, this this really stumped us for a while. We were wondering who in the hell would shoot off casing at the surface. But what it really turned out to be was a piece of casing that they had shot off and then turned it upside down and shoved it down the hole. Uh, so <laughs> just to make it interesting. And we spent a lot of money to pull that piece of casing safely just to find out it wasn't even uh, connected. So, you know, here's the thing. What's the most dangerous well that you're going to see out there? It's probably, in my view, a well that's in a recovering field because you know the, the pressure recovery becomes the issue and if the wells in uh, uh, he still has like a well head on it but no valves or no ga or no gauges you better watch out because you're going to penetrate a pressure barrier and you better be ready for it uh orphan wells uh, they everybody thinks they have a good accounting of the orphan wells Neither of these wells has shown up on the orphan list, I can tell you, because I got the calls on them. Uh, this, th they have many brothers and sisters on these leases. One was because the owner died and basically left the site. And it was being, that, that site was being produced by a pumper who was just making a killing, just never had to report the oil to anybody or anything else. And then the other one was my favorite, which is a church acquired the property. And, and churches always seem to get stuck with the worst wells. If you know anything about the uh, St. James facility in downtown L.A., it's actually uh, on church property. So I, I always like to, when, when I'm of basically nine minds when somebody brings a well to me and I'm trying to constantly triage the well before we ever get anything done, contracts, anything, just to know what's, what's the real issue here. Are you trying to reduce methane or are you trying to deal with an acute hazardous problem? And, you know, some wells, you just want to get them plugged just to get them off the list. This is th this to me is the real teller when it's urban abandonments that you're doing, and that is the time on the well is all time that you have risk. Uh, when you first go in the well, you have your usual risks of just encountering pressure, running through junk. And when you're coming back out of the well, you run the risk of swabbing in. This is, for those of you who know what Dow RGC-10 was, this was in Marina Del Rey, and it came as a surprise to the... Uh, rig operators um it it was not good it wasn't as bad as aliso canyon but it was not good going back to pressure recovery i think that what we have all learned this uh, in, in the past maybe two decades is that just because you finished pumping a well doesn't mean that it's got no pressure behind it and you can walk away and it'll always stay depressurized uh standing has never been proven wrong for those of you who are uh, uh, chemical engineers, petroleum engineers, you know who standing is. And as, as long as there are uh, fluids left in the reservoir that are in any way reflective of the original uh, composition, it's going to come to a new pressure and, and rebalance itself. So know the conditions of those wells. Uh, oh, well-to-well -well communication. This is a real booger, and that's why we actually have a lot of the... Uh, 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 the the uh, hydrocarbons uh, seals that we have on here that are like um, Novolac. And and so this is, you know, we when, when we urbanized, we tried to get everybody to put wells into a common well cellar, which is a good idea until they start getting old and then they start communicating. And um, it, you don't know where they are because they're directional and they, uh, they can communicate anywhere and one of the things we did is we actually developed a, a, a way to identify which wells were communicating because they all weren't. And as we were coming out the hole with one well, we would monitor the pressure in all the other wells at the same time and then get basically a unit vector 
of relationship and then do a statistical analysis and see which wells were likely performing relative to one well as we were abandoning it. And then we had to go back and re-abandon wells because the top plugs were getting too much pressure behind them because of the communication. Because just because you're plugging the one well in that multi-well well seller, well it, it can be a, a problem. So, oh, casing. So there's here's that picture of that same piece of casing. And the reason I always keep this, this is my pet casing, is that it, um, it shows what you can expect from casing in terms of corrosion. And, and I, I don't trust casing as a rule. I do trust cavity shots. Uh, so this is some of that Novolac that we had to use. It does a beautiful job. It, it, it's hard to manage. It's hard to work with. But you can actually use it to seal microannuli if you, if you can calculate what the sort of a, a, a pseudo uh, a aperture looks like uh, as a synthetic calculation. You can determine how much volume you need to put in a given uh, well plug. It's, it's a little difficult. Sodium silica, we were talking about water glass. I tried it. I, I, for you guys who are believers in water glass, best of luck. I tried it in, in, in those wells and could never get a successful seal of the microannuli because it's hard to get it to cook off in any kind of predictable manner. I tried all kinds of concentrations of acid. I tried all kinds of concentrations of uh, alkalis. It just doesn't want to go. So this is a, a failed uh, effort with, with uh, cement. It We bubble tested it. It failed. We put Novolac on it, but didn't monitor our pressure, and it failed. The, the trick with anything that you're going to do with a cement plug is pressure control. Uh, I did get Novolac to work successfully to, to plug the microannuli. It's tricky. It's hard, but it's worth it if you have a problem that you have to do it with. Uh, use a lot of sand because the stuff is hot and the sand is actually a heat sink for it. Uh, in combination with nanoparticles, it'll bond to steel like you can't imagine. Uh, for cement, it, it, yesterday I heard people complaining about cement quality and I'm with you. I actually made the, uh, the, the cement company tear down one of their pieces, their cement mixing truck and replumb it so that I could not get wet tags because I kept getting in the course of all the plugs that I did, I was getting wet tags and there's just, so we redesigned the, the piping so that they could get a consistent uh, plug. Uh, notwithstanding that, I, I will tell you the best thing I've seen so far in terms of cement uh, in, is, is latex. If you wanna use something as an additive that will help you preclude gas, it's, it's latex, that stuff's good. So here's here's the 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 replumbed uh, mixing truck that I had them do, um, and and then you know telling you guys that project control is is a real trick here. Uh, I'm not going to work, but but I will tell you I think that one of the things that that we see is the top of hydrocarbons a critical seal other than the base of freshwater and the USDW. If we spent all of our effort and money just sealing the top of the productive hydrocarbon layer and not get stuck down hole trying to fish out to TD and then plug old productive intervals, I think we'd all be a lot happier when we're trying to plug 100,000 wells instead of two or 3,000 wells. And we have a lot of wells to do, and I don't think we, we should use the same uh, drivers. In fact, one of the things that I think well, I would love for API to come out with is a series of recommended practices for various wells of various types and actually give us something that we can all sort of use at the private sector level, at the regulatory sector. And if you comply with those minimum RP requirements, you know, you're given some certainty that you can actually walk away from that well comfortable that it's met regulatory requirements and technical requirements. And then coupled with other uh, elements can be used in a market where people are relying on that well-being plug to assign emissions reduction credits, for instance. So you have some criteria that you can pass a test and, and it becomes almost a financial or an, a, an institutional instrument. Oh, 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 I did, I, I blew through that too fast. Plan A is important, always have a plan A. 
if you're on a well, you better have a plan B or you're going to be there extra long because plan A's fail. And you better have a plan C. And plan D is called wild well controls and run like hell or boots and coots. And, and probably the, the, the other thing that I, I can say is that when you're encountering a difficult well, I know we all try to stay on top of the well, but sometimes it's a good idea to just intercept the well and get a drill collar severance tool. And instead of perforating, just, just intercept the well, shoot it with a drill collar severance tool and squeeze a, a, a balanced plug, work your way up. I've, I've done it with a problem well or two and it just goes like clockwork. It's very predictable because now you're in control of the process and you're not dealing with encountering everything inside the old casing and the old uh, well bore. So uh, I, my, my quick suggestions are, you know, um, set up a GHG bounty on these orphans because everybody wants to do this, but if there's no money in it or if it's all liability, no one's going to mess with it. And the regulator is going to try and do it and we won't get we won't get as much practice as we need to. Uh, the rational requirements, uh, don't trust casing. Don't trust casing. I, I believe that casing's bound to corrode and, and perfing it and then squeezing cement behind it. It'll work, but don't be surprised if you don't pass some test on that uh, seal. Uh, rational uh, criteria for liability protections. Uh, I think I think ultimately we should set up a, a, a like a a, a national uh, almost like the Resolution Trust Corporation that can absorb the liabilities of these wells if all the criteria are met and the owner of the well or the party that's doing the well pays into this institution uh, the quasi governmental institution and they take the liability and you're never stuck with it so that it doesn't drop onto your balance sheet as a contingent liability. Because no companies, if, if I were the manager of environmental affairs for a company and they said they were going to do it, I'd say, hell no, you're going to put that stuff into a, uh, a contingent liability. It's going to show up on the balance sheet. We don't want to do that. And, and then, uh, you know, equipment qualifications and training. I, I think that's, again, the IADC, I think, could, could do a lot to carry that water. SPE can do a lot to carry the water. API can do a lot to carry that water. And, and the regulatory bodies should set reasonable expectations for the equipment that shows up on site, because there's nothing more aggravating than somebody shows up on site, ill-trained or ill-equipped, and you're stuck with them on that hole until you can figure out some resolution in plan B. Oh, did I? I oh, oh, and for the, those of you who are clapping, you're misled. No, I'm just <laughs> So that's it. I think that that my last one is uh, is just filler. There it is, right there. Is just take the liability and help us. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Um, so what you've got is compressed bentonite. The little balls is compressed bentonite. That stuff will expand to twenty five percent its volume, and 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 it it is it's bentonite. It's got a very very uh, low permeability. And you just throw those things down the hole. If it's a shallow well, you pour hot water on it and stand back in about a day. You're going to have toothpaste-like material coming out of the well, top to bottom. Just cut it off, seal the well. And as long as you don't have a washout problem with flowing waters and, and groundwaters, it's going to stay. If, if I had, if I had, if I was king of the world, I would shoot a cavity shot below a, a, a seal that you want to make, squeeze cement throw those in it, do another one, and have basically a, a bentonite, compressed bentonite environment that if there's ever a ground, and that I didn't come up with that. That's actually based on work that was done for the nuclear repository. So I'm, I'm as comfortable about with that as I am with the nuclear repository. They, uh, uh, that, was, that was good. Uh, okay, all right. So there's not a lot of nuclear plant <laughs> operators in this crowd. Maybe we uh, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I come from the, I, I was a nuclear plant operator. So for me, the nuclear repository makes sense. The other stuff is Novolac. It's a uh, bisphenol plastic. It's, it's uh, thermal setting. You actually have to fill it with sand. You use about, oh my gosh, about 16 times more sand volumetrically than you use of Novolac because it has to have a heat sink. And then you use nanoparticles, fumed silica, and the fumed silica, this again was a, a DOE 
I, I, I learned about this because DOE was doing some work on precluding uh, CO2 uh, in, in uh, CO2 injection cases. And this is, this is what they found to be the superior material for bonding against casing. And they, and they actually, you can see, uh, I, I can send you, anybody who wants it, I can send you the papers, they're DOE's papers. Uh, and that's, uh, and then, oh, the, the, the other piece was a smaller piece, and that was uh, a, a piece of class G cement. And it's actually mixed with, are you guys ready for this? It's mixed with ground up wind turbine blades. Now for all of you guys <laughs> who wonder what in the heck you're gonna do with a, with a wind turbine blade post life, I, I live in Kern County. I put a bunch of wind turbines in place. I was the noise modeler for the companies and they tore down a lot of wind turbines and they, uh, they wanted to know what to do with the blades. This is one alternative. I'm not saying it's the only one, but if you mix it with the Novolac, the epoxies that were used to form the wind turbine blade that is also crushed up with the ground glass, bond like you can't imagine. You throw fused silica in there and it I, I don't know if it'll last forever, but if you have microannuli and you got to chase them out, that's a good one to use. So I'm sorry, I think I ran over my time. I'm in trouble. No, I think Nathan is in trouble. <laughs> Okay, um, now we're going to move to geochemistry and what we can learn from these orphan wells. And Nick is going to tell us all about that. Thank you, Malema. My name is Nick Tanuchis. I'm the project chief of the USGS Orphan Wells Project. And today I'm going to talk about science to support orphan well plugging. The USGS has created a series of science products that can be useful for well pluggers in decision-making processes. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the age of orphan wells, the Produce Waters database, and then we're gonna look a little bit at the corrosivity of groundwater. First, we're gonna start with some background. The first commercial oil well in the United States was drilled in 1859 in Pennsylvania. And since then, our country has a 160-year legacy of drilling and abandonment across the nation. Today, most abandoned wells are plugged with cement at the end of their life, but however, many wells remain unplugged. An orphan well is defined as an unplugged, non-producing oil and gas well that has no responsible owner or party to remediate the well site. This leaves the burden of plugging and reclamation to the local, state, or federal governments, and occasionally landowners and other organizations. Plugging with cement became the standards in the 1950s. So wells that were abandoned before that time are gen generally considered insufficiently plugged and orphaned. Today, there are about 150,000 documented orphan wells in the US. And as Kimber Davis told us yesterday, over uh, about 8,000 have been plugged with bill funds. And uh, yesterday, Lori Roddenberry updated our numbers that there's an estimated 250,000 to 750,000 undocumented wells that remain. And the median cost of plugging a well varies. Uh, one study in 2021 pegged that number at $76,000. Yesterday, Adam Peltz gave us a number of $65,000, and the IOGCC was estimating $40,000. And the reasons that these estimates vary depends on the depth of the well, the age, the era in which they were drilled, and where they're located. Orphan wells come in all shapes and sizes from, you know, over a century of drilling all across the country. And depending on where you're at and the age and the depth, you're going to have different approaches for plugging them. In 2022, the USGS released the first publicly available national scale data set that contains 117,000 orphan wells from across the country. This data set was collected by reaching out to 27 individual states, asking for their list of orphan wells and putting them together in a national scale data set. It contains API numbers, lead longs, and other information that was provided by the states. This represents a snapshot in time from about two years ago 
every month new wells are documented, every month old orphan wells are plugged. So it's constantly changing. But this data set gives us a, a glimpse in time to do some analysis. Here I've taken the wells from, the, from this data set and I've gone in and I've looked at the spud date for each well and mapped them across the US. Uh, green is some of the oldest wells, red is some of the newer wells. And so what we can see is if we look up in the Appalachian Basin around Pennsylvania and Ohio, where the first uh, commercial drilling began, we have the oldest orphan wells in the United States. We also have some very old wells in Southern California where Jesse was just talking about, also some in Oklahoma. And then when we look at some of the newest wells that have been orphaned, we see some in Texas, Wyoming, and up in North Dakota. Uh, the Bakken actually has a couple hundred orphan wells that are horizontally drilled and hydraulically fractured from only a few years ago. So they, uh, there's a wide span of wells and timeline across the nation. Uh, this is a graph showing all the wells in the orphan well database that we could find a spud or completion date for. On the bottom is the year that these wells were drilled. This is not the year that they were orphaned. It's when they were drilled and then they went on to be orphaned at some point in the future. And uh, this is the same graph that, that Greg Lackey showed earlier today and did a really good job by showing the different uh, drilling standards throughout the decades. Um, but I want to look at it today as, as showing the eras that have the most orphan wells. Um, we can see that throughout our nation's history, at times when there was an energy demand and oil prices were high, like World War II in the 1940s, like the energy crisis in the 1980s, a lot more wells were drilled and a higher percentage of those wells went on to become orphaned. And the orange line here has a different scale on the right. That's the total number of wells. It indicates on a different scale, the total number of wells that were drilled across the country. And so what we see is that the orphan well trend tends to follow the total number of wells. That for any given year, there's a percentage of wells that are gonna be orphaned regardless of how many wells were drilled that year. Except in the 1980s during the energy crisis, we see a higher percentage of wells. Then if we take the same plot and we have on the x-axis the years the wells were drilled, and on the y-axis we have the depth going from zero to 25,000 feet. We can see that over time, well depth has increased as technology has improved. Uh, the gray dots represent uh, vertical wells, which represents 98% of the database. The blue dots represent directional wells, and then the orange dots represent horizontal wells. And I do want to note that for the horizontal wells, um, this is total depth, not total vertical depth, and that's why they appear so deep. Uh, the deepest well in the database is actually in Oklahoma, it's 23,431 feet deep uh, and was drilled in the 1980s. So this is what, you know, this is what we're looking at. Um, let's keep going. All right, let's talk a little bit about water. You know, if the goal is to produce a well plug that's going to last for thousands of years, I think it's helpful to understand the environment that that well plug is going to be placed in. So the USGS Produced Waters Geochemical Database contains over 100,000 samples of produced waters across the nation. It's been compiled over many decades and includes, includes uh, sampling and analysis done by the USGS and published sources. Samples include uh, constituents and total dissolved solids and other information. Let's see. Uh, the geochemical database is available online. It has a, a user interface, so you can go in and you can look for a certain area where you might be working or a formation that you might be plugging in. Uh, it also can be very helpful because it contains other information like lithium and other critical minerals that may be of value. And this might help aid uh, repurposing of work from those. And then the last thing that I want to talk about today is earlier this year, we created a groundwater quality data set that takes the 117,000 orphan wells I showed in the first couple slides 
and the USGS National Water Information System, which is a, a database of groundwater quality measurements. And we looked for all groundwater quality measurements within one mile or less of an orphan well. And so what we have shown on this map, all the blue dots are where we have water quality measurements within a mile. All the orange dots are where we have water quality measurements within one mile, I'm sorry, within 100 meters of an orphan well. And the database contains water quality parameters like pH, temperature, total dissolved solids, uh, and other corrosivity indicators like calcium, chloride, bromine, and et cetera. When we started this study, we were really interested in looking at the impacts that orphan wells may have on groundwater quality. But then we started thinking about what are the impacts that groundwater quality is having on orphan wells. And so this is a map from the database of corrosivity. This is the Langelier Saturation Index, uh, which is an indication of corrosivity. The yellow dots are the highest or the most corrosive areas in the country. The purple and dark areas are less corrosive. And what we can see here is that the Appalachian Basin, again, where some of our oldest wells and where most of our wells are, actually has some of the most corrosive groundwater in the country. Uh, there's also some corrosivity in Louisiana and Oklahoma. And we're actually seeing this in the field. If you look on the top right photo, this is an orphan well in Montana. This is one of the Well Done Foundation wells uh, that we went out and worked on last summer. And the casing in these wells is in great shape. Um, you can actually see on some of them the, the date stamped on the casing. And these wells were drilled in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, the bottom right is a well from Hillman State Park, just outside of Pittsburgh in the Appalachian Basin. Uh, and it's a totally different story. You know, these, these wells are, have a lot of rust, a lot of deterioration, and are a different condition. So I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is, you know, areas of high corrosivity are going to have wells that deteriorate faster and also can pose a higher risk or a quicker risk to our groundwater. So in summary, during the 165 year history of petroleum exploration in the United States, millions of oil and gas wells have been drilled, resulting in thousands, hundreds of thousands of unplugged orphan wells today. Over time, drilling practices and techniques have improved with technological advancement, presenting a different set of challenges to well pluggers based on the location, era, geology, and geochemistry of each orphan well. Understanding these differences is key when making plugging decisions. The goal of the USGS Orphan Wells Project is, con is to conduct research and create scientific products to better understand the nature of orphan well emissions and aid efforts to plug orphan wells. The USGS has created multiple orphan well publications and data sets containing well locations, well ages, groundwater quality, and produce water's geochemistry that may be useful when plugging orphan wells. Uh, these are the publications that I showed today. In the top left is the orphan well data set. Uh, we're currently working with the orphan well program office to update this. Uh, we hope to have an update out later this year that will contain new information from the states about new wells that have been documented and orphan wells that have been plugged. Um, in the middle is the groundwater quality near orphan wells database that was published earlier in this year, January. Top right is the USGS produced water <laughs> geochemical database, which you can access online. Uh, and then the other graphs came from a, a report that we put out and a paper that was published in Science of the Total Environment. So I just want to say it's been a real honor uh, to be here and speak today. If you guys have any uh, thoughts or feedback, or if you have any problems finding this data, please feel free to reach out to me. You know, a lot of these ideas for our products come from you, from conversations that we've had at conferences and workshops. So we're always looking for suggestions and good ideas. So if you have any feedback, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lots of great information and resources. So thank you for that. Okay. All right. Um, 
a last presentation. Eric is going to um, try and convince us that we can have actually indefinitely sound barriers if we go back to geology, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Let's hear yeah. that. And I want to thank Mileva for saving the very best to last. That's very nice of you to do that. Yeah. Was <laughs> humble. Sorry, what was that? The Englishman. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. So I'm going to talk about uh, isolating annuli using shale salt as a barrier, uh, which creates this nice acronym SAB. And I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. And the coolest thing that you can do in Holland was to own a Swedish car called a Saab, a Saab 900. Take a look at those. Those are incredibly cool. They're no longer made. But it's, a, it's, it's definitely a Saab story. Good. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm a professor at, at UT where I specialize in drilling and well construction. But I've actually spent the majority of my career working for Shell, the Shell Oil Company, uh, 20 years there, uh, working in a number of uh, managerial and, and technical positions. And at UT, I um, am the director of a consortium called RAPID, which stands for Rig Automation and Performance Improvement in Drilling. And RAPID is really kind of focusing on hardcore drilling and drilling automation. But we have a branch, and you see that on the right, that uh, deals with sustainability. We actually had a separate consortium called CODA uh, that we've merged with, uh, with RAPID. And uh, we work on well PNA and well integrity issues, uh, as well as a host of other things there. And uh, my partner in crime is uh, Dr. Maria Junger of our civil engineering department. And uh, I think some of you may know Maria. Maria is, is making me look respectable. That's it. Uh, as, a, as far as kind of funding for RAPID, we've never had any government funding. We never had DOI uh, DO, uh, and DOE funding, uh, NSF funding. Um, not for a lack of trying, I would say, but uh, we've been very well supported by, by industry, uh, both by oil and gas companies, large and small um, operators and, and contractors. And I want to particularly mention these three companies, uh, Arker BP, Equinor, and Total Energies. And they have really been the big promoters of this Saab work that we're doing at UT. And you'll see in a moment why, because this finds a big application in uh, the North Sea, where it's kind of enabling rigless offshore abandonments. OK, um, I was in Italy earlier this summer, and so were all of you. I saw you there, right? Everybody's going to Italy these days. And why not? It's a fantastic, fantastic place to be. And I, I visited Pompeii. And um, Pompeii is, is, is a marvel, right? It's uh, incredible that so much of it is still standing after the pyroclastic flows from the uh, uh, eruption of Mount Vesuvius in uh, AD 79, and then 2,000 years of neglect thereafter. Um, and what you can conclude from this is that cement is an incredibly good building material, right? Is it a great isolation material? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, here you see kind of a uh, comparison between uh, ordinary Portland cement, OPC, and, and geopolymers. We do a lot of work on geopolymers in my group. And uh, you have the high compressive strength of OPC, but then you have all these other things there where OPC is actually inferior to geopolymer. And if you're not familiar with geopolymers, geopolymers are alkali activated materials uh, that are made, for instance, from, from fly ash. Um, one uh, of the of the things that is different between geopolymers and, and OPC, you see over here on the right, these are permeability curves. Uh, if you look at the permeability of cement, you typically get a permeability of about 1 to 10 microdosies, which is really good and low. But if you damage the cement and then let it sit and reheal, it doesn't reheal. Right? OPC doesn't do that. Uh, Roman cement actually does, but OPC doesn't. Uh, geopolymers, if you damage them, they reheal, so they have a natural tendency to reheal. So one of the things that we're already talking to operators about is replace your abandonment plugs uh, from going from OPC to geopolymers, right? A lot better. Also, a difference between them is that the bone strength, so the casing to cement bone strength, is about 10 times as high on a geopolymer than it is on OPC. 
And this is this is the problem mainly with uh, with OPC. I'll show you that in a moment. One key question is how stable and isolating are these materials? Both OPC and geopolymer are going to be over thousands of years, kind of an indefinite time period that we would like to abandon for. Operators in the North Sea have started to use this time scale of 3,000 years or 1 million days that they want to design for. And if anybody tells you that they know how cement is going to behave over a time period of 3,000 years, they're lying. Nobody really knows. Uh, you can't do accelerated aging tests with OPC. If you go to higher temperatures, you actually change the topology and the mineralogy of cement. Uh, so you can't speed up the, uh, the aging. Um, the problem, of course, with cement, uh, and you see that here, and you've seen this uh, versions of this graph over the last uh, two days, is that there might be leak paths forming, particularly, as I said, the casing to cement bond strength is weak. So you can form microannuli quite easily, both on the plug side as well as on the annular side. And, um, and then you have cracks in the cement, uh, maybe that won't reheal. Um, so this is, this is the problem. And uh, this is typically happens, for instance, because of pressure and temperature cycling in wells, um, uh, different expansion coefficients of uh, casing and, and cement leading to cement cracking and debonding and creating a microannulus that becomes a pathway for flow. Now, is there a solution to this? There is, and it is rather strange. And if you've never seen this before, you probably won't believe me when you see it f at first. But about 15 years ago, uh, North Sea operators were re-entering wells for abandonment and running case hole uh, logs, case hole uh, uh, bond logs, and finding great bonding way above the top of cement. Just on the bond logs, it looked like something had bonded really strongly to the casing. And initially, they thought that this was sagged out mud or collapsed hole formation. It turned out to be only happening in shale formations. And I'll show you in a moment what the mechanism was behind it. So you know, on the left, you see beautiful um, uh, cement bond log there. Um, on the right, you actually see a very nice image uh, where you have a shale formation that is bonded and then has some carbonate stringers in between. And the carbonates are not bonded, right? So the carbonates show no bonding, uh, but the shale is actually contacting the pipe. And what these operators did was they actually perforated um, below and above this interval, they put a packer in between and pressure tested the annulus and it holds. It forms a very good hydraulic seal. It is a barrier. And in fact, these barriers right now are being accepted by North Sea regulators. So uh, Offshore UK and in Norsoc D010, um, these barriers are actually recognized as, as being competent barriers. What is, um, here's another kind of beautiful experiment that was done by RKBP. They really invested some time here. Um, this is a situation where we, they, this is on a new well, uh, where they actually looked at a bond log over a period of time. So they followed a shale interval behind casing for a period of 45 days. And you actually see the bond forming in, in time. Now, the process behind it, the mechanism behind that, is creep. And when I say creep, I don't mean Nathan Meehan. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so creep is the process of viscoplastic deformation of a rock. Uh, that sounds really uh, complicated. So basically, in, in, in layman's terms, is a rock thinking that's a liquid and floats. And you see the simulations here. These are simulations of rock creep, uh, kind of closing in an annulus. This is actually a simulation of a nine and five eight inch casing in twelve and a quarter inch hole, where we know that the shale can come in and and form an annular seal. And the great thing about this, that the idea behind this is that maybe you've heard this term, kind of restoring the cap rock, right, or replacing the cap rock. This is actually replacing the cap rock with actual cap rock. I mean, what, what better can you get, right? Instead of having a material there that you artificially introduce, and you don't know how it's going to behave over a period of um, an indefinite time period, you actually have the cap rock there. Fantastic. Okay. 
we started investigating this um, phenomenon um, uh, uh, over a couple of years ago. We started there. We built uh, several of these big rock mechanics uh, test setups. Uh, you see them here. What we do is we take cylindrical shale samples. We put it in a core holder. We have uh, a casing insert in the middle. We have an annular space between them. We can confine the rock um, and apply downhole stresses and temperature to it. And then we can see how it behaves if it indeed closes in this annulus. So this is what it looks like in terms of the sample. You see the uh, cylindrical shale sample from the top with um, the casing. There's a solid insert that we're using for that and the open annular space initially. Uh, we've mounted it all there in the um, in the test cell, we have a top and a bottom platen with reservoirs in there that are communicated initially through the uh, annulus. And then we put it into the triaxial tester and we can apply it at downhole pressures and, and temperatures. And then what we do see is the textbook behavior of creep, right? Creep in the literature, in the rock mechanics literature is very well described. And we see perfect primary and secondary creep that fills in the annulus. So in the end, the annulus is perfectly filled in and we have formed a great barrier. Now, how good that barrier is, I'll show you that in a moment. Um, while we're doing the test, uh, we have this sale sample sitting there between that, that there's those top and bottom platens and those have fluid reservoirs in them. And those are initially in communication across the annulus, right? So if we raise, for instance, the uh, pressure in the um, uh, top reservoir, you immediately see communication on the downstream reservoir. That's that upper left plot that you see. But then when the annulus fills in, the communication between the two reservoirs is broken. And if you now raise the pressure on the upstream side, it, it there's a delayed transfer, pressure diffusion to the downstream side. And from those curves, from those three other curves, you can actually track the development of the permeability of the barrier in time. And what happens is that when the barrier forms, it has pretty much the same permeability as a cement barrier. But then over time, you see the time scale kind of lengthens and the permeability goes back to what the native shale permeability is. And uh, I, I already told you, cement barrier has a permeability of about one to 10 microdarcies. Shale has a permeability of one to 10 nanodarcies. So that's a thousand times less. Right? It's a thousand times better as a barrier. What we also do at the end of the test, we do a breakthrough test where we raise, we, we form that barrier, right? We form that annular plug if, if you want. And then we raise the pressure until we break through and have direct hydraulic communication. And this has really stunned us. I mean, the sample that we're using is three inches and it holds a thousand PSI differential pressure. And in fact, we've gone all the way up to the theoretical maximum on some of these, which is the, the minimum effective horizontal stress. So when these barriers form, they are extremely good. And a shale of only a few feet has basically the equivalent barrier power of a cement column of several hundred feet. Um, this is what we see afterwards. We take um, photographs and, um, and CT scans and so on. Okay. Uh, this is an actual full test on a North Sea shale called the Lark Shale uh, at its in situ conditions. And we see that the annulus closes in uh, in our test lab in a period of about three weeks, about 18 days. And we are able to kind of model this. We have uh, we do the science thing, of course. We build a nice finite element model um, that allows us to simulate this. And the nice thing is we can extract parameters from that that we then can apply to a real field situation. So uh, in the field, uh, nine and five eight inch casing and 12 and a quarter inch hole, we see that uh, we expect closure time to be about three months, about 90 days. Um, and this kind of uh, really compares well with what is seen in the field. Now that seems to be a long time and hold that thought for a moment because I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, which shales form these barriers naturally? Well, it's generally young shales, geologically young shales that have a high clay content, that have 
significant amount of free and mixed layer smectite, high porosity, high CEC, low matrix cementation, low strength, and so on. These will form various all by themselves. And I know a lot about North Sea shales. I don't know anything about North American shales. So you tell me, your geologist in the room, tell me if there are formations in the US that have these characteristics that we could exploit. Um, if your shale is not like this, right? Or if this 90 days is too long a period of time for you, is there something you can do? Can you accelerate barrier formation? And the answer is you can. And there are three ways of doing this. Thermal stimulation, pressure stimulation, or, or chemical change. And I'll talk briefly about thermal stimulation. Thermal stimulation is that you let a heater down the well and heat up the casing and the formation behind it. Now you want to do this in a controlled way. Thomas talked about these uh, thermite heaters, which go up to thousands of degrees. And I, I generally don't like that because at, at those temperatures, you actually damage the shale. You actually metamorphosize the shale and dehydrate and crack it. And, uh, and that is a problem. I'm typically talking about temperatures up, up to about 300 degrees. And then what you see is tremendously accelerated creep. Um, the, the creep rate uh, goes up by orders of magnitude, and we can actually close in an annulus within a period of a day or so out in the field. And this has actually been established out in the field. Trials in the North Sea have been done that actually have shown this. Um, we are currently gearing up to a, a new set of, of tests where we're going to much larger samples. This is full whole core, four inch core, with uh, uh, a kind of a mock casing, hollow casing inside of it. And that casing has um, an acoustic array in it, has transducers in it, where we can actually measure uh, the bond of the shale or the cement uh, to the casing and follow that in real time. And uh, We've tested this. It's a, it's a working setup that we have right now. It took us a, a year to design it and a year to build it. Very expensive, but we have it now operational. And one thing that we want to start doing is do tests where we put cement in an annulus, like you see here on the right, and either compromise that cement to break it up, right? so just leaking, or we pressure cycle the casing and break the bond between the casing and cement to form a microannulus, right? And then we want to activate this creep phenomenon to see what effect that has on that compromised cement or on that microannulus. And, and these are these are these experiments are actually ongoing right now. I'll show you actually results that were obtained uh, last week. Uh, what you see here, the zigzag pattern, is us kind of pressure cycling the casing. Like it's also happening in the field, Bill Eva knows this, right? And um, and you see that at some point our bond log actually shows that cement debonds from the casing. So we've actually formed the micro angles, right? So we're able to do that in a lab setting. Um, here is the basic idea. And I'm really happy for Thomas's uh, presentation because you have wonderfully explained this uh, before. Um, if you have an, uh, an annulus, open annulus um, that's leaking and there's leaking me, there's methane leaking out uh, Thomas already indicated right you can uh, try to perforate and do perforation uh, cement and maybe that is successful if it's not successful then you'll have to cut and pull casing or section mill it and set an uh, open hole plug and in an offshore environment you will need a rig for that so you cannot do this rigless um, wouldn't it be nice if you could do what's there on the right, where you stimulate the shale to form the annular barrier, and then you only have to, in a rigorous way, have to set the abandonment plugs, and set the abandonment plugs preferably with something like geopolymer or the bentonite. No, I, I fully concur with Jesse that we shouldn't be looking at bentonite a lot better because it's a good material that self yields. Right? What about... Um, if the uh, cement is compromised, what if we have a microannulus or cracked cement, right? Um, here, I'm going to really apologize for my crappy PowerPoint uh, skills, but um, here's the animation. Maybe creep 
is able to close those channels and stop the flow to surface. But if it does it already at in situ condition, it should already have been ha happening, right? You shouldn't actually have seen any flow to surface. But what we can do then is go in with a heater. And again, for temperatures below 300 degrees centigrade, above that, you're starting to damage the shale. Just heat the shale, accelerate the creep, get much higher creep load acting on the cement, and maybe close that microannulus um, and um, uh, or any cement fractures. And Thomas is basically the inverse of the shell technology of cement densification, right? You're actually densifying the cement from the other end, right? And actually on that cement densification, I have some issues associated with that because it's so very local, right? That you're punching whole these, these kind of um, extensions into the case. Okay, I've taken up way too much time. Um, but um, here are my conclusions. So I hope to show you that shale and salt does the same thing, uh, can form competent annular barriers, is really truly restoring or replacing the cap rock, but then with the cap rock. And it attains sub microdarcy permeability quickly after forming. And that eventually is a thousand times better than what you can ever achieve with Portland cement. We have shown it to resist very high differential pressures over very short columns. And it's able to resist thermal and pressure cycling, exposure to CO2 and H2S. It displays rehealing when damaged and compromised. And it will probably last for millions of years, similar to how long cap rock, or, or rock lasts. And you completely sidestep all these questions about the durability of OPC and other materials. Open annuli is not a problem. Actually, open annuli is preferred for shale as a barrier. On poorly cemented annuli, those tests are being done right now. And I hope to have an answer for you in a couple of months. So SAP may help you regain annular pressure integrity if you have microannuli or cracks. Uh, what can help you is the temperature activation to accelerate and amplify the creep behavior. And you do that with downhole heaters. Um, which are commercially available already. Um, and then, yeah, we have, in, in our group, we have uh, basically focused on North Sea shales, right? Um, we haven't tested any North American shales. So I'd love to identify some suitable candidates and test them in Saab equipment. And then, of course, looking for field tests of this concept in the Americas. Uh, we've... Well, I'll skip this. We've also done this for uh, for CO2 injection wells, which go through very large temperature cycling. And there also Saab appears to be a solution. Um, so that's my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. Um, quite a few papers already published on this. If you're interested in it, I'd be happy to send it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so uh, let's see, how much time do we have for questions? Um, I guess let's go and uh, we do have one question here online for Nick. It says, my understanding is the spot dates for wells were not always recorded, reported to the regulator prior to modern or semi-modern regulations. For example, in Pennsylvania, there are mostly unknown spot dates for pre 1950s wells. How does this uh, uh, impact your database? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, I guess uh, drilling records started to become standard in about the 1950s. And so um, the way we created the data set was we took the wells with API numbers, and we went into the S&P Global database, and we pulled either the spud date or the completion date, uh, depending what was available, and mapped them out. And so for our oldest wells, it is very hard to find dates. Um, and if you look at that graph, you know, the earliest wells in the 1900s don't have a lot of, uh, there weren't a lot of wells represented there, because we just don't know what the dates are. And then once we get to the 1950s and moving on, um, then we have a record of you know, every well that's been orphaned after that point has been uh, recorded. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, go and, and have some questions. I'm sorry. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, one of the things you might want to look at is the uh, uh, archives. 
the oil and gas journals go back to like 1911 and oil, the oil daily goes back to like 1904. And they actually listed by states and by counties, by section, township and range activities on a weekly basis. It's really fascinating. It's fun to read anyway. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So we have some questions here from the audience. If you can please introduce yourself. And uh, um, pause the question. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Khan with the HP Tech. This question is for Eric. Uh, very interesting study, very detailed, uh, Eric. Just uh, uh, congratulations. A question to you Did you see any correlation how these wells lowered the alkalinity or increase, increased the corrosivity of the groundwater? What was that question for me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and your question is, how did we see any correlation with how the wells affected the groundwater? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yes. It's hard to make a, a direct correlation. And so what we're just trying to do is, in this initial data set, is to pull groundwater quality measurements near the wells. Um, but we can't actually link, you know, it's very hard to link the source of the constituents in the groundwater quality especially in, you know, usually surrounding orphan wells are active oil and gas wells. And so there can be uh, pollution and constituents from active activities. There can also be spills at the surface. So we're not making a direct correlation of, you know, constituents in groundwater is directly related to the orphan wells. Our goal was to create a, a, a data set and a tool set so that people going out could see what groundwater quality was like in the areas where they're working and start to make observations uh, that might be of use to answer those questions. Yes, it does. So not necessarily the wells are uh, increasing the corrosivity of the groundwater. You haven't made that correlation, is that correct? Uh, no, no, and we feel that that the, the natural, I'll make sure that Carl, my, yeah. my colleague agrees with that, but the uh, corrosivity of the groundwater is, is is caused by other causes, right? Okay. Did you agree with that, Carl? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I have one more uh, comment of a very general nature of this uh, entire uh, workshop. I think there has been a lot of discussion on cement as a plugging material, but it seems to me that really there is a disconnect between this industry and the people on the cement and concrete side there have been a lot of technological advancements in cement and concrete where this industry can really, really benefit, you know. And I think uh, the involvement of uh, this industry with organizations like American Concrete Institute would be very, very helpful, you know. Yes, I, I actually totally agree with the connectivity uh, and uh, interdisciplinary approach. Uh, there is a lot of progress in supplementary cementitious materials and additives that civil engineering uh, and transportation infrastructure have that we probably have not uh, fully explored. Uh, so there is a potential for that, in my opinion. Well, Speaking thank you. Myself, yeah. I'd like to jump in there too. I think and at our conference that we had in Pittsburgh, we had people from NREL and also in other labs who were doing a lot of strength of materials research. So we just don't necessarily have them in this this venue today. But well, thank you. And happening. I think when, Professor, when you mentioned about uh, Maria Zuninger, that's very encouraging. You know, I mean, she's a concrete person. She's at UT Austin. And I think really I would like to see more and more collaboration between folks like yourself and people like Maria Zuninger or those people who are really associated with concrete and cement more than what this industry is, you know. That's absolutely, absolutely right. But working with Maria, right, uh, <laughs> we're actively looking for alternatives for cement, because you do run into certain limitations with cement, right? And there is stuff that you can do with latexes and so on. Latex, for instance, will will improve tensile strength of cement, right? And that's why you probably see a 
a positive effect of it, but you always run into certain limitations. I've seen nothing that really improves the bond strength of Portland cement significantly to casing, right? And that's a real issue. You get 100, 200 PSI, it's easily sheared, right? So the reason why why Mary and and uh, and and I, myself right right now see a correlation between increased leakage and and earthquakes, for instance, right? An earthquake can easily kind of shear a casing cement bond interface and create a leakage path. Right? Yeah, and it's difficult to get around that with with Portland cement, and that's where we have to start looking at other materials like geopolymers, like um, uh, the the solutions that we have potentially with using geomaterials. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I, I want to add one thing is because we, we we can talk about innovative materials, but it comes down to regulatory approvals and they need to be a little more dynamic in the process as we come up with new technologies and roll them out to them. They got to give it back to us so that we can get in the field and deploy these technologies. All right. I think uh, we need to just give some opportunity for uh, a few other questions. You can also have some one-on-one yeah. -on -one conversations. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank this. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Greg? Yep. Greg Lackey, NTL. Uh, Eric, I have a quick question for you. Uh, so you said that you primarily focused on North Sea shales. How involved would the research need to be to gain confidence in a North American shale? How, you know, what type of information would you need beyond just like the general properties of it? How much lab work would you want to see before you feel confident in those barriers? Well, I, I, apart from seeing the the material properties, right, the mechanical properties of the of the shale material, I, I do want to test it, right, and do some some SAP tests. We've kind of standardized the protocol on how to do these tests, right, to see um, see if it indeed has the the appropriate behavior. We've seen a wide range of materials, right. Um, for instance, in North Sea shale, there's not just one shale layer in the North Sea. There's actually a whole range, right, from from Miocene to kind of Shetland age, right, um, that that shows this behavior. But yeah, it, it's it's easily tested in the lab, and it isn't all that involved. Awesome, thank you. And maybe actually doing some synthetic shales where you can uh, form some single no. layer. Uh, synthetic shales, right, uh, is is to be not realistic. Uh, you can never get the degree of cementation uh, that you see in a real shale right. right? So you're lulling yourself into um, kind of a, a, a false sense of security, right, on, on, on that regard. I'd much rather have field materials. But that will require core, though, I and mean, you need to have a, appropriate core material available. And the impact of, uh, for example, contaminations like a mud cake, you know, uh, if you have that against the casing, will the shale bond to those kind of contaminations? So there's a lot of a uh, lot of testing, uh, and I think any new material or existing cap rocks will have to pass everything that we uh, uh, had to do for cement in the first place uh, to be fully confident, right? Is that your thinking? No, I mean the the, the regulators in the North Sea haven't haven't required that, right? And I wouldn't know how to do a kind of an API cement test on a shale or anything like that. Um, but, I mean, the regulators have been convinced by the field data of tested barriers, right? So yeah. the operators have gone to the expense of actually pressure testing these barriers by doing logging, both uh, sonic and ultrasonic logging against these barriers and, and qualifying them. And that was going to be my specific comment was, you know, I have some experience with it and others have a lot more like Ocker VP or, or Equinor, but... Yeah, it's kind of incumbent upon the operator to take that risk. And if you go out and you've characterized the shale and you think that you're going to see it and then you log it and then you pressure test it and and prove it in the field, then then it's suitable. as a And, and Ocker BP actually has have gone to the... So they're actually now yeah. building these shale barriers into their new well designs. They've actually gone to the extent where they haven't cemented intermediate casing and just are relying on the shale barrier to form. And it pressure tests, right? You do a leak-off test, you... The, the shoe tests. Okay. Susan, did you want to add something? I was just going to ask if if you um, use DAS networks and um, fiber to for some of the monitoring of um, just for, to see for the um, any type of micro seismicity or any changes. This distributed acoustic DAS. 
library I, I didn't get the question oh so when you're in in using the new new materials and uh, accommodating this or trying to test for the strength and also in uh, integrity are you monitoring at all and if so are you using fiber um and for example das no okay okay uh we have two more questions here in the audience uh let's oh sorry. uh let's go to the um this is Brian McClellan with the Alaska Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Just a follow up on that discussion, um, Eric, on the shale. Are, are so are you are you willing at UT to if an operator wanted to send you a core sample of the shale, you could kind of um, analyze its suitability for uh, forming shale as a barrier. You could you can do that in your lab and it's something you're willing to do. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that we do. Okay, great. Yeah, we have some operators in Alaska that are are trying to do that. So. Yeah, be happy to take a look at it. I, I've been eager to kind of look beyond uh, just the North Sea, right? Yeah. It should be universally applicable as long as we have the right shale material, right? But we haven't been able to demonstrate it really with the shales outside of the North Sea. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, Danny here. Yeah, Danny Sorrells, the Road Commission of Texas. Jesse, uh, yeah. one one thing I, I – these aren't, aren't questions really, but it's just statements. The latex, uh, I, I can remember when they brought the first 55-gallon drums of Borden's glue to the loading dock and tried to, what are we doing? Um, but, Nick, on yours, where you're showing the uh, crisis, 1980, 78, 79, 80, don't forget that's when the first high-temperature cross-linking occurred. Cabela titanates and zirconates, so we could frack above 200, 220 degrees, get the penetration, and greatly increased the amount of production we were making. But don't forget that it was both. It was both those. I don't know which is was more. Eric, on the on your product, what is the temperature? Where's your max temperature that you know you you've got a heater and you said above three hundred degrees? Where where do you see the 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 best use for that product what temperature yeah. range and and just to be clear it's not my product right okay. <laughs> there, there is there are there are commercial vendors who okay. provide these these heaters and as i said um we've actually looked into this very carefully right uh, the the optimum for for temperature stimulation for a north sea shale is around 200 degrees centigrade with an upper limit of about 300 degrees centigrade and you can get that with a commercial heater, that is possible. Uh, you can go even higher. You can with thermite, uh, as as Thomas indicated, right? You can go to twenty five um, hundred psi, uh, hundred degrees, right? Uh, but that is not necessary. And in fact, that's detrimental. At that point, you're actually starting to turn smectite into illite, and it's the smectite that is actually beneficial in this, right? It gives you the, the creep and the and the rehealing. I was going to say, it. yeah, you mentioned the North Sea shale, so presumably, if you have different smectite percentages and concentrations, then you may have to adjust that temperature a little bit. But with things like thermite, I think they can adjust filler and those sorts of things, so they can control the temperature yeah. Yeah. a lot lower. So yeah. there's probably a number of ways to do that without having to have electrical, you know, heating or that sort of stuff down hole. Well, we've seen kind of going up to 200 degrees centigrade, having absolutely no negative effect on the shale, only beneficial effect in stimulating that creep, accelerating it, and actually forming a, a better barrier. We, I actually I haven't shown it, but we, we have shale samples that are damaged, and then after heat treatment, they have rehealed, which is amazing. Okay. Um... Let's uh, have one more question here from uh, Meg Coleman, EDF. So uh, when, along the lines of your uh, work, Eric, I was just curious, uh, and you must have explored this because I read up the road, but the BEG has perhaps one of the larger core libraries of the world. So I just wondered if that was a potential uh, source for looking at uh, North American shales. It it, it could be. It, it could be. Um, the, the problem with a lot of the BEG cores is that they are not well preserved. So they're completely dried out, oh. right? slab, yeah. completely dried out. With a shale, that's a bit of a problem. Right? It's very difficult sure. to kind of reconstitute it and, and get it back to kind of its native conditions. Um, 
you can try to rehydrate it. It's a lengthy process, takes takes months to do it. You need it to do it in a controlled environment of a desiccator. You need to know the, the geochemistry of the pore fluid in the shale really well, which usually we don't know. Um, so that that is kind of what has kind of prevented me from, from going that route. Makes sense. Makes sense. And that would be very actually uh, beneficial if it works in North America for all these horizontals and fracked wells. Uh, absolutely, and 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 for offshore abandonments, right? I mean, um, it is an enabler for for rigorous abandonments. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, are there any? Okay, there is one other question here. Uh... What will be the role of petroleum landmen in finding, negotiating, plugging, orphaned, and abandoned wells? Anybody? Yes, Susan. Thank you. Okay, so the um, in the case of Oklahoma, for example, an abandoned orphan well it goes it's it becomes the responsibility of the state. But that does not mean that the state owns the minerals. And so I was talking to Brad um, Ice at the Oklahoma Cor Corporation Commission about people who find orphan wells and they want to plug them for, say, carbon credits. Um, what happens to the um, carbon credits and do the mineral owners, are they entitled to any? And, and he said, well, you have to have a couple of permissions in place. So a landman could... Um, ostensibly help find the title and run the, the, the surface owner, um, um, find them a surface owner because you do have to get permission to enter the surface and do something on site. But then you also need a mineral takeoff. Apparently, Rebellion is one of the companies that's gone in and plugged a number of wells in, in Washington County. They have gone ahead and, and gotten leases from the... Um, from the 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 mineral owners, and so the the landman's role would be to find do the mineral takeoffs and get the uh, ownership, and they could do that well in a number of ways. But then the the question be, remains, and this is I think if you're if you're an attorney, you uh, an oil and gas attorney, you have a bright future <laughs> because the uh, owner, the question remains if you make a commitment to abandon, especially if it's in the case of abandoning marginal wells in favor of and getting carbon credits and following the methodology, um, you're essentially condemning that 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 uh, formation and that lease for not just three years, but like they're they're putting it whatever this this time frame is for that methodology, which could be like 40 years. Now, how many if if there's just one owner, and that kind of happens sometimes in, say, Kansas, but hardly ever in Oklahoma. You're, it's going to be quite divided. How are you going to get everybody to agree to not touch that formation in that unit for 40 years? And how are you going to force pool? Are you going to force pool uh, that, the condemnation? I don't know. And yeah. if, you, if you are a surface owner who owns the right to pour space for carbon capture and storage and someone else owns minerals <laughs> and wants to go ahead and drill wells through your carbon capture space. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And geothermal for that matter. <laughs> it's several in, in Texas. Okay. Uh, thank you both. Uh, I think let's just cover one more. This is the last question online. Should states require cement evaluation, standard annual pressure testing, and corrosion logging prior to plugging wells within the area of review of class six wells that will be in direct contact with highly pressurized supercritical CO2? Outside the scope of this. Uh... I love that. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say yes, because it's going to happen. Uh, Stam's test of operation. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I think we probably uh, should close this session and let uh, Missy give her final remarks. Thank you again, everybody.
And I just want to echo uh, Nick's thoughts. So this has really been an honor and really appreciate it. So we're gradually dwindling in terms of uh, uh, participation here. So we thought we would, we recognize that it's Friday afternoon and, and you guys have stuck with us for two days. So I think we'll do away with the break at this point and we'll just go ahead and, and finish this up so people can can get going. Um, first off, I want to thank everyone for two days of incredible talks and um, great discussion. I think it shows the breadth and complexity of what we're trying to do here. And I think as we take this forward, um, we're going to need all of you to help us determine, you know, together we can, through coordination, can, can move this forward. So I'm going to take just a few minutes here and go through a couple of uh, learnings from this. I This is a really dangerous thing for someone to do, but unfortunately it's my job. So um, I'm going to attempt to do this. And then Deb's going to come up and talk about where we're going to take this from here. Okay. Um, so I think from day one, I think we recognize there's tremendous value in understanding and sharing the state's plugging and abandonment practices, the coordination, the discussion, the passing around of technology developments, et cetera, are, is really valuable. Um, the uncertainties and environmental conditions are very complex. And as we all know, they need to be considered fully in the plugging approach, we, the plant well planning and plugging approaches that we take. Uh, in assessing risk and prioritizations, um, states seem to have a common thread where you're thinking of people, surface, ground leakage, and methane leakage. And I think those prioritizations are important and are a common thread through all of the states that are undergoing their programs. Um, we heard a lot yesterday and more today about just care when we go back into these wells. Um, Repressurization of the wells are going to be challenging, and it does pose a risk that we need to kind of keep our eye on as we're, as we're going forward. The states are doing a great job with that, but that we need to continue to do that and with competent operators to do it. Um, um, cement, as we've all heard yesterday and today is very important. Um, whatever you're gonna use to put the barrier in, whether it's new technologies or um, uh, evolving technology around cement, that's a very important um, aspect that we need to uh, to keep in mind and we need to keep continue to research as we go forward. Um, we talked a lot about tagging of plugs. It's important as we go forward into some of these wells, that's going to be an important aspect of what we need to, to kind of keep in mind to understand where we've put these things. Um, for long-term plugging success, um, as I, I think I've said, we need to be able to assess the qualifications of the PNA contractors. And this is an ongoing issue, I think, that that we're seeing go, having to go back into wells that have been replugged and abandoned, and there, there are issues with it. Um, the uh, For today, um, you know, I'm a geoscientist, so of course, understanding the geology is critical. Geology is very complex. We have to understand the subsurface particularly even from just the where we're going to place our plugs, but also understanding the movement of contamination away from the well bore, the groundwater aspects of it, et cetera, are a very important part of trying to understand and remediate some of this. Um, so lots of exciting new technology, new regulations, guidance on uh, monitoring space it was very exciting to see some of the, the use of drones, the use of um, different new technologies to be able to locate and monitor wells. Um, I think one message that came through, we don't necessarily need to monitor every well, but we certainly need to understand the the issues and the criticality of, of uh, different aspects of when we're, we're plugging and abandoning here. Um, reclamation needs to be part of the plan from the beginning. Uh, it's a bigger priority on for tribal lands and parks, certainly, um, that was well um, articulated in the presentations. Early planning for restoration activities um, <coughs> for both the soil and under and the surrounding environment. It's important to ensure contaminations issues 
Uh, don't continue after we've uh, completed the operations. Um, we need to, to address reclamation restoration practices to minimize the risk of, of contamination. So that's very important. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, in my head now, I'm going to keep this. Reclamation can increase plugging costs by two times. This may not be valid, but it's a, it's a significant part of when you're costing doing one of these operations. So it's something just to keep in mind as you go forward. Um, remediation was an Im important topic, separate from rec reclamation. And it's, an, it's also, again, an important step, but it's also costly. So we just need to, uh, to work on that. Um, and one of the conversations I, we had at dinner last night, and I think was a thread through here, but there's a need for growing professionals in the field right? Um, there are a lot of young people that are here, young, much younger than I, and I think we just need to continue to gain that experience among the workforce, whether it's plugging professionals, regulators, inspectors, hydrogeologists, petroleum engineers. We need to consider as a, as a group how we're going to grow those skills and make sure we can continue to do this. This problem is not going to go away very quickly, and so when I am long gone, there will still be orphaned wells that need to be plugged and abandoned. So um, are any comments, anything anybody would like to contribute at this point? Yes, sir. We don't have a time, Ms. Peter. You covered the monitoring of the wells themselves. I think... Uh fast, accurate, and uh, economical monitoring techniques for the plugging material itself, you know, I think that would be very helpful, you know. Okay. And there are techniques available. Yes. I think getting that word out and, and compiling them is important. Yes. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? So we will be publishing the proceedings of this. I understand the process takes about three months. So sometime in the fall, the proceedings of this will be out there. Um, we would appreciate feedback. If you still have thoughts about something that didn't come out today or you want to hear about it, please send it to myself or to the NAS staff. We'd love to hear it. It's going to inform the ongoing work that the academies are going to do with this. And at that, I'm going to turn it over to Deb, who's going to kind of summarize where we're taking this from now on. All right. I know I'm standing between you and the end, so I'm going to try to make this quick. Um, Miles, can you throw some slides up? Thanks. So you all should probably recognize this slide from the early morning yesterday. And I wanted to take us back to the workshop scope um, and just throw it up here again. What we were trying to do was think about the history and current practices for um, and standards. And we wanted to think about, you know, factors such as age, depth, wellbore integrity, um, the types of technologies and associated costs that we want to worry about, environmental risks and monitoring, and then reclamation and restoration. So we covered a fairly broad swath of topics in the last two days. Um, as you all heard, this part of the workshop um, commissioned a white paper and um, it compiled statutory and regulatory standards, methods, and design of plugging plans and requirements for well plugging activities. I wanted to take this moment to again thank Rick Simmers and his team for pulling all of this together and for taking it on. Um, it is available on our workshop event page and it's also here if you want to grab yet another QR code so that you can get directly to it. Um, but we really did want to take one more moment to, to thank him for all and his team for all of that work. As Missy said, we're gonna be taking the information that was in this workshop um, and presented in this session and compile it into a summary document. Um, that workshop proceedings will be publicly available on our website in the fall. And the goal is to synthesize the presentations and the discussion that we heard. Um, however, I'll just be very clear and note that it will not contain any advice. There will be no statements that say, we all agreed to X or we recommend Y. That's not what our workshop proceedings look like. However, <laughs> we've been referencing a consensus study for the last couple of days, and many of you are aware of this. And 
consensus studies are a little bit different than a workshop for us at the academies. So a workshop is executed by an appointed independent committee of experts who address the study charge, and then they write a report that documents their evidence-based consensus on that charge. So the report typically involves findings, conclusions, and recommendations. This is where they say, we recommend X. You know, we think the best practice should be Y. So that's probably, um, that's where we're going to be moving towards. And that those recommendations and conclusions are informed by all the input we pull into a consensus study. So similar to the workshop, the study will look at procedures um, and it can potentially highlight or have conclusions about best practices or recommendations for improvements on such. Different from the workshop, it will also be looking at data available on why plugs fail, um, assessment of practices for post-plugging monitoring, and it will probably, and it will make recommendations on pertinent research agendas for well plugging. Oops, what just happened? There we go. Okay, so I wanted to take one more minute and talk a little bit about what the consensus study process looks like. And we found this very ugly graphic to walk through with you. Um, so basically, again, we have a nominations process where we pull together a volunteer, a set of volunteer experts. We look for balance in their expertise. We look for balance in their experience. We want them from different sectors and from different backgrounds. The staff review those nominations. They select and vet a committee and they look at conflicts of interest. They look at bias. We use the word bias, but it's really perspective. What, where are they, what are they bringing to the table? What are their, you know, what are their thoughts? What do they think about it? Um, and when we finally put together a committee, it gets approved at about 85 layers here at the academies, and then it's posted for public comment. So there's a 20-day public comment period where people can say, oh, good job. That's really what we hope. Um, sometimes that's not what it says. But <laughs> and then eventually it does have final approval after we've had yet another conversation about bias and conflict. Um, we are really quite stringent, especially with our consensus studies, about making sure that we know who's at that table, um, and where they're coming from. Then we move into information gathering. And this is where we're going to need all of you because we still want to have input from multiple stakeholders, from experts, from different perspectives. We take input from literature, but we also take input from people's lived experiences as they're working, as they do. So we want to make sure that we're gathering all of that information that we can get. Those meetings are open to the public. Um, and so you can listen into them or you can come to them um, and they will be posted on our website. So you are able to find out where they're going to be and when. However, we also have a closed session process that goes along in conjunction with that. And that's when the committee can deliberate in private because they need to be able to talk to one another and kind of hash out their ideas and decide you know, do they want to recommend something like that? Is that really what they all agree on or not? So we do have time for them to work in private to deliberate. After they've done all that information gathering and all that deliberation, they draft a report. And that report will be evidence-based and it will have, you know, conclusions, recommendations, possibly findings that are going to help direct the Department of the Interior. Um, the report, when it's finally finished and ready to go in its draft form, gets sent out for a rigorous, independent, external peer review. It actually goes away from the study directors, the people who have been, the staff that have been helping, and gets moved to an entirely different part of the academies who are responsible for making sure that we do the best job we can possibly do on an external peer review. DO, DOI doesn't get to review our draft. So it all gets done externally. It comes back to us. The review, the committee has to respond to those reviews. They have to look through all those reviews. They rewrite their draft until it's final. And only then does it go back for approval. But again, the Department of the Interior never actually gets to say, well, we don't agree with that recommendation. Well, they can afterwards, but they don't get to do it in the review draft. So when it is released, it is released to everyone at the same time. We maintain our independence pretty strongly there. So when that report is released, it does have the position of the National Academies behind it. That is what we are saying. Um, it is publicly released and it is freely available when it, it, when it comes out. Um, it'll be up on our website, just like everything else. 
And this is a two-year study, so we expect that that study to be done in early 2026, which seems so far away, but is not. Um, so I know it's been said about 600 times, but I'm going to say it one more time. Um, on behalf of my board, the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources, on behalf of Cameron Osvig's Oskvig's board sitting in the back, the board on infrastructure and the constructed environment, who provided the oversight for this workshop, and will be providing the oversight for the consensus study. We want to thank you for being here and for staying here. Um, whether you were online or whether you were in person, we really appreciate the amount of time, effort, and dedication that you put forward into this. I want to particularly thank our planning committee members who did an amazing job. Um, and Hopefully you found this informative and valuable. I certainly did. Um, and I want to say thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>